Hello and welcome to our video series on trigonometry, our pre-calculus two course. As we start this video, I'm going to start like I start every video with a question that kind of guides our discussion in what we're looking at. Trigonometry looks at triangles, but specifically the measure of the angles of those triangles. So the important foundational question as we get started with trig is how do we measure angles? And the most common way angles are measured, the one you're probably most familiar with, is in degrees. The idea is, if I've got a circle on this coordinate plane here, and this circle goes around like so. I can't draw very good circles. Sorry. Uh, we'll start on the far right, and we'll call that 0 degrees. And because somebody decided once, we're going to say circles have a total of 360 degrees. So if I go all the way around the circle back to my original point, we'll be at 360 degrees. And one of the reasons 360 was chosen is we could divide 360 by a lot of things and not have a remainder. We can divide by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10. We can divide by a lot of things and not have a remainder. So if I were to divide it in half, halfway around the circle then must be 180 degrees. And half of that then would be 90 degrees. And if I go between 180 and 360, that would be 270 degrees. Another way that we've divided up the circle is we can divide each of these halves into thirds. And so we've got thirds that come out of the circle to points. And these are going to be some common angles that we're going to work with as well. And 1 third of 90 degrees is 30 degrees. So each one of these is going to be 30 more degrees. So it goes 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, which we already have, 210, 240, 270, which we already have, 300, and then 330. And finally, 360, which we already have. Now, each 90 could have been split into thirds, but it could have also been split in halves. And so we're also going to have some common angles that are just going to be in the middle, the halves. Half of 90 is 45 degrees. And so counting every 45, we've got 45. 90 on top, 135 degrees, 180 on the left, 225, 270 on the bottom, 315, and finally 360. And so you, these are going to be what we're going to call the common angles that we're going to work with a lot in this course. And you should be very familiar with where they're located on the circle, how many degrees gives you each position on the coordinate plane. Now, the neat thing about degrees in a circle is we can actually spin around the circle several times and end up back at the same spot. So I'm going to number this circle, this unit circle number one. The number two thing we want to talk about with degrees is these things called coterminal angles. Coterminal angles, terminal means end, and co means the same. Coterminal angles end at the same place. So if we take this little 30 degree angle here, that 30 degree angle opens up 30 degrees, but we could have also said we're going to open up all the way around the circle 360, and then an additional 30, that's going to give us a 390 degree angle. Notice to go around the circle, we got an extra 360. By adding 360, we ended up back at the same place. But we could also go backwards. You notice that all of our angles have opened. And this might be worth noting, all of our angles 
on this circle, we always open counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is going to be how we measure positive angles. So if we go backwards, always starting from the far left, going backwards, we're going to call that a negative angle. So if 360 is all the way around, 360 minus 30 is negative 330 degrees, gets us to the same ending for that angle, that coterminal angle. So in summary, we can find coterminal angles by either adding or subtracting, let's just say add or subtract 360 degrees. So for example, if I have a 1,200 degree angle, I could find a coterminal angle with it by subtracting 360 degrees, and that would give me 840 degrees. So 840 and 1,200 are coterminal angles. In fact, I could subtract 360 degrees again, and I would get 480 degrees. And I could subtract 360 again, and that will give us our first angle that's between 0 and 360 of 120 degrees. And what we see is 120 degrees, 480 degrees, 840 degrees, 1,200 degrees. All four of these are all the same coterminal angle. We could even work with a negative number and do a very similar thing. Let's say we've got a negative 800 degree angle. And I want to know what's that equivalent to within that 0 to 360 range, just one rotation of the circle. Well, since this is negative, we're going to add 360 degrees. And that'll give us negative 440 degrees. And if I add 360 again, that'll give me another coterminal angle of negative 80 degrees. And if I add 360 again, we get our first coterminal angle that's between 0 and 360. This is a 280 degree angle. And again, all three of these, negative 800, negative 440, negative 80, all four actually, and the 280 degree angle, all three are all the same coterminal angles. One use of angles and angle measurement in degrees in this case is helping us determine the arc length on a circle. What we're going to do is we're going to use Greek letters to represent angles in this course. So this Greek letter, it's a circle with a line through the center, is the Greek letter theta. If we took theta and divided it by 360, that would give us the proportion of the entire circle that angle covers. And so if we're looking for the arc length, which our textbook uses the letter s, that would be equal to a full arc length, the full circumference of the circle. And the formula for circumference, you should remember from your geometry days, is 2 times the radius times pi. And that's the circumference, or the distance around. So if we have a circle with radius of 3 inches and the angle of 114 degrees, we should be able to find the arc length that that covers. What I mean by that is we've got a circle. The radius is 3. And there's some 114 degree angle in here. And we want to know how long is that arc that covers that 114 degree angle. And this proportion helps us do it. It's a part over the whole. We have an angle of 114 degrees out of the total 360 degrees. That's equal to the arc length over the total length around the circle. 
which is 2 times the radius of 3 times pi. Well, to solve for the arc length, the s that we want will multiply by 2 times 3 is 6 pi on both sides, leaving just the arc length on the right side. And I'd probably put this in my calculator, leaving the pi, because we always like to leave the exact answer in terms of pi whenever possible. 6 times 114 divided by 360 is going to give us 1.9. So our arc length is 1.9 pi inches. Not too bad there. Now. We've been talking about degrees so far, because degrees is what you're probably most familiar with. However, it's actually a very inconvenient way to measure circles, because the 360 was kind of abstractly decided that 360 is the distance all the way around the circle. Well, who decided that? Well, someone who just decided it was easy to do math with 360. It's much better to use a method that uses the circle we're talking about. So we're going to often in this course, more often than degrees, talk about these things called radians. And this is an angle measured in terms of the radius. And so again, we're going to redraw that circle we started with. I'm going to draw it a little bigger this time just so that we can see what's happening really clearly. So we've got this circle. It's perfectly round. And the idea is we know that the circumference of a circle, the distance all the way around the circle, is 2 pi times the radius. Well, the radius is going to be our unit of measure. So we're going to say the distance around the circle is 2 pi times whatever the radius is. So all the way around the circle, then, we're going to call that 2 pi radians, or 2 pi times the distance of the radius of the given circle. Well, if 2 pi is the distance all the way around, 1 pi would be the distance halfway around, and pi over 2 would be only a quarter of that. And so if we're counting by pi over 2's, we've got 1 pi over 2, 2 pi's over 2, 3 pi's over 2 at the bottom, and 4 pi's over 2, which reduced to 2 pi. Now, I guess you could also say 0 is a coterminal angle with this measurement on the right. From there, we can divide this up much the same way we did before. We're going to divide the pi over 2 into thirds. And this almost makes a clock. When I draw this, I often think about a clock, where you've got 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And granted, that counts the wrong direction, because we always count counterclockwise. But that'll give you all the spokes as we divide by 3. And so just kind of thinking off to the side here, if pi over 2 is that first quarter, and we divide it by 3 or find 1 third, each one of those spokes represents pi over 6. So each spoke is 1 pi over 6. So the next spoke then would be two of them, 2 pi over 6, which is going to reduce to pi over 3. The top is 3 pi over 6, which already reduces to pi over 2. The next one is 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6. We'll come back and reduce in a minute. 6 pi over 6 is the same as pi. Then there's 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6 becomes the bottom, 10 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, and 12 pi over 6 is the 2 pi. Now, you should notice that all the evens are going to reduce. So the evens we're going to call pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. And that's just reducing those fractions. So we'll never actually say 8 pi over 6. We'll say 4 pi over 3. We'll always use the reduced version. 
Similar to what we did before with the degrees though, we're also interested in cutting right down the middle with an extra angle. And so with cutting in half, we originally had pi over 2, and we cut each of those in half this time. That's going to give us pi over 4. So we've got a pi over 4, 2 pi over 4 on the top, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4 on the left, which reduces to pi, and then 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, which reduces to 3 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4, and finally the 8 pi over 4 becomes the right. This circle with angles measured in terms of the radius or in radians, you should be able to draw this circle very, very quickly. The sooner you memorize each of these key angles or are able to derive them quickly, the better off you will be. I always just remember that we're counting by pi over 6 or pi over 4 and count my way around the circle. So I didn't actually memorize it. I just count my way around. Some people prefer to memorize them all. Either way, we're going to use this circle a lot in this course. And the sooner you memorize it, the better off you will be. Now we're going to take much the same direction that we took before with degrees, this time just talking about radians. We're going to talk about coterminal angles. Again, we're going to take that same pi over 6 angle. Remember, that was the same as the 30 degree angle. And do much the same thing with it. Instead of just going open to pi over 6, we're going to open all the way around to get a coterminal angle. Well, we were discussing that the distance around the circle is 2 pi with an extra pi over 6. So this is really saying pi over 6 plus 2 pi, which gets us around the circle. When I get a common denominator, 2 pi is 12 pi's, which means we've got 13 pi's over 6 as a coterminal angle. But again, we also have the option to go backwards. So if I go backwards, that's a negative angle. Again, we're looking at a pi over 6 angle, but this time we backed up the 2 pi. And so we subtract the 2 pi, or 12 pi over 6. 1 minus 12 is negative 11 pi over 6. Gives us a coterminal angle. And so just like with degrees, we could add or subtract 360 degrees. We're now going to add or subtract one rotation of the circle, which is 2 pi radians. So let's do a couple examples of that. Let's start with an angle that's 15 pi over 4. Now, to get a coterminal angle, we need to subtract 2 pi. But to make this easier, let's keep the common denominator. So to get a common denominator of 4, we want to subtract 2 pi. 2 pi times 4 is 8 pi. And 15 minus 8 leaves us with 7 pi over 4 is our coterminal angle. And we should be able to count out 7 pi over 4. Remember, 4 are the quarters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There is the angle at 7 pi over 4, which is coterminal with 15 pi over 4. Let's try one more. Let's do negative 13 pi over 6. Well, again, we're going to adjust by 2 pi. Since we're negative, we're going to add 2 pi. But we want to have a common denominator of 6. So 2 times 6, we're adding 12 pi, which gives us negative pi over 6. Well, we're going to add another 12 pi. I'm going to change directions because I'm running out of room on the screen. Add another 12 pi over 6, add another rotation, and we end up with a positive 11 pi over 6. And that can help us see where this angle actually is. When we're counting by sixth, those are the clock digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi over 6. 
which is coterminal with negative pi over 6. And you can almost see that negative angle going backwards. And coterminal with the negative 13 pi over 6 that we were working with. We can also work with arc length in radians. So let's take a quick look at arc length. Before, what we said with our arc length formula is we would do theta divided by the 360 degrees. Well, now all the way around the circle is 2 pi is equal to the arc length over the circumference, which is 2 pi times the radius. But what's nice about this formula is we can multiply both sides by 2 pi, because it's on both sides. And we get a better formula for arc length. Another reason why radians are better, it's the arc length divided by the radius. So if I have a radius of 5 feet and an angle of 5 pi over 6, visually what we're looking at, when we're dividing by 6, we're counting the spokes of the clock. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi over 6. That's over here. And the radius is 5 feet. We want to know how long is that arc length. Using our formula, we have theta. Our angle is 5 pi over 6 is equal to the arc length that we look for divided by the radius, which is the 5 feet. So we just have to multiply both sides by 5. And the arc length is equal to 25 pi over 6 feet. And now we have the arc length of the piece we're looking for. So we've got a way to measure arc length. And we've got a way to measure angles, both in degrees and in radians. It kind of begs the question, though, if it's two ways to measure the same thing, is there a way to, we'll call this letter C, convert between radians and degrees? Well, the answer is yes, we can convert. And again, we're going to use a proportion. The easiest way to think about this proportion is we're just going to do half of the circle in half of the circle. And because I can't use theta now, because theta talks about both degrees and radians. So I'm going to use r for radians and d for degrees. If we take the radians and divide by half the circle in radians, that's pi. If we take the degrees and divide by half the circle, that's 180. Those should both be equal to each other. That's our proportion. So if I've got 7 pi over 9 radians that I want to convert to degrees, we take our radians, which is 7 pi over 9, divided by half the circle, which is pi, is equal to degrees divided by half the circle, which is 180 degrees. What's nice here is the pi's can divide out. So we really have 7 ninths equals the degrees over 180. And we can solve for the degrees by multiplying both sides by 180. And 180 times 7 divided by 9 is going to be 140 degrees. So 7 pi over 9 is the same as 140 degrees. Let's do one where we go the other way. Let's take 240 degrees and convert it to radians. Again, we'll take the radians, which we don't know, divided by pi is equal to the degrees 240 divided by half the circle, which is 180. Well, we just can start, if I start reducing here, I can divide 10 off really quick. And then I could even divide top and bottom by 6. And that leaves me with 4 thirds. 
So r over pi is equal to 4 thirds. To get the radians, we just multiply both sides by pi. And the radians are 4 pi over 3. And we've converted between the radians and the degrees. So there's three formulas and two circles that we covered today that you need to know. The first is converting radians and degrees. That's a proportion. The second you should know is finding arc length in radians. The third you should know is finding arc length in degrees. And if you think about where they come from, your proportion should set up quite easily from those. The two circles you should know then are the circle in degrees. That's going to be very important. But more important probably is this new one, the circle in radians. This circle we are going to use constantly throughout the entire course. You should be able to at least be able to build it, if not have it memorized as the course moves forward. So take a look at some of the homework assignments. Practice some of those. Let me know if you have any questions. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. The root of trigonometry is the same root as triangle. Triangles and trigonometry go hand in hand. So today we're going to answer the question, how are the ratios of the sides of triangles? related. And we're going to set up this conversation about the ratio of sides with a look at a familiar concept of slope. If I were to take a grid here, and we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and one, two, three, four, going up the side. And I'm going to draw a triangle that rises one and runs two from the origin. Rises one, runs two. We would say that the slope of that triangle is rise one, run two of 1 half. Now I can continue on with this line, rising another one and running another two to give me a bigger triangle. Now it rises 2 and runs a total of 4. And so if I were to calculate the slope of this green triangle, I would say it rises 2, runs 4, which reduces down to 1 half. I could again rise another run and run another 2, and gives me a bigger triangle that this time rises 3 and runs now a total of 6. And so if I wanted the slope of this bigger triangle, I would say it rises 3 and one, runs 6, which reduces down to 1 half. And you can start to see the pattern. You can see if I rise another 1 and run another 2, it'll be a rise of 4 and a run total of 8. And so if I'm calculating the slope, it comes out to be a rise of 4, run of 8, which also reduces to 1 half. And what's really important here is I want to note for all of these triangles, the angle on the left, which I'm going to call theta, that angle is exactly the same angle as the triangle gets bigger and bigger. And as long as I keep that same angle going up, my slope is always going to be exactly the same. The slope is always going to be 1 half. That's the idea of the ratio of sides that we're looking at today, is we're going to see if, regardless of the size of the triangle, if that angle stays the same, the ratio will also always stay the same. So to set this up, let's just state that if the angle remains constant, so does 
the ratio of the sides. So for example, if I were to draw a triangle here and keep this angle, we'll call it theta, the same, the ratio of the sides will be exactly the same regardless of how big the triangle is as long as that angle doesn't change. Let's give each of these sides a name so we know what we're talking about. If I go across the triangle, we're going to call that the opposite side because it's opposite from the angle. The side right next to the angle, between the angle that we're talking about and the right angle, we're going to call the adjacent side. The one across from the right angle, we're going to call that the hypotenuse. There are three ratios of sides that we're going to talk about. The third one we've already talked about, actually. The third one is called the tangent of the angle theta. The tangent is the slope. It is the rise over the run. And in this triangle, it rises with the opposite side over the run, which is the adjacent side. So that tangent is always the same. It's opposite over adjacent. The other two that we talk about a lot are the sine of the angle and the cosine of the angle. The sine is calculated by taking the opposite side and dividing by the hypotenuse. The cosine is found by taking the adjacent side and dividing by the hypotenuse. And we need to know each of these three ratios really quick off the top of our head without much thinking. So you need to memorize these three ratios. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is opposite over the adjacent. And to kind of help remember, some people like this uh, rhyme of so ka toa. And that can help you remember the order. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. However you remember it is up to you. But you need to know each of those ratios so that you can solve triangles. And that's what we're going to do now. Solving right triangles. If I have this triangle here, and it's not drawn to scale, but let's say this angle is 20 degrees. We'll start with degrees. And let's say the side below it is 5. We want to solve for all the missing parts of this triangle, which means we need to know what the missing angle is. We need to know what this side over here on the left is. And we need to know what the side over here on the right is. Solving the triangle means finding all the missing angles and all the missing sides. To do that, we're first going to identify that the angle we know is 20 degrees. And the 5 is right next to it. The 5 is the adjacent side. The x is across from it. That's the opposite side. And the y is opposite the right angle. That's the hypotenuse side. So if we want to find the opposite side, the x, we know the adjacent. We're looking for the opposite. So I think which of my trig ratios uses adjacent and opposite? The tangent is the one that uses the adjacent and the opposite. So I take the tangent of my angle, which is 20 degrees, and that's going to equal to tangent is opposite over the adjacent, x over 5. And I can solve this equation by multiplying both sides by 5. And x is equal to 5 times the tangent of a 20 degree angle. Pulling out my calculator, then I can use my calculator to find what the tangent of 20 is. One thing you'll want to check is first click the Mode button. And you will notice one of the lines lets you choose between radians and degrees. It's very important you have the correct one marked. We talked about 20 degree angles, so I need to make sure my degrees is highlighted, hit Enter. And then when I hit Second Quit, it'll take me back home. But now the calculator will work in degrees. So I can type in 5. The tangent button is right above the parentheses in the 9. 20 degree angle. 
close the parentheses, and when I hit Enter, I find out that missing side x is 1.8. Let's round it to 2. So x is equal to 1.82. 1.82. We found the x. To find the y, y is the hypotenuse. And I always like to go back to the side that was given to us, the adjacent side. So I think about my SOHCAHTOA and which one uses adjacent and hypotenuse. Adjacent and hypotenuse is the cosine. So the cosine of my angle, the cosine of 20 degrees, is the adjacent, 5 divided by the hypotenuse, which is y. And then I just need to solve this equation for the y. First, I'll get rid of the fraction by multiplying both sides by y. And I have y cosine 20 equals 5. And if I divide both sides by the cosine of 20, y is 5 divided by the cosine of 20. So I can go back to my calculator, which we already set to degree mode. 5 divided by the cosine of 20, close the parentheses, and I find out my y distance is 5.32. So the y distance is 5.32. The only piece left to find then on this triangle is the angle. And what's nice is we know from our geometry days that all the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. We also have a 90 degree angle in this triangle that I can subtract off. And we're told there's a 20 degree angle. So if I subtract that off, theta, the missing angle, is equal to 70 degrees. And so now I've solved this triangle. I know all the sides and all the angles. The missing angle was 70, the missing hypotenuse 5.32, and the missing side the opposite side, 1.82. Let's solve another triangle. Let's take this triangle, again, not drawn to scale. And let's say we know the sides are 4 and 5. And we don't know any of the angles or the opposite side. So there's a missing side over here. I'll call it x. But there's also two missing angles this time. I'm just going to call the angles alpha and beta, two more Greek letters. Remember, Greek letters will generally represent angles. So alpha and beta are the two missing angles we're looking for. And we don't really know either of the angles right now. So let's first see if we can figure out what the alpha angle is do this color coded. So alpha is in green. If I'm talking about the alpha angle, the 5 is across from it. So 5 is the opposite side. 4 is the adjacent side between the angle and the right angle. And so I think which trig ratio uses opposite and adjacent? Well, that would be the tangent. The tangent of our angle is equal to the opposite 5 divided by the adjacent 4. We do have a way to solve for that angle alpha that's inside the tangent. We have to undo tangent. And what we'll call the undo tangent is the tangent inverse, which uses a little negative 1, like inverse functions from pre-calc 1. And we take the tangent inverse of the 5 fourths, and that will equal the angle alpha. And fortunately, our calculator has a tangent inverse button. First, we hit the second. And then we hit the tangent button, will give us tangent inverse. And we just have to type in the 5 fourths and hit Enter. And it tells us that angle alpha is 51.3 degrees. So that is our angle alpha, 51.3 degrees. We can now find beta pretty quick if we wanted to, because we know that there's 180 degrees in a triangle minus the 90 degrees in the right angle, minus the 51.3 that we just found gives us the remaining angle, which is going to be beta, in this case, 38.7 degrees. So beta is 38.7 degrees. 
We're still missing, however, the x, the hypotenuse side. To get that, we're going to use another one of our formulas from our geometry days. In geometry, we know the Pythagorean theorem is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is the hypotenuse side. That's the side we're looking for. a will be 4 squared plus b is 5 squared equals c, which is x squared. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. Add them together, and we get 41 is equal to the hypotenuse squared. And I can take the square root of both sides on my calculator. The square root of 41 is 6.40. So that tells us then the hypotenuse side is 6.40. And we solve the triangle for all the missing sides and all the missing angles. Let's do one more that might be a little bit more involved, though. Let's say we've got this triangle and then a smaller triangle inside of it. We've got a 60 degree angle, a 30 degree angle. The height is 50. And what we're going to attempt to find is x, which is just the distance between the two angles. Well, we got a right angle there. To do this, we're going to break it up into two triangles. First, looking at the smaller triangle, I'm going to call this other distance y. And from the 60 degree angle, the 50 is the opposite side. And the y is the adjacent side. I know that tangent of my angle 60 is equal to the opposite 50 over the adjacent y. Solving, I'll multiply both sides by y to get rid of the fraction. y tangent of 60 is equal to 50. Divide both sides by the tangent of 60. And when we put that in our calculator, 50 divided by the tangent of 60, we find out that y distance is 28 point. Let's round that to 9. So y is 28.9. Now that we've solved that smaller triangle, I'm going to look at the bigger triangle which doesn't just have the x distance. It also has that 28.9 added to it. But we can use the same idea that if I take the tangent of the 30 degree angle now, because I'm looking at the big triangle now, it's going to be the opposite, which is 50, divided by the adjacent, which is the entire length, not just the x, but the x plus 28.9. But this gives me an equation that we do know how to solve. We'll multiply both sides by x plus 28.9, x plus 28.9. And I'm going to go ahead and distribute the tangent through. So I have x tangent of 30 plus 28.9 tangent of 30 equals 50. Getting everything without an x out of the way, I'm going to subtract that 28.9 tangent of 30 from both sides. And then finally, divide both sides by the tangent of 30. And x, the piece I'm looking for, is 50 minus 28.9 tangent of 30 divided by the tangent of 30. Now, when I put this in my calculator, I have to be very careful. For one, every time I hit the tangent button, it's going to open a parentheses. I need to make sure I close the parentheses. In addition, because there's multiple things going on in the numerator, we're going to have to put parentheses around the numerator so they're all grouped together. So we've got parentheses 50 minus 28.9 tangent of 30, close the parentheses on the tangent, 
close the parentheses on the numerator, divided by the tangent of 30, close the parentheses on the tangent. And when I hit Enter, we find out that that missing side x that we're looking for is 57.7. We now have the length between the two angles is 57.7. And that's how we can solve triangles. Why are we so interested in solving right triangles? Well, the truth is there's lots of applications where we can use right triangles to find information that we want. First, to set this up, though, a little bit of vocabulary that you see often in application problems. One of them is the angle of elevation. That is the angle up from horizontal. Sometimes you'll hear the angle up from the horizon. So if the horizon is here, the angle of elevation Theta is the angle up from that. That is the angle of elevation. We also have the angle of depression. That means the angle down from horizontal. So if I've got horizontal here, the angle of depression would be the theta, the angle down from the horizontal. OK? So with that vocabulary in mind, let's say we have a 150-foot tall monument is viewed from a window. The angle of elevation to the top is 5 degrees. The angle of depression to the bottom is 10 degrees. How far away is the window? So the idea is you're in a building. Here's the window. And you're looking out the window at some monument. There's the beautiful monument. And from the window, you are looking up to the top of the monument. The angle of elevation there, that's the angle with the horizontal, is 5 degrees. And you're also looking down to the bottom of the monument. Again, this is not to scale. That angle is 10 degrees. What we end up with then is two right triangles, where the total height is 150 feet. It's a 150 foot tall monument. We want to know x, how far away we are. Well, let's split this 150 feet tall between these two pieces of height. So we'll name one of the pieces y. Let's name the top one y, actually. My monument disappeared. We'll name the top one y. The bottom one is what's left. So we have 150 originally, and we'll subtract off the y that's left. Notice from our angles that we're talking about, in both cases, we are looking for the adjacent side, which is x. And we have at least an expression about the opposite side. So we're really working with a tangent in both cases. Tangent has opposite and adjacent. 
So if I took the tangent of the 5 degree angle, that would be the opposite y over x. Or I could take the tangent of the 10 degree angle. That would be the opposite 150 minus y over x. Let's solve this first equation for y. If I multiply both sides by x, we get x tangent of 5 equals y, which means wherever I see a y, I could replace it with x tangent of 5. I'm going to do that in the other equation. So I now know that the tangent of 10 is equal to 150 minus x tangent of 5 divided by x. And if you remember back in our pre-calculus 1 class, we solved lots of linear equations for x. First, clearing the fraction, I can multiply both sides by x. So x tangent of 10 equals 150 minus x tangent of 5, because the x's divide out. We'll move everything with an x to the other side by adding the x tangent of 5 to both sides equals 150. Now we can factor out the x, leaving behind the tangent of 10 plus the tangent of 5 is equal to 150. And we finally solve for x by dividing x is equal to 150 divided by the tangent of 10 plus the tangent of 5. Remember, x is that distance we were away from the monument in our window. That's that distance we're trying to find. As I type this in my calculator, I'm going to be careful because every time I hit tangent, it'll open a parentheses. I need to remember to close both those parentheses. In addition, because there's lots of stuff going on in the denominator, we need to make sure that denominator is in parentheses. So on my calculator, we have 150 divided by open a parentheses for the denominator, tangent of 10, close the parentheses on tangent, plus the tangent of 5, close the parentheses on tangent, close the parentheses on the denominator, and we find out that that distance from the monument is 568 point, let's call it 6 feet. So today, we're solving right triangles. You're using one of these three ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent, to find missing pieces. And your calculator will be helpful. Just make sure it's in degree mode as you're calculating those. So good luck on the homework assignment. Let me know if you have any questions. As we work to solve our right triangles for missing sides and missing angles, we had this caveat that it had to be a right triangle. Well, that begs the question, how do we solve other triangles? Triangles that have no right angle in them. Well, the answer to that question is a two-part answer. We're going to cover part one of that answer in this video and part two in the next video. So first, some theory behind what we're doing. Let's say I have some triangle. It's not a right triangle. And let's give it two angles. Let's say this is angle alpha and angle beta. Again, Greek letters to represent angles. And we're going to label the opposite side from alpha the letter A, and the opposite side from beta the letter B. We're also going to drop the height down on this triangle, because when we drop the height, that will create two right triangles. We have um, the right triangle on the left and the right triangle on the right. And notice from that, from alpha and beta, the height is always the opposite side. And the A and the B are always the hypotenuse side. We don't know anything about the adjacents to alpha and beta. If I were to take then the sine of the alpha angle, that would be equal to the opposite or the height 
over the hypotenuse, which is b. And if I were to take the sine of the other angle, the sine of beta, that would be equal to the opposite h over the hypotenuse side, which in this case would be the a. We can solve both of these equations for the height by multiplying by the denominators. So the first one would be b times the sine of alpha is equal to the height. And the second one would be a times the sine of the beta is equal to the height. And since they're both equal to the height, they must both be equal to each other. So the first one is b sine of alpha must be equal to the other one, which is a sine of beta. To make this formula, though, easier to use, we're going to divide both sides by the side lengths. We're going to divide by a, b on both sides. And when we do that, we can reduce out the a's and the b's. And what that leaves us with is that the sine of alpha divided by the opposite side, a, is equal to the sine of beta divided by the opposite side, b. And similarly, we can extend this and say, also, if the other angle was gamma, the sine of gamma, another Greek letter, over its opposite side, which would be c. This formula is what we call the law of sines. And that is the sine of any angle divided by the opposite side is equal to the sine of any other angle divided by the opposite side. So this is the big formula that you need to know for today's video. And so if that's the law of sines, let's see if we can use it to help us solve triangles that are not right triangles. So here's another triangle not drawn to scale. We're going to say the top angle is 80 degrees, the left angle is 40 degrees, and the bottom side is 15. Notice if I go in order, we've got an angle, an angle, and a side. We call that angle, angle, side. We should be able to solve this triangle for all the missing pieces. We've got a missing uh, side on the left. We've got a missing side on the right. And we also have a missing angle, which I'll just call theta. As we solve, the important thing we note is that we know an angle and its opposite side. So that tells us that the sine of that angle 80 divided by its opposite side 15 would be equal to the sine of another angle 40 divided by the opposite side, which is y. And now we can solve for the y, which is opposite the 40. Solving for the y, we multiply both sides by y to get it out of the fraction. So we have the sine of 80 over 15 equals the sine of 40. And then to get y by itself, we can multiply the sine of 40 by the reciprocal 15 over the sine of 80. Again, when we type this in our calculator, we'll be careful to put parentheses around the sign. And because there's a lot of stuff happening in the numerator and the denominator, we'll put parentheses around the numerator. So if we open a parentheses for the numerator and take the sine of 40, close the parentheses on the sign, times 15, close the parentheses on the numerator, divided by the sine of 80, close the parentheses on the sign, and hit Enter, we find out our first missing side, y, 
is 9.79. So 9.79 for that missing side. We can find x in much the same way, but first we need to know what its opposite angle is. And that's found easy enough. Theta, the angle, is always equal to 180 minus the other two angles, minus 80 minus 40. And so theta, the angle over there, is equal to a 60 degree angle. So. Using the law of sines, then, we'll still use the pieces that we knew, starting with the sine of 80 divided by 15. And then we'll go to the pieces we don't know, the sine of 60 over x. The sine of 60 over x. And we're going to solve it in much the same way, multiplying both sides by x leaving behind the sine of 60, and then getting the x alone by multiplying the sine of 60 by the reciprocal times 50 over the sine of 80, making sure I remember every time I hit sine, it'll open a parentheses. I need to remember to close it and close the parentheses around the entire thing. And when you put that in the calculator in much the same way, you'll find out that the missing side is 13.19. So for missing sides, 13.19. We've now solved for the two missing sides and the missing angle of our triangle. Let's try another example. We'll call that example one. Let's do now example two. Let's say we have a triangle, again, not to scale, where the top angle is 70 degrees, the left side is 9, and the bottom is 10. Notice this one, if I go in order, we've got an angle, a side, and a side. We'll call that angle side side. And these problems become somewhat annoying. If we end up with an ASS, and you can spell that and figure out why it's a pain in the butt, are a little tricky whenever we have an ASS relationship. Let's go ahead and write this ASS. Sometimes that means we could have 0. Sometimes it could mean we have 1. And sometimes it could mean we have two options for our triangle, which means we're going to have to take 180 minus the angles for the second option. Here's what I mean by that. The first thing I see is we've got 70 directly across from the 10. So that's going to be my first setup, that the sine of 70 over 10 is equal to, let's say this first angle, we're going to call it alpha, is directly across from the 9. The alpha is the one that we could have 0, 1, or 2 options for. So we'll say that the sine of the alpha over 9. We'll start solving this equation. We can multiply both sides by 9. So we have 9 sine of 70 divided by 10 equals the sine of alpha. And we found out in our previous video that the opposite of a sine to undo sine is to do a sine inverse of the other side of 9 sine 70 over 10 equals alpha. So on our calculator, we'll hit second sine inverse of 9 times the sine of 70. Make sure you close the parentheses on the sine. Divided by 10. Close the parentheses on the sine inverse. And it's going to tell me that alpha is equal to 57.7 degrees. That is 1 option. Or it could be equal to what's left over when we take 180 minus the angle of 
which would be 122.3. So we have two options for alpha. The way we're going to decide which one is correct is we're going to look at the other angle, beta. Doing the other angle, beta, in the first case, we know all the angles are 180 minus the 70 that was given to us minus the 57.7. When we do it that way, we end up beta is equal to 52.2 degrees. So we've got one option here. Alpha is 57.7, beta 52.2. Or alpha could be 122 degrees. To find beta, beta we take the 180 degrees. We subtract the 70 that was given to us. And we'll also subtract the 122.3 degrees that we just found. In that case, beta is equal to negative 12.3. Well, we can't have a negative angle. So in this case, the second option did not come to fruition. If beta was positive, we'd actually be talking about two different triangles. And we'd have to solve for both of them. But in this case, since we got a negative, only one of them actually exists. So we now know that alpha must be 57.7. Beta, the other angle, is 52.2. We now can solve for the only missing piece, side B, which is opposite the 52.2 angle. So we set up that our sine of 70 over 10 is equal to the sine of 52.2 over the opposite side of b. And we can solve it in much the same way. Multiply both sides by b gives us b sine 70 over 10 is the sine of 52.2. Multiplying by the reciprocal, we get the sine of 52.2 times 10 divided by the sine of 70. And then our calculator will do all the rest of the work for us. The sine of 52.2, close the parentheses on the sine, times 10 divided by the sine of 70, close the parentheses on the sine. And b, our other side, is 8.41. And we have now solved for the missing side and angle of this triangle. So again, the one thing you have to be careful of is as you go around, do you have an angle side side? If you have an angle side side, you might have two possibilities. If you have any other combination of letters, there's only one possibility. But angle side side is one you have to watch out for. Before we wrap up, let's do one application. Let's say two people, 50 miles apart, have spotted a UFO between them in the distance. The first person had an angle of elevation of 20 degrees. The second had an angle of elevation of 25 degrees. We want to know how high is the UFO. So we have two people 50 miles apart. 
and this UFO flying above them that they're both looking up at. The first one had an angle of elevation of 20 degrees. The second one had an angle of elevation of 25 degrees. We want to know how high is that UFO. Now, we might be tempted to use right triangle trig to get started because we do have right angles from that height. The problem is, is we don't have all the pieces we need. We don't know how that 50 is split up on the two sides. And we could use a system of equations with right triangles. But this is going to be much easier to solve using the law of sines. First, we're going to find this missing angle up top. That missing angle up top, we've got 180 degrees in the triangle, 20 degrees from the first person, 25 degrees from the second person. That missing angle is 135 degrees. In this case, as we go around the triangle, we've got, we have to use the 135. It's important because it's opposite the 50 that we know. We always need that opposite relationship to use the law of sines. We go either way around this triangle. I'm just going to go around the right. We've got an angle, an angle, and a side. Angle, angle, side. Nothing wrong with that combination. There's only one triangle possible. So we'll start setting up our law of sines, the sine of 135 over 50 is equal to, let's use the 25 and its missing opposite side of x. the sine of 25 over x. Solving these, we should be really good at multiplying x on both sides. So it's out of the fraction. Then multiplying by the reciprocal. So we have the sine of 25 times 50 over the sine of 135. And again, really important to close the parentheses on the sine. And so when I pull up my calculator, the sine of 25, close the parentheses, times 50, divided by the sine of 135, close the parentheses, gives us 29.9. So we now know that x side is 29.9. I'm going to scroll down to give us a little more room, because what that tells us is if I look at just this right triangle on the left side, if I copy that triangle down here, we know the hypotenuse is 29.9. We have an angle of 20 degrees. And ultimately, what we're solving for is the height. Well, this is just opposite over hypotenuse. This is a regular sine of 20 equals h over 29.9. Solving by multiplying both sides by 29.9, sine of 20 is equal to the height. 29.9 times the sine of 20, close the parentheses on the sine, and the height is about 10.2 miles. So 10 miles high is this UFO. All right, now it's your turn to practice with the law of sines, that the sine of any angle over its opposite side is equal to the sine of any other angle over its opposite side. Be careful of the angle side side option, where there might be 0, 1, or 2 possibilities. Otherwise, there's going to be only one possibility. Take a look at the homework, practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. As we work to solve triangles that are not right triangles for their missing sides and angles, I mentioned it was a two-part answer to how do we solve these triangles. With the law of sines, what was required for us to have at some point was an angle and its opposite side known to us. So the question then to answer part two of that question is, what happens? What if we don't know? a side and its opposite angle. 
can we still solve this triangle? Well, let's look at the theory behind what we have. Again, very similar to last time. We're going to start off with a triangle. And to do this, I'm going to start with calling this left side angle gamma. Across from gamma is going to be side C, because C is the third letter of the alphabet, and gamma is the third letter of the Greek alphabet. The right side I'm going to call beta. Opposite it is going to be B. And the top angle I'm going to call alpha. And the side opposite it I'm going to call A. And very similar to last time, we're going to drop a height down of this triangle. And this time, we're going to break A up into two pieces, the left side and the right side. And let's call the left side just x. We don't really know what that is. The right side then is going to be the entire distance A minus x. And what I'm going to do then is we're going to focus for a minute on angle gamma. And the cosine of that angle gamma. Now, cosine is going to look at the right triangle. So the smaller right triangle on the left is going to be equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse x over b. And if I multiply both sides by b, we find out that x is equal to b times the cosine of our gamma. Okay. The other thing I'm going to look at is the Pythagorean theorem on both the left and right side. On the left side, the Pythagorean theorem is going to be x squared plus h squared equals b squared. On the right side, the Pythagorean theorem is going to be h squared plus whatever this a minus x is squared is equal to c squared. And like we did before, we don't really like the h in there. So we're going to solve for the h parts. Getting h squared alone by subtracting x squared would be b squared minus x squared. On the right side, getting h squared alone would be c squared minus a minus x squared. And what's nice, if they're both equal to h squared, we know they must be both equal to each other. So b squared minus x squared is equal to c squared minus the a minus x squared. And then here's where we get to do a little bit of fun algebra to get an awesome result at the end. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply out the a minus x squared. Remember, there's a negative in front of it. So that's going to change the sign as it distributes through. So we have b squared minus x squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. Minus a minus is a positive. Remember, when we're squaring, we have that middle term of 2 times the product ax. And then when we square the x, it's x squared distributing the negative through. This is kind of neat because you notice they both have a minus x squared on both sides. If we add that x squared to both sides, we're going to be left with b squared equals c squared minus a squared plus 2ax. I'm going to move the last two terms over to the right side by adding the a squared. That'll give us a squared plus b squared. And subtracting the 2ax, which then is equal to c squared. It kind of looks like the Pythagorean theorem almost. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The difference is there's this minus 2ax. And what we're going to do is recall from back up a ways when I use the cosine that x is equal to b times the cosine of that gamma angle. So we're going to replace the x, and we will have a squared plus b squared minus 2a. The x gets replaced with b cosine of the gamma equals c squared. This is the law of cosines. And 
it is a formula that you should commit to memory. It is a formula that we can use to solve a non-right triangle when we don't have that opposite angle side relationship that allows us to use the law of sines. Now, whenever possible, I highly encourage you to use the law of sines. It's easier and quicker. However, sometimes we can't because we have the wrong sides. Let's look at some examples. Let's say we have this triangle where I know we've got a 40 degree angle. The right side is 9. The bottom side is 8. Notice we cannot say we've got an angle and its opposite side because we don't know what they are. What we do have is a side, an angle, and a side. That's side, angle, side, which is one of the times when we can use the law of cosines. To make that work, our angle is going to be the gamma, and the opposite side is going to be the C. The 9 and the 8 in any order can be A and B. And then we just plug into our formula for the law of cosines. Law of cosines says a squared, so 9 squared, plus b squared, which is 8 squared, minus 2 times a, which is 9, times b, which is 8, times the cosine of the angle, which is 40, equals c squared. And what's nice about this situation is I can just type that entire thing in my calculator exactly like it is. 9 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 9 times 8 times the cosine of 40. And when I hit Enter, we end up with 34 point, I'm going to call it 7, equals c squared. So c is the square root of that. And on the calculator, we can just do second square root. And second, click the negative sign to get the square root of the previous answer, which is about 5 point, we'll call it 9. That missing side then is 5.9. We still need to find the missing angles. So let's say alpha is opposite the a. And what's nice now is I now know an angle and its opposite side. So now we can use the law of sines to say that the sine of 40 over the 5.9 that we just found is equal to the sine of our alpha over the 9. Normally, when we have a sine of alpha, we have to be careful of the two triangle case, but that's only if we start off with the uh, angle side side situation. We started off with a side angle side situation here. So we should be locked into only one triangle that actually works here. So when we multiply both sides by 9, we get 9 sine of 40 divided by 5.9 equals the sine of alpha. And then we can do the sine inverse of the 9 sine 40 over 5.9 is equal to our alpha. Again, being careful, when we hit the sine, it's going to open a parentheses. Make sure we close it. So we have the sine inverse of 9 times the sine of 40. Close the parentheses on the sine divided by 5.9. Close the parentheses on the sine inverse. And we end up with 78.7. 78.7 is equal to our alpha. So to find our last piece, there's 180 degrees in the triangle, minus the 40 that was given to us, minus the 78.7 that we just found. And we end up with our last angle, we'll call it beta, is equal to 61.3 degrees. And we've now solved that triangle. Let's try solving one more that uses the law of cosines. But this time, rather than giving us the side angle side,
we're going to do a triangle where we know all three sides, 5, 6, and 7, and we're going to find the angles alpha, beta, and gamma. How do we decide which one to go after first? Well, the best strategy to do to guarantee that you get the right triangle, hint, find the largest angle first. with the law of cosines. And if you find the largest angle first, you're guaranteed to get the right uh, triangle without having to worry about that ambiguous case where there could be two. So the largest angle, we'll call that gamma, is always across from the largest side, which we call C. Similar to the Pythagorean theorem, c squared is always the biggest one. So the other two can be a and b in either order. And when we set up our law of cosines, it's a squared, or 5 squared, plus b squared, 6 squared, minus 2 times a times b, 5 times 6, times the cosine of the angle, which is gamma, is equal to c squared. Now, when we're solving for the angle, we can't just plug it into our calculator. We have to do a little bit of algebra first. So let's go ahead and simplify a few things. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 2 times 5 times 6 is 60. Cosine of gamma equals 49. The 60 is attached to the cosine. It cannot be combined with the other numbers. So I'm going to subtract 25 and subtract 36 from both sides. And when I do, we get negative 60 cosine of gamma is equal to 49 minus 25 minus 36 is negative 12. And then dividing both sides by 60, um, let's just leave it as negative divided by negative is a positive. I'm just going to leave it as 12 sixtieths, just to make sure I don't get any round off error, just in case. We know if the cosine is equal to that fraction, the cosine inverse of the fraction, 12 over 60, is going to equal the angle we're looking for, which is gamma. So again, our calculator. We'll do cosine inverse of 12 over 60. And gamma, that angle is 78 point, we'll call it 5 degrees. Now that we've got one angle with the law of cosines, we should be able to find another angle with the law of sines. And it doesn't matter which one we go after. So let's go after A or alpha. Alpha is going to be across from the A, which is 5. Gamma is across from C, which is 7. So our law of sines says the sine of 78.5 over 7 is equal to the sine of alpha over 5. And we should be very comfortable solving these, multiplying both sides by 5 to get the sine of 78.5 over 7 equals the sine of alpha. And then we can take the sine inverse of all of that. 5 sine 78.5 over 7 is going to equal our alpha. On the calculator, sine inverse of 5 times the sine of 78.5, close the parentheses, divided by 7, close the parentheses. And we find out that alpha is 44.4 degrees. So 44.4 degrees in the triangle. The only one left to find is beta. Each angle or each piece is always easier to find than the previous. We know a triangle has 180 degrees. Subtract the 78.5 that we found. Subtract the 44.4 that we found. Beta is equal to what's left, 57.1 degrees. 
and we solved our triangle. All started by the law of cosines. So another formula to keep track of, law of cosines, we use it whenever we don't have a side and its opposite angle. If we do have a side and opposite angle, we'll use the law of sines, which is much nicer and quicker. But if not, the law of cosines will always get us there. It's time for you to try a few of these, practice them, and let me know if you have any questions. This video is probably the most important video of your study of trigonometry because we're going to talk about the points on a circle that make up the foundation for everything you're going to see from here moving forward. We're going to bring together the concepts of right triangle trig and angles on a circle together to find points on a circle. That's really our question. How do we find points? on a circle. And we're going to start with the theory behind what we're going to see on this thing called the unit circle, or a circle with a radius equal to 1. The theory behind it is really important. The better you understand the theory behind the unit circle, the easier it is to learn the unit circle. And so for our first example, we're going to start with a right triangle. And this right triangle is going to be a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. And we're going to say the hypotenuse has a distance of 1. And we don't know what the other two sides are. But what's nice about a 45, 45, 90 right triangle is it guarantees those other sides are exactly the same. So we know from the Pythagorean theorem then, using this triangle, a squared plus a squared equals 1 squared. Or if we combine like terms, 2a squared equals 1. Divide by 2, a squared is 1 half. And take the square root of both sides. The square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 2 is the square root of 2. Now we like to rationalize our denominators. So we'll multiply by root 2 over root 2. And so we get the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. And so this is going to provide one of three important triangles for us that we're going to use, is if ever we have a 45 degree angle, which if you remember is also equal to pi over 4 radians. And if the hypotenuse is 1, the other two lengths, the length to the left and right is root 2 over 2, and the length up and down is root 2 over 2. That is our first important triangle, if you can remember that. The second important triangle is part of an equilateral triangle. If I have an equilateral triangle, all the sides are the same length, and all the angles are the same. So if I take my angles, 180 divided by 3, each angle is 60 degrees. And each side is the same length as well. So let's say the sides are of length 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a height down that divides the top angle in half to a 30 and a 30. And it also divides the length of the bottom into 1 half and 1 half, which gives you the one whole. And if I just look at one of these right triangles, how about the one on the right, what we see is the Pythagorean theorem becomes, let's call the height b, 1 half squared plus b squared equals 1 squared which gives us 1 fourth plus b squared equals 1. Subtracting the 1 fourth from both sides, b squared equals 3 fourths. And taking the square root of both sides, b is the square root of 3 over the square root of 4 is 2. So what that tells us is for two more important triangles, which are going to be almost identical, the first one is going to have a sharp 30 degree angle, which we know is pi over 6 radians, and a hypotenuse of 1. The second is going to have a tall 
60 degree angle, which is we know is pi over 3. And again, the hypotenuse is 1. These two triangles are very similar because the opposite angle from the 30 degree is the 60 degree angle, and the opposite from the 60 is the 30 degree angle. So it's really the same triangle tip different directions. What we need to remember about this triangle is the shorter distance is always 1 half, and the longer distance is always the square root of 3 over 2. If I think about it, you might notice that the shortest distance, if we have a short distance on a triangle, it's 1 half. If we have a medium distance, it's the square root of 2 over 2. And if we have a long distance, it's the square root of 3 over 2. So it's the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, and the square root of 3 over 2 as the angles get bigger. What does this have to do with circles? Well, that's where number 3 comes in. I'm going to draw really large the first quadrant. And we're going to imagine a circle that comes through this first quadrant. The circle has a radius of 1. So this point off to the right has 1, 0 as a coordinate. The point up above has the coordinates of 0, 1. We know both the angles that go with these. The point on the right is a 0 degree or 0 radian angle. We also called it 360 degrees or 2 pi would be all the way around the circle. The top one, though, that's a 90 degree angle or pi over 2. But we're going to draw a few more angles onto here. The first angle that I want to draw is a 30 degree angle. And when I draw that 30 degree angle and drop down a right triangle, I know with the 30 degree angle, the long distance on the bottom is root 3 over 2. And the short distance going up is 1 half. That means the coordinates of that point are x, root 3 over 2, comma y, 1 half. And as we already said, that's a 30 degree angle, which is also the same as pi over 6. If I come to the middle, I'm going to erase the extra lines here. If I come to the middle, what we end up with is a 45 degree angle. And we know at the 45 degree angle, the two sides are the same. And they're in the middle, the square root of 2 over 2. So if I want the coordinates of that point, the coordinates of that point are root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2, because that's how far over and up we had to go. We already said that's a 45 degree angle. And you remember, that's pi over 4 radians. I'm going to erase a couple extra lines this time as well, leaving behind the spoke. If I go up and make a 60 degree angle, we know with the 60 degree angle, same as the 30 degree angle, the short side is 1 half. The long side is root 3 over 2. So the coordinates of that point are over 1 half, up root 3 over 2. And that, after I delete my extra stuff here, is a 60 degree angle, which we know is pi over 3. We now have the coordinates of all the key points in the first quadrant that go with our key angles, both in degrees and radians, that we saw back in our first video. Now, what's nice is everything's symmetrical. So this can all be flipped over the x-axis and the y-axis. And the same logic can be used to build the entire unit circle. Now, some people like to memorize the entire unit circle. But I prefer the easier way, where if I know that I'm, for instance, at 5 pi over 3, 
I know the shorter distance is always 1 half. The longer distance is always root 3 over 2. But because it's down, I know that particular root 3 over 2 has to be negative, And that'll give us the coordinate point, 1 half negative root 3 over 2. One more example on here. If I could draw 5 pi over 4, 225 degrees. That one I know is right in the middle. Because it's right in the middle, I know it's root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. But because the x-coordinate is backwards, the x is negative, and the y-coordinate is down, the y is negative. And that's how we end up with the coordinate point of 5 pi over 4. And that's kind of how the entire circle gets filled in. Why do we care so much about all those key points on the circle? Well, it comes from an interesting relationship that we can notice about a triangle. Let's say we don't know the angle. We'll just call the angle theta. We already recognize from the coordinate plane the distance to the right is x, and the distance up is y. Look what happens when we calculate the cosine of theta. Cosine is the adjacent x over the hypotenuse, which we are dealing with a unit circle. So the hypotenuse is always 1 here, which means the cosine of theta is just equal to the x coordinate. Similarly, if we found the sine of theta, sine is the opposite y over the hypotenuse 1 which means the sine of theta is equal to the y-coordinate. In other words, if I want the x or the y, I'm calculating the exact same thing as the cosine or the sine. Cosine is the x-coordinate. Sine is the y-coordinate. So if I'm asked to find a sine or a cosine, I just need to decide if I'm looking for the x-coordinate or the y-coordinate. So let's see if we can practice finding some of these points on the unit circle. Let's start off with finding the sine of pi over 3. Well, if I sketch a quick unit circle, pi over 3 is the same as 2 sixths. So we count 2 of a sixth. 1, 2 sixths. 2 sixths. Pi over 3 is right there. We know the short distance is 1 half. The long distance is root 3 over 2. In this case, they're both positive. So that's 1 half root 3 over 2. But sine is particularly interested in the y-coordinate. So the sine of pi over 3, we now know, is the square root of 3 over 2. Let's try another example. Let's do the cosine of 240 degrees. Well, if I draw my unit circle, 240 degrees is a little less than 270, so it's down here. And I know the short distance is 1 half. The long distance is root 3 over 2. And because it's backwards, left would be a negative 1 half. Down is a negative root 3 over 2. That's the coordinates of the point. But I want the cosine, which is particularly interested in the x-coordinate. The cosine of 240 degrees is negative 1 half. How about finding the sine of negative 3 pi over 4? 3 pi over 4 is counting quarters, but it's negative. So we're going to count backwards. One. 2, 3 pi over 4. We're talking about the angle right there. This one divides the circle right on a quarter, so they're exactly the same length, root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. 
Again, we went backwards, so it's negative root 2 over 2, comma, negative root 2 over 2. But with the sine, we're particularly interested in the y coordinate. So the sine of negative 3 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. Let's do one more. Let's do the cosine of 21 pi over 6. Well, over 6 is when we split it up like the clock. So we can count around 1, 2, 3 at the top, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 at the bottom, 10, 11, 12 at the right. And then we're going to copy over it. 13, 14, 15 at the top, 16, 17, 18 at the left, 19, 20, 21. It's the line straight down. What's nice about straight down is we know the circle has a radius of 1. So the point we're talking about here is 0 to the left, 1 down, which is negative 1. We're looking for the cosine, which is the x coordinate. So the cosine is equal to. 0. Let's try a similar but slightly different question. Let's find the angle that has the same sign as pi over 3. Well, pi over 3 is 2 sixths, so that's 1, 2 pi over 3. We want the angle that has the same sine. Well, sine is the y coordinate. So if we make a horizontal line, we have the same height all the way across. And what you see is this angle over here to the left has the same y coordinate, the same height, which means the same sine as pi over 3. That's just another sixth over. So we count 1, 2, 3, 4 sixths, which reduces to 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3 has the same sine value as 1 pi over 3. If I wanted to know what that is, I could drop either of these triangles to make my right angles. And I know the short sides are 1 half, and the long sides are root 3 over 2. And sine is the y coordinate. So the sine of both of these is the square root of 3 over 2. The cosine would have been different. The cosine would have been negative. Let's try another one, this time in degrees, very similar to that one. Let's find the angle that has the same cosine as 110 degrees. Now, you might recognize or fail to recognize 110 is not one of our common angles. 110 is a different angle that's between our common angles. But that's OK. We can still answer the question. We might not be able to figure out what the cosine is. But we do know 110 degrees is between 90 and 180. So the cosine is going to be over here somewhere. Not exactly there. It's not to scale. But we, for our purposes, we can say it's there. The cosine is the x coordinate. So we want the x coordinate to remain the same. So we'll go down to the x and keep going to get our new angle. Now we have to figure out how many degrees are in that angle. Well, we already know that we've got the 110 degree angle. How many more degrees would get to 180? Well, 70 more degrees would get to 180, which means that lower angle is also 70 degrees. So in red, it would be all three angles together. The 110, the 70, and the other 70, giving us 250 degrees. 250 degrees and 110 degrees are each going to have the same cosine. They're going to have the same x coordinate. 
We don't know what it is because it's not one of our common angles, but we definitely can decide that they both have the same cosine. And this example gives rise to a discussion about these things called reference angles. You notice both of those angles that we drew on the left had a 70 degree angle with the horizontal. Those reference angles are often helpful to us as we solve these trig problems. A reference angle is an angle that has the same always positive angle with the horizontal. So for example, um, let's do a 210 degree angle. We're going to find the reference angle. And just for practice, because 210 is a common angle, we're going to also find the sine and cosine. So if I draw my unit circle, 210 is just a little bit more than 180. In fact, how much more the angle with the horizontal, it's 30 degrees more. So the reference angle is 30 degrees. That's what we mean by reference angle, the angle with the horizontal, always positive. And that can really help us see, OK, the short side is 1 half. The long side is root 3 over 2. So the coordinates of that, because it's backwards and down, are negative root 3 over 2 comma negative 1 half, which tells us that the sine of 210, sine is the y coordinate, is negative 1 half. And it tells us the cosine of 210 degrees is negative root 3 over 2. So reference angles is really what we're looking at when we're deciding, is it a short side, is it a long side, or are the sides equal? Square root of 1, square root of 2, square root of 3, as the sides get bigger. Now, everything we've done up to this point has all been about the unit circle, where the circle has a radius of 1. But obviously, all circles don't have a radius of 1. So let's talk really briefly about what we can do when it's not a unit circle. And basically, we're just going to have to adjust our theory, when, which all started with looking at a triangle. On our triangle, we had x, y, and we called the hypotenuse 1. Everything we've done to this point assumed the hypothesis was 1. Well, now I'm going to say the hypotenuse is r. If I do that, the cosine of theta is now x over r. And if I multiply both sides by r, I find out r cosine theta is equal to x. Similarly, the sine of theta is equal to the y over r. And multiplying both sides by r tells me that the r sine of theta is equal to y. But another relationship that we haven't used a lot yet is the Pythagorean theorem that says x squared plus y squared equals r squared for this triangle. This is nice because x is equal to r cosine theta. So if I replace x with r squared cosine squared theta plus y, replace the y with r sine theta, squaring it gives us r squared sine squared theta is equal to r squared. Well, what's interesting about this is if we factor out an r squared, gives us cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals r squared. 
and then divide both sides by r squared. It leaves behind cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. And actually, if we rewrite this, we'll get what we're going to often call our Pythagorean identity. I'm going to switch the order and just write it as sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1 is the way we normally see it. This is probably one of the most important relationships that comes out of trig. Regardless of what sine or cosine are, sine squared plus cosine squared will always equal 1. Let's look at some examples where we can use that property. Let's say if the sine of theta equals 2 thirds and theta is in quadrant 2, find the cosine of theta. I always start all mine with drawing a little picture. Remember, our quadrants start in the top right with 1, and they go counterclockwise numbering. So our theta is somewhere in quadrant 2. So it's over there somewhere. What's important to note about that point in quadrant 2 is the x is negative and the y is positive because it's left and up. And we also know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So if sine is 2 thirds, we have 2 thirds squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Simplifying, squaring 2 thirds gives us 4 ninths plus cosine squared equals 1. Subtracting 4 ninths from both sides, 1 is 9 ninths, so 9 minus 4 is 5 ninths. And taking the square root of both sides, cosine of theta is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5 over root 9 is 3. Cosine is the x-coordinate. And we notice in this case, the x-coordinate is negative. So our actual answer for the cosine of theta must be the negative version, root 5 over 3. Let's try one more example. Let's say if cosine of theta is equal to 1 fifth and theta is in quadrant 4, find the sine of theta. Again, I'll draw my picture. Theta is in quadrant 4, and so if we count clock counterclockwise around, it's somewhere down here in the bottom right. And what's important that we note there is while the x-coordinate is positive, the y-coordinate is negative to go over and down. From there, we know that sine squared plus cosine squared of theta is equal to 1. So we don't know what sine is, but we do know cosine is 1 fifth squared equals 1. And then we can solve for the sine. 1 fifth squared gives us 1 over 25 equals 1. Subtracting the 1 over 25 from both sides, 25 minus 1 is 24 over 25. And taking the square root of both sides will give us a plus or minus the square root of 24 over 5. And we can probably simplify that because 24 is 4 times 6, so that's 2 root 6 over 5, plus or minus. 
But again, we're talking about the sign. Sign we know is the y coordinate. Here, the y coordinate has to be negative. So now we know that the sine of theta is the negative 2 root 6 over 5. All of this comes from knowing the unit circle, knowing your key angles and where they are, and knowing what the coordinates of those points are. Again, rather than taking the time to memorize all the points, I encourage you to keep track of, is it a short distance, a longer distance, or are both distance the same? So you can decide if it's the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, or the square root of 3 over 2. Practice this on the homework. This unit circle is essential that we're comfortable and familiar with it as we move on with our study of trig. We've spent a lot of our time talking about the sine and cosine of the unit circle and of triangles. But there are other trig functions. There's actually six trig functions total. And while we use sine and cosine the most, we should be familiar with what other trig functions exist. And to set this up, let's start with our little circle, the unit circle that we've come to know and love. And we're going to draw a distance here. And for now, let's just call it r. Let's not make it a unit circle. And it has an x coordinate and a y coordinate. Its points are x comma y. And what we know is there are several trig functions. Each trig function has a ratio. And we're going to look at what happens to that ratio if the radius is equal to 1, if we have a unit circle. So we already know the sine of theta, given that the angle theta is in the center. The sine of theta is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So y over r. So if r is 1, the sine is just the y coordinate. We already know the cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse r. And if the radius is equal to 1 and we have a unit circle, the cosine is just equal to x. But we also have tangent that we've seen before. The tangent of theta is the opposite y over the adjacent x. And what's interesting is it doesn't matter what the radius is equal to. It could be a unit circle or not. It's going to still be y over x. What's also interesting there, and we're going to kind of refer to this more officially later in the course, if it's y over x, y is the sine of theta and x is the cosine of theta. So another way to think about tangent is to think about it as the sine over the cosine. But there are a, actually three other trig functions that we haven't worked with yet. These are the reciprocal. If I were to take 1 over the sine of theta, the reciprocal of the sine of theta we're going to call the cosecant of theta. And so it's just the opposite ratio of the sine. So sine was y over r. The cosecant is r over y, or on the unit circle, 1 over the y coordinate. So the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. We also have a reciprocal of cosine, 1 over the cosine of theta is what we call the secant of theta. Since it's the reciprocal of cosine, we'll take the cosine ratio and flip it upside down. It's r over x. Or if the radius is 1, it's 1 over x. We also have a reciprocal of tangent. The reciprocal of tangent we're going to call the cotangent of theta. And so we just flip the fraction for tangent over, and it becomes x over y, regardless if it's a unit circle or not. 
And similar to tangent, we said tangent is the same as sine over cosine. Cotangent's the reciprocal cosine over the sine of theta. So we have all of these reciprocal functions and other functions that we can work with and do much of the same stuff we saw in our previous video where we were identifying points on a circle. So for example, if we want to do some practice examples, let's make a table of some values. We're going to set up a big table here. We're going to start with, I'm going to come all the way to the left, some number of degrees, which we can convert to radians. We're going to draw a picture that helps us see what angle we're talking about. And then we should be able to find the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the cosecant, the secant, and the cotangent. We should be able to find all six trig functions for any angle. Let's start with a 150 degree angle. And it might help to jump right to the drawing here. 150 degrees is 30 less than 80. So it's over here. Notice the long side's going to be root 3 over 2, and the short side's going to be 1 half. And we know in radians, we're counting 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's 5 pi over 6 radians. We also know sine is the y coordinate, which is how far up we go, which is 1 half. Cosine, we know, is the x coordinate. And because we're going to the left, that's the square root of 3 over 2. Those we already know. For the tangent, though, tangent, we take the y divided by x. We'll do the 1 half divided by root 3 over 2, negative root 3 over 2, because it's to the left. And what's nice about this is we can see that the divide by 2's, both on the top and bottom, reduce out. And so we just have to rationalize that denominator by multiplying by root 3 over 3. And we get a negative root 3 over 3 for the tangent. The cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if I flip the sine over, the reciprocal of 1 half is 2. For the secant, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So the reciprocal of the cosine is going to be negative 2 over the square root of 3. We probably want to rationalize that denominator by multiplying by root 3 over 3. So that gives me negative 2 root 3 over 3 is the secant of 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6. Let's actually circle these answers so they don't get lost in the work. And for the cotangent, the cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of the tangent. And notice we had two equivalent fractions. If we take the reciprocal before rationalizing, we don't have to rationalize again, which is nice, which gives us negative root 3 over 1 or just negative square root of 3. And so we're able to find all six trig ratios for 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6. Let's try another one. Let's do, this time I'll start with the radians. Let's do 7 pi over 4. And if I draw that picture, over 4 is the quarters. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7 pi over 4. It's this one in the bottom right in the fourth quadrant. It's right in the middle, so we know it's root 2 over 2 both directions. It's also 45 degrees less than 360. So if I do 360 minus 45, I'll get 315 degrees. So I know that's 315 degrees. And we should be able to fill in the sine and cosine quickly at this point. Sine is root 2 over 2. 
but it's negative because the sine, the y coordinate, is down. The cosine is to the right, so it's positive, root 2 over 2. Let's go ahead and circle those because those are final answers. And then for the tangent, we're going to divide the sine divided by the cosine, or the y divided by x. Root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2. And the y, the numerator, is negative. So when we simplify that, we know the answer is going to be negative. And what's nice is anything divided by itself is 1. For the cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if we flip the sine over or flip the y coordinate over, we get 2 over negative square root of 2. And so if we rationalize the denominator by multiplying by root 2 over 2, we get 2 root 2 over 2. And the 2's divide out, so the cosecant is just the square root of 2. And of course, I'm not going to lose that negative sign that came with it. So the cosecant is negative square root of 2. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And you can see in much the same way, we'll take the reciprocal and rationalize the denominator. It's just going to be the positive square root of 2. Positive because the cosine is positive, so the reciprocal has to be positive. For the cotangent, the cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of the tangent. I don't think I drew the connecting lines. Cotangent's the reciprocal of the tangent. The reciprocal of negative 1 is just negative 1. And we've now found the six trig ratios of 7 pi over 4, or 315 degrees. Let's do one more, maybe one that's a little more interesting. Let's do 90 degrees, which we should know is pi over 2. If we draw that picture, 90 degrees or pi over 2 is straight up. And so we know the coordinates are over 0, up 1, which means the sine is the y coordinate, 1. The cosine is the x coordinate, 0. And the tangent is y divided by x. y is 1 divided by x is 0. And what's interesting here you'll see is 1 divided by 0 is undefined. The tangent of 90 degrees, or pi over 2, does not exist. It is undefined because we cannot divide by 0. For the cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. The reciprocal of 1 is 1. Secant, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, but the reciprocal of 0 is 1 over 0, which again, we're going to say is undefined and does not exist. So what we're finding is all six trig ratios don't necessarily always exist. The cotangent, though, does exist because the reciprocal of 1 over 0, tangent was 1 over 0, is 0 over 1. And 0 over 1 does exist. 0 over 1 is 0. And so now we end up with our six trig ratios, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent, which is the reciprocal of tangent. Those relationships are going to be very important to us, especially when we get into our next chapter. But for now, we're just going to get used to calculating the values. And we're going to do something else that we did in our previous video. But this time, we're going to extend it to all six trig ratios. If the cosine of theta is equal to 3 fifths and theta is in quadrant, let's do 4. If we draw a picture of that, theta is in quadrant 4. And what's important there is that the x is positive, because we're going to the right, and the y is negative, because we're going down. 
Now, in our previous video, we learned that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta always equals 1. We know that cosine is 3 fifths, so we have sine squared of theta plus 3 fifths squared is equal to 1. Simplifying, we have sine squared of theta plus 9 over 25 equals 1. Subtracting the 9 over 25 leaves behind 16 over 25. And taking the square roots of both sides, we know that the sine of theta is 4 fifths plus or minus 4 fifths. With this information, then we should be able to fill in all the trig functions. Sine of theta, the sine has to be negative because it's the y coordinate. We already know the y coordinate's negative. Sine is negative 4 fifths. Cosine of theta was given to us. That's 3 fifths. Tangent of theta is y over x, or sine over cosine. Tangent's negative 4 fifths divided by 3 fifths. And the over 5s are going to reduce out. And so we're just left with the tangent being negative 4 thirds. From here, the last three trig ratios should come quickly. The cosecant of theta. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so it must be negative 5 fourths. The secant of theta is the reciprocal of the cosine, so that must be 5 thirds. And the cotangent of theta is the reciprocal of the tangent, so it must be negative 3 fourths. The six trig ratios are going to come up in many different contexts as the course develops. Yes, we use sine and cosine the most and tangent next. But the other reciprocal ratios do come up in some interesting applications as we move forward. So take a look at practicing some of these on the assignment. Let me know if you have any questions. As we work with these trig functions, it's also helpful to be familiar with how the graphs of these functions behave. Specifically in this video, we're going to take a look at the graph of sine x and cosine x. And that's basically our question as well. What do the graphs of sine x and cosine x look like? And there are actually many applications of sine and cosine graphs. And we'll take a look at some of them towards the end of this video. But first, we need to build the sine x graph. And what we know about sine x is that sine x is the y coordinate. It is the height or y coordinate. So if I draw a unit circle over here, And then right next to it, we'll draw a graph. And we'll kind of line up the height of 1 and the bottom height of negative 1, because it is a unit circle. And what we'll do, just for the sake of this graph to get an idea of what's going on, we're going to label every pi over 4 at about equidistant lengths. So we've got pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, and then 2 pi. And those are about equidistant apart. And what's nice about each of those distance is those distance represent the quarters and the tops and the edges of the circle. And let's go ahead and label uh, this unit circle as well. So we've got a pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, 
pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, um, 7 pi over 4, and finally 2 pi, but it's also 0 as well. And what I can do then, you notice 3 pi over 4 and 1 pi over 4 all have the same y coordinate. They all have the same height. So if I stretch that across, pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 will have the same height. Similar, pi over 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are just down below the x-axis. So 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are low points. Pi over 2, we've already said, is kind of at the top. And 3 pi over 2, we've already said, is at the bottom. The only other observation that I see is 0 pi and 2 pi have a height of 0, so they're right on the x-axis. And so what we end up with with all these dots is a nice graph that we can connect the dots on. And we see it's kind of this nice little smooth up, down, back up. And that's where we get the idea of the graph of sine of x. Sine of x. What I want to notice, let's leave that on the screen, actually. What I want to notice about sine of x is it starts at 0. increases to 1, and that happens at pi over 2, then down to negative 1, and that happens at 3 pi over 2, then back to 0, and that happens at 2 pi. If I were to extend this graph, this graph doesn't actually necessarily stop where we stopped it. It goes, continues to go up and back down. And on the left side, it continues to go down and back up. It actually goes on forever with this wiggle shape. So let's go ahead and show what that looks like by drawing a graph that's centered in the middle here. And We'll label every pi over 2, because that's where the exciting stuff happens. Pi over 2 is the peaks, or the valleys, or the middles. So pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, 3 pi, and then it would keep going. We can also go off on the left at negative pi over 2, negative pi negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. And it's going to have a height of 1 or down to negative 1. We said sine starts at 0, and it increases to 1 at pi over 2. Then it's going to decrease down, hitting 0 and negative 1 at 3 pi over 2. And then increases up to 0, 1, and back down to 0. Going the other way, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. And that happens every pi over 2. And so we end up with this curve that is the sine curve. That's just going to kind of go on and on and on, representing all the heights of the unit circle at any given point. Sine x is very similar to cosine x. Cosine, though, is the x coordinate. And if I think about my unit circle, we're not going to build it. But cosine x being the x coordinate, you see it should start at 1. And then the x coordinate's going to decrease. And so we end up with kind of a shift of the sine x. It's going to start at 1, decrease to negative 1, which is going to happen at pi, then increase back 
to 1, which happens at 2 pi. So let's take a look at the graph of cosine of x. Same idea. We'll label pi over 2 pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, and 3 pi on the right. On the left, negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. We'll give it a height of 1 and negative 1. And the graph is going to start up at 1 because the cosine of 0 is 1. And then every pi over 2 will hit 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Going backwards, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. And it has the same curvy shape to it. It's just kind of staggered from the sign by that distance of pi over 2. And so these are our graphs of sine of x and cosine of x. Now, as we do various transformations and translations of sine and cosine of x, it's important that we're familiar with some key terms that are going to describe these graphs. Some key terms. The first key term that we want to be able to talk about is what's called the midline. This is the horizontal line through the middle of the graph. And it usually starts at y equals 0 if there's no transformation. So if we scroll up to our sine and cosine graphs, the midline would be the x-axis, basically, going right through the middle of the graph. And technically, it should be directly on top, but I have to stagger it so we can see the red line. But that red line is the midline. The second key term that we want to be familiar with is what's called the amplitude. And this is the height of the sine or cosine graph from the midline. And the amplitude, we usually use the letter A, starts at 1 unless there's some type of vertical or horizontal stretch on the graph. So if you see from our sine and cosine graphs, the amplitude is the height from the midline. It goes up a distance of 1, and it also goes down a distance of 1. That's the amplitude, how far up and down it's going to travel from the midline. And cosine and sine are both exactly the same. That amplitude measurement is 1. The third key term we need to know is what's called the period. The period is the distance of one revolution. And the period, we'll use p for period, starts out as being 2 pi, because that's the distance around the unit circle. That's when the graph is going to start to repeat. And what you'll see on the sine and cosine graph is if I just look at a distance of 2 pi, Maybe from 0 to 2 pi, we get one revolution. On the sine graph, it goes up, down, and back up. And then that repeats over and over again. Every 2 pi, you'll see that graph is repeating. And then we're starting another period off on the left and the right. Same thing with the cosine graph. If I just look at 2 pi, you see it starts at the top, goes down, and back up to the starting. That's the period of 2 pi before the graph will start to repeat itself with another period of 2 pi. And every 2 pi, it repeats exactly the same. 
So those are our key terms, the midline, the amplitude, and the period. We need to be familiar with those key terms in order to transform the sine x and cosine x. And you sort of did this in pre-calc 1, where you had to transform x squared or x cubed or 1 over x by multiplying and stretching and adding and subtracting to slide it. We can do the same thing with sine of x. We'll have this general formula that a is equal to, or that f of x is equal to a sine of b times theta minus h plus k, or g of x is equal to a cosine of b theta minus h plus k. And the only difference here between f of x and g of x is the sine is going to start at 0 and increase. The cosine is going to start at 1 and decrease. What's nice about these graphs is we should be able to look at them and see that a is the amplitude or the height of the graph from the midline. If it's negative, the graph will flip upside down. So if a is negative on the sine graph, it's going to start at 0 and decrease. If a is negative on the cosine graph, it'll start at negative 1 and increase. It'll do the opposite. b changes the period. And it's not quite exactly perfect, because the period is always equal to 1 distance 2 pi divided by whatever b is. And so that's an important formula to know. You can also switch it around and say, if we need to know what b is, multiplying by b and dividing by p, we can take 2 pi divided by the period. And that'll tell us what the b should be. h you should recognize from transforming with x squared, x cubed, 1 over x. h is the horizontal shift. And remember, it's going to go the opposite of what you expect, because it's already negative. So if it's minus 5, it shifts to the right 5. If it's plus 5, it shifts to the left 5. The horizontal shift is backwards what you'd expect. And then d, the letter k, represents the vertical shift. And actually, we usually do this first as we build our graph. Because we need to know where the midline is going to be. The vertical shift affects the midline. We need to have the midline to draw the graph up and down from that midline. So let's take a look at a few graphs and see if we can actually create them. Let's start with the graph f of x equals 3 cosine of 2x plus 1. What I can see here is the amplitude is the number out front of 3. We've got a vertical shift from the plus 1 of up 1. So I know this midline is going to be at 1, not at 0. We also see that the period has been changed because we have a b. b is equal to 2. The period is 2 pi divided by b, which is 2. So this period's been shrunk down to pi. Now, there's no horizontal shift here uh, because there's no plus um, hanging out inside that cosine. So it's still going to be horizontally where we are used to seeing it. 
And so let's just start our graph from 0. And let's do two revolutions of the graph. So we know that the period is pi. So I'll put pi in the middle. 2 pi would be two revolutions. And we like to split that into quarters because that way we get our top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom pattern going on. So that's going to be pi over 2 and pi over 4. So 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, and 7 pi over 4. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up, and 1, 2, down. Let's go 3 down. First thing that I'm going to put on this is we've got our midline. I said we start with the midline. The vertical shift is up 1. So I'm just going to put a little dotted line as my guide. Don't confuse that with an asymptote. That's just my guide. That's the middle of this cosine graph. The amplitude is 3. So I need to go from the midline up 1, 2, 3. Um, and that's going to be the top of my graph. Down 3, 1, 2, 3 is going to be the bottom of my graph. So I'll just go ahead and put a light blue line here. That's the top and bottom of my graph. Now I'm ready to start actually graphing my points. Since there's no horizontal shift, we'll start at 0. And cosine, we know, starts at the top, normally at 1, but this time at the top of my graph. And so we've got the top on the midline is my middle. The next point is the bottom. On the midline is my middle. Top, midline, bottom, midline, top. Hitting all of the points that we set on there. And that's going to give me my graph for 3 cosine 2x plus 1. And of course, it would continue on each side of the graph. It doesn't necessarily stop there. Let's try and graph a sine graph now. Let's graph f of x is equal to 2 sine of pi x plus pi minus 3. One thing we need to be careful of with this formula is the horizontal shift is kind of hidden inside the sign because it needs to be in parentheses multiplied by the b. We have to factor out the thing in front of x. So what we're actually going to graph is 2 sine, factor out the pi of x plus 1 minus 3. And that's going to help us see all the pieces that we need. One piece that we need is the amplitude. That comes from the number up front. We're going to rise 2 from the midline. We have a vertical shift again of that midline of down 3. We also have a period shift. The period is always 2 pi divided by the b. 2 pi divided by pi is 2. So this period is actually going to be 2 wide. No pi is involved, which is nice. But this time, we also have a horizontal shift from the plus 1. That's going to move us left 1. So with the vertical shift moving us so far down, I'm going to Go ahead and graph it like this. I said we like to do at, at least two uh, revolutions. So the period is 2. So I'm going to put 2 in the middle and double that 4 to get another revolution. And we're going to want to split that in half. I'm sorry, we want to split that in quarters. So 1 and 3, so we've actually got 1 half, 3 halves, 
5 halves and 7 halves as our other key points. With the horizontal shift of left 1, let's also include negative 1 half and negative 1 so we can see where those are. And then let's give us some height down, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and we'll go down to negative 5. Give us a little more space to see what we're graphing. Now, the vertical shift has been negative 3. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3. Our midline is going to be down here at negative 3. The amplitude is 2. So if I count up from the midline 1, 2, we get the top of our graph. And down 2, we get the bottom of our graph. And so the graph is going to kind of be in between those lines. And as we start to graph it, the horizontal shift is left 1. So it's actually going to start at that negative 1 point. And since it's a sine curve, sine normally starts at 0. Sine starts at the midline. And we know sine starts increasing to the top, to the midline, to the bottom, to the midline, to the top to the midline, and I'm just going every single tick mark, going through this pattern, filling in my graph. And we get this nice little sine curve. And that is 2 sine pi x plus 1 minus 3. Now, I mentioned one of the great things about these graphs is they have many applications. Quite often, they can help us specifically graph how circles are moving around their center point over time. For example, the tallest Ferris wheel At least at the time of me making this video, I'm told there's one in development that's going to be taller soon, has a diameter of 520 feet. If the lowest point starts 30 feet in the air. It's because it's on a platform that lifts it up. It's actually on a platform. You could call it a platform. It's actually a large building. And completes a rotation every 30 minutes. Find a function to model the height over time. For this, it's going to help to draw a picture. And then we should be able to pull out of the picture all the important information of this Ferris wheel. First, we've got this Ferris wheel. It's got a diameter of 520 feet. It's also on a platform. That is 30 feet in the air. And if we were to graph this, we'll put the bottom of the graph on the ground. You can see that you get on at the bottom. You get on here at 30 feet in the air. And then you ride around, and you get up to this highest point. So you see how we can ride around to the highest point, And then you're going to come down to the bottom. In fact, let's go ahead and label the bottom of the circle and the top of the circle. And you can see how you ride the Ferris wheel in what becomes a sine or a cosine curve. 
Another important piece of information we need for any curve, though, is where the midline is. So let's see if we can figure out some key points. We know the entire circle has a diameter of 520 feet, which means half of the diameter is 260 feet. We're going up and down 260 feet from the midline. That tells me that the amplitude is 260 feet. We also need to know where that midline is, though. We started 30 feet in the air. And then we need to increase to the midline another 260 feet. That midline is at 290 feet. Midline is 290 feet. The other piece of information we need to know is how long does it take to complete one revolution of this graph? Basically, what's one period? We're told it completes a rotation every 30 minutes. So the period is 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, it completes a full circle. We should be able to use this information to make our function. We know our function is going to be f of x equals a sine or cosine. Hmm, let's decide that now. This graph starts at the bottom and works up. Because it starts at the top or the bottom, that's going to be a cosine graph of b times theta plus h plus k. So plugging in the pieces we have now, a is the amplitude, 260. But cosine normally starts at the top and works down. This one starts at the bottom and works up. To get that opposite sign, we'll use a negative. So negative 260 cosine of b. Well, b comes from the period. But remember, b is equal to 2 pi divided by the period of 30. So b is actually going to be pi over 15. And it should actually be a minus h in the formula, right? I wrote that down wrong. OK. Times theta, there's really no h horizontal shift. It starts at 0 where we expected it to start. Plus k, that's where the midline moved to, 290 feet. And now we have a function that should be able to predict how high a person is on this Ferris wheel. In fact, we can even ask questions now such as, how high is a person after 10 minutes? So on my graph, if I split the 30 into third, 10 minutes, the person's right here somewhere. It's not really to scale. But um, it looks like it may be a little bit higher than the midline. We can find that out by plugging 10 minutes into our variable. And actually, I said f of x, so I should have an x in there. Or I could change it to f of theta. So we want to find how high after 10 minutes. Well, that's negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10 plus 290. I can do that on my calculator. I want to make sure my mode is set in radians, because we did everything in radians. We've got negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10, close the parentheses on the cosine, plus 290. And we find out that our height is 420 feet in the air. So today, there's two big concepts that you need to be familiar with. One, you should know what the sine and cosine graphs look like. Sine starts at 0, increasing. 
or I should say sine starts at the midline and increases. Cosine starts either at the top or bottom. And then from that, you should be able to look at how to transform sine and cosine based on the amplitude, a change in period, a horizontal shift, and a vertical shift. Take a look at the homework to practice some of these, and let me know if you have any questions. In our previous video, we took a look at graphing sine and cosine and looked at the wiggle that came out of those two graphs and how we could transform it. But we haven't talked about the other four trig ratios. And that's the question we're going to answer today is how do we graph other trig functions? And we're going to start with the reciprocals of sine and cosine, the cosecant of x and the secant of x. So first, we'll look at the cosecant of x, which we know is the reciprocal of the sine of x. And we actually know quite a bit about reciprocal functions and what they look like. And so let's graph. Let's graph a little more than two periods worth of the sine of x. So sine of x goes to 2 pi normally. So half of that's pi, half of that's pi over 2. And in the middle is 3 pi over 2. And let's also go negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, and negative 2 pi. And we know that the sine of x goes from 0 to 1. So let's label where 1 and negative 1 is. And sine starts at 0, because the sine of 0 is 0, increases to the top, to the middle, to the bottom, to the middle. Going the other direction, to the bottom, to the middle, to the top, to the middle. And so if we connect the dots, what we get is this nice sine function. We're going to use this blue graph to create the reciprocal function, which is the cosecant. And if you remember from pre-calc 1, reciprocal functions, whenever we have a 0, is going to become a vertical asymptote. So the reciprocal of 0 is infinity, or a vertical asymptote. So all of these zeros I'm going to change to vertical asymptotes. And what's nice is the reciprocal of something close to 0 is close to infinity. And the reciprocal of 1 is 1. And so what we end up with is this curve that comes down and kisses the top of the sine graph, and then comes in from the bottom and kisses the bottom of the sine graph. And similarly on top, then on the bottom, and so forth. And so if I were to go through and actually erase the blue line, what's left, the green, is the graph of cosecant of x. It's a reciprocal graph of the sine function. Now, we could go through a very similar process to graph the secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine. And it would much look like the same graph. We're just going to move all the vertical asymptotes over to where its reciprocal cosine hits the x-axis. But let's make these a little bit more interesting by adding the transformations to our graphs. Let's graph 2 cosecant of pi over 2 theta plus 1. Well, what we know is cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So we're going to graph the reciprocal function to sine of pi over 2 theta plus 1, which means the midline we know goes up 1 because of the plus 1. We also know the amplitude is 2 because of the 2 in front of the sine. And we know the period is 2 pi divided by whatever is in front of the theta, which is pi over 2. And I can simplify that by multiplying by 2 on top and bottom. 
Also, when we do that, the pi's divide out. So we're just left with 4. So the period is 4. And I can use that information to start to make my graph. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to put some of the information off the screen just so that we can see it well. And let's go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we'll go down 1, 2, 3, 4. The period is 4. So let's go a period of 4 backwards, one period forwards, and let's actually go two periods forward. And we have to split that into quarters, which is nice. That's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we're going to graph the sign first. So the midline went up 1. So that blue line represents the midline. The amplitude is 2, so I know it's going to increase 2 from the midline and decrease 2 from the midline to negative 1. I also know that it's a sine graph, and sine starts at the midline. So I know we're at the midline to the top, to the middle, to the bottom, to the middle, to the top, to the middle, to the bottom to the middle, same thing to the left, bottom, middle, top, middle. And so we end up with this nice little graph. But because we aren't actually graphing the sine, we want to graph the cosecant. Cosecant is going to be the reciprocal. Wherever we hit the midline is going to create a vertical asymptote. So wherever I see the graph hit the midline, I'm going to add a vertical asymptote to the graph. And then the reciprocal is going to come off of that. And in this way, we end up with this nice little repetitive cosecant graph. And we just have to erase the sine graph, and what's left is the cosecant graph. And so now we have the graph of 2 cosecant pi over 2 theta plus 1. Now, we haven't done any secants yet, but I told you the idea is exactly the same with the secant. So let's try a secant problem. Let's graph 1 half secant of 2 pi theta minus 2 pi minus 3. Now again, we're going to first graph the reciprocal graph. And then we'll use that to guide the actual secant graph. This is the reciprocal of 1 half of a cosine. Now, to help us out here, we know with the cosine, we're going to want to factor out the 2 pi to help us with the period and the horizontal shift, which is theta minus 1, and a minus 3 at the end. So I know the midline, because of the minus 3, is down 3. I know the amplitude, because of the 1 half in front, is 1 half. I know the period is 2 pi divided by the b, which is another 2 pi, which is nice. That reduces to 1. And this time, we also have a horizontal shift. Because of that minus 1 in the parentheses, it's going to move to the right one unit. So when we want to graph this one, the period is 1, so let's do 1 and 2. We'll also add a negative 1. We split it into quarters to get all of our key points, which gives us negative 1 half, negative 1 fourth, and negative 3 fourths, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, 5 fourths, 3 halves, 7 fourths. And because we're going to do a reciprocal, we'll add a couple more lines than we need to. We'll go 1, 2, 3, 
and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And first, we're going to graph that cosine. We know the midline has moved down 3. Oh, well, let's move down 3. I should probably actually then extend this graph even lower than I thought. Negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. So the midline moved down 3. That's the midline. The amplitude is only 1 half, so it's going to only come up 1 half and down 1 half. We've covered the period already of 1. Horizontal, it's going to move right 1, so it's going to start at 1. And since it's a cosine, it should start at the top at 1. And then as we go across to our tick marks, middle, bottom, middle, top, going the other way, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. And we end up with this nice little cosine graph. But again, we didn't want to draw a cosine. We wanted to draw its reciprocal, the secant. In that case, everywhere where it hits the midline, we should have a vertical asymptote. And then the graph's going to curve up from the asymptote and hit the peak, down and up, down and up. And so we end up with this nice secant graph. Erase the blue cosine graph, and what's left in green is the secant graph that we were trying to draw. So secant and cosecant graphs, all we have to do is draw the reciprocal graph first, and then use the midline to make the asymptotes. And then we can make our u's and upside down u's within the asymptotes. But we still have to talk about tangent and cotangent. So let's look at those next. Tangent x and cotangent x. And we're going to start with tangent x just because we use that more often. And to help us out, we're going to actually build tangent with x and y coordinates, where y is equal to the tangent of x. So if x is 0, we should know from our unit circle that our tangent is 0. When x is pi over 6, y becomes 1 over the square root of 3, because the 2's divide out if you're thinking about your unit circle. At pi over 6, it's root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. And when we divide the y coordinate by the x coordinate, we get 1 over the square root of 3. And if I plug that in my calculator, we'll call that 0. 0.6, which will be good enough for our graph. Pi over 4 is 1. Pi over 3, the tangent of pi over 3 becomes the square root of 3, which is approximately 1.7. Pi over 2 is interesting because pi over 2, you'll remember, is 0, 1. That becomes 1 divided by 0, which is undefined. When it's undefined, we end up with a vertical asymptote. If we do the negatives, you'll find you get the exact same va values as the positives. So negative pi over 6 ends up being approximately negative 0.6. Negative pi over 4 becomes approximate, no, exactly, actually, negative 1. And pi over 3 becomes approximately negative 1.7. And the negative pi over 2 is also going to be undefined. So let's make a graph of what we learned here. I'm going to label similar to how we labeled before, where we labeled every pi over 4. So we'll have a pi over 4 pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, 
pi, let's go backwards, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 4, and negative pi. And on the x-axis, we'll go 1, 2, 3, and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and see what this looks like. So we've got a point at 0, 0. Pi over 6 is not quite pi over 4. It's close, but it's going to go up 0.6, a little more than half. At pi over 4, we should be at 1. Pi over 3 is a little bit more, should be at 1.7. And then at pi over 2, we're undefined, which means we have a vertical asymptote. Going the other way, we've got negative pi over 6, comma, negative 0.6 negative pi over 4 comma negative 1, negative pi over 3. I lost my negative sign there, but it's negative 1.7. And then at pi over 2, we end up with a vertical asymptote. And when we connect the dots and use the vertical asymptotes, we see tangent becomes this curve going between the asymptote. And actually, it turns out if we keep going, Every pi over 2, there'll be another vertical asymptote. So this graph is going to come up again and level out at pi. And then at 3 pi over 2, it comes up. Similarly, at negative pi, it's going to level off. And we end up with this is the graph of tangent of x. Since this is tangent of x, we should be able to use tangent to build its reciprocal in much the same way we did with secant and cosecant. So let's take a look at the cotangent of x and see how it compares. First, I'm going to draw a couple periods of the tangent of x. And what we found was every pi over 2 was interesting. So pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, and we'll go 5 pi over 2. That's probably enough. Negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2. And what we found out was with the tangent, I'm going to do the tangent in blue. With the tangent, there is a vertical asymptote at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 5 pi over 2. Same with the negatives, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, and negative 5 pi over 2. Then the graph would touch in the center. So it's going to increase and bend over, increase and bend over up, increase, bend over up. Increase, bend over up. Increase, bend over up. Cotangent then becomes the reciprocal of this function. I'm going to do the cotangent of x in green. Hopefully, we can differentiate. And what we found with reciprocals is a 0 becomes a vertical asymptote. So all the zeros of the tangent are vertical asymptotes of the cotangent. And similarly, the opposite is true. The vertical asymptotes become a 0. And so if I add a 0 at all the vertical asymptotes, this is getting crowded. But maybe if I remove all the blue stuff, you'll see we've got much the same setup that we had before. Cotangent is just going to bend the other way. What I notice about the tangent graph and the cotangent graph is they both have a period of pi. The tangent graph, though, has asymptotes at 
at pi over 2. 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, etc. And actually, it should be plus or minus on each of those. The cotangent being the reciprocal has asymptotes at plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, et cetera. Another interesting thing to note is going from left to right, tangent is always increasing, while cotangent is always decreasing. So with this information in mind, let's try one graph. Let's find the period of y equals 3 cotangent of 3 pi over 2 theta and graph it. Well, the thing we know about the period from sine, cosine, cosecant, and secant is we take the original period and divide by the b out front. Well, the original period is now just pi, and we divide by 3 pi over 2. Well, we clear the fraction by multiplying by 2. And what's nice is even the pi's divide out. So here, the period is 2 thirds. The 3 out front becomes a vertical stretch. It's not really an amplitude, but it is stretched vertically of 3. So we're going to see this graph kind of get taller quicker. It's a cotangent graph. So cotangents have, have asymptotes starting at pi and then every period after that. So we actually will end up with, if I go 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2, every 2 thirds, there should be a vertical asymptote. So there's, we're going to split these units into thirds to help us out. So at 2 thirds, there's a vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. Go in the other direction. At 0, vertical asymptotes. 2 thirds, vertical asymptotes. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. It's a cotangent, so it's always decreasing. And so it's going to decrease, hitting the center each time. And we've got our graph. I've kind of missed the center a couple times. We'll just put a big dot on each one to show it's going through the center. And that becomes our cotangent graph. All right, now that we've covered how to graph all these, it is your turn to practice some of these. Practice results in experience, which results in the knowledge and the comfortable uh, feeling with working with these graphs. So please take the time to practice these. Take a look at the homework. Let me know if you have any questions. A concept we haven't had a chance to work with much is doing these trig functions in reverse. And this is really how you make sure you know your trig functions really well, especially that unit circle. We're going to ask the question, how do we find the angle given a trig point? So given a point on the unit circle, can we go backwards and figure out what angle built that point. And this sets up this idea of inverse trig functions. For example, if I wanted to find the sine inverse of the square root of 2 over 2. First, a bit of notation. That little negative 1 on the sign is not an exponent. That act symbol actually means sine inverse. 
Sometimes, actually, to clarify, you'll see it not called the sine inverse, but sometimes we'll call it the arc sine of the square root of 2 over 2. That's the exact same thing. What it's asking for is what point on the unit circle helps us find the angle that we are looking for. So if I were to draw my little unit circle, I should recognize root 2 over 2 comes from that center angle. Sine is the y coordinate, but actually both sine and cosine are the same. When that angle is pi over 4, the point is root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. We're looking for the y. So that equals the angle pi over 4. And we can work backwards with the cosine, too. We can do our cosine inverse, let's say, of negative 1 half. That would be the same as saying the arc cosine of negative 1 half. And again, we just have to draw a little unit circle. Cosine being the x coordinate, that tells me it's negative. So we're going to go backwards. And 1 half is the shorter distance. So I want to go backwards the shorter distance. So we know then at 2 pi over 3, the coordinate point is backwards 1 half and up root 3 over 2. And because cosine is the x, then that 2 pi over 3 must be my angle. Arc cosine is the exact same thing. And we can do an arc tangent as well. Let's do the tangent inverse of the square root of 3, which is the same thing as the arc tangent of the square root of 3. And so again, we draw our unit circle. And tangent, we know, is y over x. And so we want root 3 over 1. And usually with tangent, the over 2 divides out. So that tells me the y coordinate is root 3 over 2. The x coordinate is 1 half. So it's a little bit of x and a lot of y. That gives us 1 pi over 3 is at the point 1 half comma root 3 over 2. So tangent inverse, or the arc tangent of the square root of 3 must be 1 pi over 3. Now, there's a little bit of problem with the way we've defined the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent at this point. And that problem comes from the fact that with example 1, the inverse sine is exactly the same on the other side of the circle. Same with the cosine. The inverse cosine is exactly the same on the other side of the circle going through the x-axis, because cosine is the x. And with tangent, Tangent ends up giving you the same value if you go diagonally through the circle. So what we need to do to prevent confusion of multiple possible answers, what we're going to do is we are going to limit the domain for clarity so we know exactly which one we're looking at. And so with the sign, Sine comes from the y coordinate. So on my unit circle, we always like to use the first quadrant. And then I need to account for negatives on the y coordinate. And so we'll just use the quadrant right next to it. And so we're going to say sine is going to go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So sine inverse of x has a domain from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Similarly, when we do the cosine, cosine looks at the x coordinate. And so if I draw my little unit circle, we always like to use the first quadrant. Then I need to account for negatives 
on the x-coordinate. Well, negatives on the x-coordinate would be over here to the top left. And so we're going to say the cosine is going to go from 0 to pi. So cosine inverse of x has a domain from 0 to pi. For the tangent, well, tangent uses both the x and the y coordinate. So we actually had some choices with tangent for which one we wanted to do. So again, on the unit circle, we always use the first quadrant. And after much debate, we could have gone either direction to get the negative tangents. After much debate, it's decided to go with the fourth quadrant. And so it's going to have the same domain as the sine. It's going to go from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. So we could have gone either way, but it was decided long ago and we've stuck with it that the domain of tangent is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So if you look up at the examples that we just did, Notice example 1, the sine could have been over here on the left at 3 pi over 4, but sine only uses the right side, so we didn't have to worry about that one. With the cosine inverse, it could have been down here at 5 pi over 3, but cosine only uses the top half, so we didn't have to worry about that. Similarly, with the tangent, it could have been down here at 5 pi over 3. But again, we only used the right quadrant, so we just ignored that one as well. So restricting the domain gives us only one possible answer, even though another one does exist that you want to make sure you're aware of. But most of the time when working with the inverse trig, we're going to limit the domain. And in fact, that's exactly what your calculator is going to do as well. So first, with the calculator, make sure you're in the correct mode, degrees or radians. So if I look at mode, right now I'm in radians on my calculator. So I'm going to do these problems in radians. We can find the sine inverse of maybe 0.43 radians. So on my calculator, I'll hit second. And then the sine button will give me the sine inverse of 0.43 radians. And that tells me we've got about 44, 0.44 radians. Let's say we've got a cosine inverse of 0.43. We'll hit second cosine inverse of 0.43. And that tells me we get an x value of 0.43 at 1 point around well, to 13 radians. I could also find the tangent inverse on my calculator of 0.43. To make y divided by x equal to 0.43, we'll do the tangent inverse of 0.43, close the parentheses, and we get 0.41. So the calculator is really nice. We don't usually solve problems so directly as this. We solve problems where we've got a triangle. And we saw this back at the beginning of our trick. We've got a triangle with sides of 5 and 7. We want to know what the angle theta is equal to. Well, from theta, 5 is the opposite, and 7 is the adjacent. So that's going to be the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent 5 sevenths. And so theta is going to be the tangent inverse of the 5 sevenths. And in degrees, if I want degrees, maybe we should hit mode first, change it over to degrees. 
we can do the second tangent inverse of 5 sevenths, and it'll tell me the number of degrees, 35.5, that that angle is. But again, it's really important before you hit sine inverse, cosine inverse, or tangent inverse, you know how many degrees you are talking about with the problem. We can make these problems a little more exciting as we look at composing a trig function with an inverse trig function. Let's look at that. Composition with trig and inverse trig. First, we're going to look at the inverse of some trig function. What I mean by that is we're going to have some inverse function, maybe cosine inverse of a trig function, maybe the sine of, let's do 11 pi over 6. And when we're doing these type of problems, we can really just follow the order of operations, and it falls out quite nicely. Looking at the sine of 11 pi over 6, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi over 6. So I can see that's the long distance of root 3 over 2 and the short distance down negative 1 half. Sine is the y coordinate. So now we have the cosine inverse of negative 1 half. And then we look for where the cosine is negative 1 half. And remember, cosine only looks at the top half of the circle. So a negative means we're going backwards. 1 half is a short distance. And so we know that distance at negative 1 half comma root 3 over 2 happens when the angle is 2 pi over 3. So our final answer is 2 pi over 3. Now, that's not really that exciting because it's just order of operations and working through what we already know. Let's try what might be a little bit more of an interesting problem. That is calculating the trig of some inverse. In other words, we're going to see something like a sine of an inverse function, which means cosine. And to help us out with this trig inverse, we're going to actually draw the triangle and be careful to watch our signs. What I mean by that is we're doing the cosine inverse of 2 thirds. Well, if I draw a triangle here from our angle theta that we don't know, cosine is adjacent over the hypotenuse. That means the missing angle using the Pythagorean theorem is 3 squared equals 2 squared plus b squared, or 9 equals 4 plus b squared. So b squared is 5, and b is plus or minus the square root of 5. And that plus or minus is important because we don't actually know if it's going up or down. So. The sine of this triangle, the sine of the angle is going to be the opposite, plus or minus the square root of 5, over the hypotenuse 3. So how do I know if it's a positive or if it's a negative? Well, it all started with the cosine inverse. And we know cosine inverse is going to give us a value that is on the top of the circle. If we have to be on the top of the circle, the sign here is always positive. 
sine is the y coordinate. The y coordinate is always positive. So we're going to use the positive answer and say our final answer is positive root 5 over 3. Let's try another one just to make sure we're comfortable with that drawing the triangle. Let's do the cosine of the tangent inverse of negative 3 fourths. Now, right away, I should be thinking tangent inverse is going to come from the right side. And we're going to do a cosine, which is the x-coordinate. And the x-coordinate here is always positive when we take the cosine of a tangent inverse. So I already know my final answer is going to be positive. But let's draw the triangle and see what happens. Tangent inverse. Tangent is always going to be the opposite over the adjacent, negative 3 over 4. And if I use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side, c squared is negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. c squared is 9 plus 16. c squared is 25. So c is plus or minus 5. We are going to take the cosine of our angle. Cosine is the adjacent, 4, over the hypotenuse, 5. And we know the answer has to be positive. So it's going to be a positive 4 fifths. We can actually abstract this process a little bit and find the sine of the cosine inverse of maybe x over 7. Again, I know if we do a cosine inverse, cosine inverse will give me the top half of the circle. We're doing the sine of the cosine inverse, and the y-coordinates up here are all positive. So my answer is going to be positive. So I set up my triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So x is the adjacent. Hypotenuse is 7. To find the missing side, we know that 7 squared is equal to x squared plus b squared. Or 49 is equal to x squared plus b squared. Subtract the x squared from both sides. 49 minus x squared is equal to b squared and take the square root of both sides. And b is equal to plus or minus the square root of 49 minus x squared. Now that I know all the sides of the triangle, we're ready to find the sine of the angle theta, which is the opposite, plus or minus the square root of 49 minus x squared, all over the hypotenuse, which is 7. But again, we've established that it has to be positive. So for our final answer, it's the positive square root of 49 minus x squared over 7. So this is inverse trig, sometimes combining inverse trig with regular trig. We can do it on our calculators, or we can do it using what we know about the unit circle. Take a look at the homework assignment to practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gotten good at solving inverse trig functions, we're ready to apply that by answering the question, how do we solve trig equations? And the short answer of how we solve the trig equations is we're going to use our inverse trig. But we're going to stretch that inverse trig and say, but without domain restrictions. So for example, if I want to know it, what 
the angle is for 2 cosine theta equals the square root of 3. We can solve this quickly by dividing both sides by 2 so that the cosine of theta is equal to root 3 over 2. And then I just need to think about my unit circle. Cosine's the x-coordinate, so we want a longer x-coordinate, which happens twice. The same x-coordinate, because cosine's off to the right, it happens at 1 pi over 6, and it also happens at 11 pi over 6. But 1 pi over 6 also has a coterminal angle if we loop around the entire circle at pi over 6 plus a 2 pi. In fact, we can circle around another time and do pi over 6 plus 4 pi. And we can keep going and going. Same thing for the 11 pi over 6. We can do 11 pi over 6 plus a 2 pi. Or we could do 11 pi over 6 plus a 4 pi. Or we could keep going and going and going. And so to express all the possible angles that satisfy 2 cosine theta equals root 3, we'll do one statement for each angle. At 11 pi over 6, we add, we're going to say, 2 k pi's. And k is the number of times around the circle. So that gives us 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi. And same with the 11 pi over 6, plus 2k pi's, because that's going to rotate us. And so these two statements then become our solution for all of the possible solutions for that angle. Let's try another one so we can get an idea of finding that expression for all possible solutions. Let's do 2 times the sine of theta equals negative 1. Well, to get the sine alone, we divide by 2, and the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. So I draw my unit circle. Sine is the y coordinate, and I want it to be negative. So I want to go down just a little bit which means we've got these two angles, 11 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6, that have a y coordinate of down just a little bit. So we can say that our solution then is the 7 pi over 6 plus 2k pi, in other words, k revolutions around the circle, or 11 pi over 6 plus 2k pi, and that gives us our complete solution. Sometimes we're given a domain restriction, though. If the domain restriction said from 0 to 2 pi, we would just have to list the values within the first revolution of the circle. So in that case, it would just be 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So make sure you look, do we have a domain restriction, or does it want all the possible solutions? Sometimes we've got more than just theta for the angle. And what I mean by that is sometimes we're solving problems like 5 sine of 3 theta equals 5. And if we have more than just theta for the angle, in this case 3 theta, we're going to replace with u. In other words, for this one, we're going to say u is equal to those 3 thetas. And so we're going to actually solve 5 sine of u equals 5. And if I do that, dividing both sides by 5 gives me that the sine of u is equal to 1. Sine being the y-coordinate, we know is 1 up here at pi over 2. So that tells us my solution for u is equal to pi over 2 plus 2k pi's, k revolutions of the circle. But we weren't actually solving for u. We were solving for 3 theta. So now we substitute back and say, OK, 
Now we know 3 theta is equal to pi over 2 plus 2k pi. And we can solve this by dividing by 3, which puts a 3 in the denominator, or just dividing by 3 on the right. And we're left with theta equals pi over 6 plus 2 thirds of k pi. And that's going to give us all the solutions for 5 sine of 3 theta equals 5. Let's try another example for this. Let's try 2 cosine of 2 theta equals negative square root of 2. And let's give it a domain restriction from 0 to 2 pi. Same as before, we don't like the 2 theta, so we're going to make that u. And then we're going to now have 2 cosine of u equals negative square root of 2, which we can solve for the cosine of u by dividing by 2, giving us negative root 2 over 2, leading us to our unit circle. Cosine is the x-coordinate. We know we want x to be negative, so we're off to the left. And root 2 over 2 we know is right in the middle. There's just two options for it. That happens at 3 pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. That one doesn't look like it's in the middle. Let's draw better middle angles. There we go. Now, because we've got a domain restriction, we don't have to do the plus 2k pi. But what I am going to notice is the angle's called 2 theta. That's going to double my distance around the circle. So we're going to do that here as well. We're going to go around the circle two times because we have 2 theta in the problem. So for my solutions for u, I'm going to say they're 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4. So we've got the 3, the 5. But then if I keep going around, we get another 2 pi, which is 8 plus 3, 11 pi over 4. And then going around to the last one, 5 plus 8 is 13 pi over 4. So we've gone around the circle twice. We added 2 pi to each of my first angles in order to cover the 2 theta inside the cosine. Because now when I convert back to the 2 theta, 2 theta is equal to 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 11 pi over 4, and 13 pi over 4. We're going to divide by 2, which sticks a 2 in each of these denominators. Dividing by 2 gives us theta is equal to 3 pi over 8, 5 pi over 8, 11 pi over 8, and 13 pi over 8. And now all of our solutions for theta are between 0 and 2 pi. Now all the problems we've solved so far have had nice pretty angles that we're used to working with. But we don't always have our common angles. So what do we do if we don't have our common angles? For example, if we've got the sine of x is equal to negative 0.29. Well, the short answer is we're going to use a calculator and find the other angle. So from here, we know x is going to be the sine inverse of the negative 0.29. We can do that on our calculator. And when we do it on our calculator, the calculator is going to say it knows the domain of the sign is just use the right side. And this y coordinate is negative, so it's going to be down somewhere. We don't know where exactly. Let's find that angle first. So we're going to type in, first checking the mode. I'm in radians, good sine inverse of negative 0.29 gives us an angle of negative 
But we don't really like to see negative angles. So let's say we know the full circle is 2 pi. And then we're going to back up the 0.294. So for our first angle, the full circle is 2 pi. And when we back up the 0.294, that should give us the angle we're looking for. I can type that in my calculator, 2 pi minus 0.294. We're at about 5.989. But there's also a second angle that has the same y-coordinate, if I draw a line through the y-axis, that, cal that the calculator does not tell me about. So I have to do a little bit of work to get there. What's nice is I know that it's got the same angle as the angle on the right. So in other words, this is 0.294 down from 1 pi, which is half the circle. So my second option for x is 1 full pi plus another 0.294. And when I put that in my calculator, it'll give me 3.436. And so now I've got the two angles that give me a sign of negative 0.29. This problem did not have a domain restriction, so we have to actually say that x is equal to 5.989, add the 2k pi, because we can rotate around the circle as many times as we want, and 3.436, add the 2k pi. And that's going to give us all solutions for this equation. Let's try one with a domain restriction, though. Let's do 3 cosine of x equals 1, and let's just do it on 0 to 2 pi. Well, we know right off we have to say cosine of x is equal to 1 third, and cosine inverse of 1 third is equal to our angle. If I think about my unit circle, cosine, we remember the domain is in the top half. Here, the cosine inverse is positive 1 3rd, so it's going to stick me somewhere in the first quadrant. We don't know where it is. Let's actually do that in purple. We don't know where that is exactly. The calculator is going to give that to us. Cosine inverse of 1 3rd, 1.23. So my first option for x is 1.23. My second option for x is going to have the same x coordinate. So if I draw a line through the x axis, it gives me a point with the same x coordinate. Notice that that is 1.23 away from a full circle. If I do a full circle and back up 1.23, we get my angle. So 2 pi is the full circle. Back up 1.23. And when I type that in my calculator, I get 5.052. So for my final answer, x is equal to 1.23 and 5.052 because we have the domain restriction of one revolution of the circle, we stop there. Now, what if we combine both of these concepts together, solving with the calculator and having more than just theta or x in for my angle? Let's try to solve 7 cosine of 3x equals 4 on the domain of 0 to 2 pi. Similar to last time, instead of working with the 3x, we're going to make it a u. So 7 cosine of u equals 4. Dividing by 7 gives us the cosine of u is 4 sevenths. So we know u is equal to the cosine inverse of 4 sevenths. Thinking about my unit circle, cosine's the x-coordinate. 
4 7 is positive, so the x coordinate is going to be positive. Somewhere off to the right. We don't know where exactly. We'll use our calculator to figure out what that angle should be. The cosine inverse of 4 divided by 7, that angle is 0.963. So for our options for you, we've got 0.963. But because of the 3 in front of the angle, we're going to account for 3 revolutions of the circle. So we're going to add 2 pi to get the second revolution of the circle at 7.246. And then we'll add 2 pi again to get our third revolution of the circle, because it's 3x to get 13.529. So we've got three revolutions of the circle to account for the 3x. But that's not the only place that has the cosine we want. If I draw a line through the x, because cosine is the x, that gives us another angle at 0.963 down from the x-axis. But we can use much the same strategy. We know it's 2 pi all the way around, and so we'll back up a pi. So I'll do 2 pi all around, and then we back up the 0.963 2 pi, back up the 0.963, 5.3. I'll just call it 5.32 is our next solution. But again, we're going to do three revolutions here as well. So we'll add 2 pi to get 11.603. And then for the third revolution, we'll add another 2 pi to get 17.887. But remember, u is equal to 3x. We're solving for x, so we're going to divide by 3 to get our final answers. And we're going to divide all six of these numbers by 3. And when we do, we'll just do it on our calculator really quick. 963 divided by 3 is 0.321. Then 7.246 divided by 3 is 2.415. And 13.529 divided by 3 is 0 4.510. 5.32. Divided by 3, 1.773. And 11.603 divided by 3, 3.868. And finally, 17.887 divided by 3 is 5.962. And now you notice all of those are less than 2 pi. We have our six angles where 7 times the cosine of 3 times these values is equal to 4. So we're really getting comfortable with our inverse trig as we solve these equations with sines, cosines. And there could be a few tangents with much the same idea. Take a look at practicing these on your homework assignment. And let me know if you have any questions. Good luck. The whole point of doing mathematics is to model something in the real world so we can make predictions about the future. The better the model, the better the prediction. And ultimately, more, the more someone will pay you to develop that model. So with all this trigonometry, let's look at how it can be used to model uh, some relationships using sine, cosine, and possibly some other functions. The question's going to be, how do we model the real world 
with trig. And ultimately, we're just going to dive right into some examples where we can see that happen. The first example we've actually already seen on one level. It's the Ferris wheel problem. Let's do a Ferris wheel problem and look at how it can help us answer questions. A Ferris wheel two feet off the ground with a radius of 40 feet rotates every 12 minutes. How long is a person above 35 feet in one rotation. Well, we've already seen Ferris wheels modeled. Ferris wheel's on a stand, and it's got a wheel. And we can look at the measurement, the fact that it is two feet off the ground, and that the entire height is radius of radius of 40 feet. So it's not a diameter. The radius is 40 feet. So it's 40 feet to the middle, which then is interesting to note the middle of the Ferris wheel is actually 40 plus 2, 42 feet up. And so we can use this information to decide, OK, the midline of this graph must be up 42 feet. The amplitude of the graph, it increases 40 and decreases 40 as it rotates around the circle. And the period of this graph, we know, is it's going to rotate every 12 minutes. And we, therefore, from the period, know the b in our formula is going to be 2 pi divided by 12, or pi over 6. Also, we know when you get on a Ferris wheel, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. The graph that starts at the bottom and works its way up is the negative cosine. Cosine starts at either the top or the bottom, negative from the bottom, positive from the top. And so we can put all of this together using what we learned about functions, building functions and transformations of trig functions. We know f of x is equal to the amplitude, which is 40 but it's a negative 40 to account for the negative cosine of b, which is pi over 6 times theta, because there's no horizontal shift, plus the vertical shift to the midline of 42. Now, this question wants to know, though, how long are we above 35 feet? So what we can do is we can put 35 feet in the answer, because this is building the height of that we are. 35 is equal to negative 40 cosine of pi over 6 theta plus 42. And that's going to give us a function that we can solve to answer the question, how long are we in the air? We'll subtract 42 from both sides, trying to get the cosine alone. And that'll give us negative 7 equals negative 40 cosine of pi over 6 times theta. Divide both sides by the negative 40. And that makes it a positive 7 over 40 equals the cosine of pi over 6 theta. So going to our calculator then, making sure I'm in um, radian mode, because we use 2 pi for the b. So we need to come down here. It is in radians. Good. And we'll do the cosine inverse of 7 over 40. And we end up with 1.39. So we have 1.39 is equal to the pi over 6 theta. 
But that's not going to actually be the whole story, because 1.39, that's positive over here. We know x should be positive. If we draw a line through the x-axis, because cosine is the x-axis, we should get another angle that has the same x-coordinate. Because remember, you're going to hit this value twice. When you're on the Ferris wheel, you'll go above 35 feet, and then you drop below 35 feet. Those are the two times you're going to hit it. So we know the first angle is 1.39. The second angle is 1.39 down from the horizontal. So to get that, we know it's 2 pi all the way around. And we come back 1.39. So our other option is 2 pi minus 1.39 is equal to the pi over 6 theta. And I can do that 2 pi minus 1.39 to find out that that angle is actually 4 point, let's round it to 89. 4.89 is equal to pi over 6 theta. We want to know what that theta actually is. So we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of 6 over pi on both sides of both equations, 6 over pi, 6 over pi. And when we do, we find our two answers for theta. Theta could be 2.65 minutes. Or with the 4.89, it comes out to about 9.34 minutes. So to answer the question, how long you're above that 35 feet, we just subtract 9.34 minus 2.65, and we end up with 6.69 minutes, oh, just over 6 and a half minutes, almost 6 and 3 quarter minutes. Out of that 12-minute rotation, you're going to actually be above 35 feet on this Ferris wheel. And that's one way that we can model with trigonometry. But let's take a look at another model that's also interesting. There's lots of places where we can model this type of behavior. We can model um, weigh the tides with the ocean. We can model sunrise and sunsets. We can model temperature. Temperature for the week. Oscillates, that means swings back and forth, between 48 degrees and 74 degrees. If the low temperature occurs at 5 AM, when is it 65 degrees? Well, if we think about the temperature then over the week, it's going to have a low temperature Actually, we don't really need the midline. It's going to have a low temperature at 5 AM. It'll go up to a high temperature and down to another low temperature at 5 AM. And then it'll go up and down to another one at 5 AM. Which means the temperature was actually dropping for a while coming up to 5 AM. But we know that the high temperature is 74, and the low temperature is 48. If we average those together, 74 plus 48 divided by 2, that should tell us where the midline is. The midline happens at 61. So 61 is actually the midline of this graph. I don't know that this blue line actually ends right at the midline. It might be above it. We don't know where it starts and ends. The only thing we know is what happens at 5 AM. So if 61 is the midline, you notice that there's 13 up and 13 down. And so if we put that all together, we know that the midline is at 61 degrees. 
We know the amplitude now is at 13 degrees. We can figure out the period because a day is 24 hours. So we're going to call our x-axis 0 to 24, and 48 would be two days. So I guess these other 5 a.m. labels are off. But basically, at every 5 a.m., it hits a minimum. So to find our b for our formula, we'll take 2 pi and divide by the 24 hours, which means pi over 12 is going to be the b. We also, this time, have a horizontal shift. Because we don't know where the graph actually starts, all we know is at 5 AM. So let's shift over 5 and call this a negative cosine. So it's going to shift right 5. And remember, horizontal shifts are backwards, so it's going to be a minus 5. And we're going to use a negative cosine to show that it starts at the bottom and works up from that horizontal shift. So if we put that all together, f of theta is equal to the amplitude, 13, but it's going to be a negative 13 to represent the negative cosine of the b pi over 12 times theta minus 5. That gives us the horizontal shift 5 to the right plus 61. This formula now, this function can now tell us the temperature at any given time of day theta. The problem is we have 65 degrees. We have the answer. We need to find the time of day. So we're going to plug that in for the f. So we have 65 equals negative 13 cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5 plus 61. And we're going to solve this equation to find out what time we hit that 65 degrees. Solving for cosine, we'll subtract 61 from both sides. That's going to give us 4 equals negative 13 cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5. Divide by the negative 13, we get negative 4 over 13 equals the cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5. We can do the cosine inverse again, still in radians, because our period came from 2 pi, which is the unit circle. So we'll do a cosine inverse of negative 4 over 13. And that gives us 1.88 is equal to the pi over 12 times theta minus 5. But again, I have to think about my unit circle when I do that cosine inverse. 1.88 is off to the left. There's going to be another x coordinate that's exactly the same down below it. So we know the entire first angle is 1.88. which means the obtuse angle below it is also 1.88. So we could do 2 pi minus 1.88 will take us back to the angle we want. So 2 pi minus 1.88 is also equal to pi over 12 times theta minus 5. And so if I do that on my calculator, 2 pi minus 1.88, we get about 4.40. So 4.4 is the other time, pi over 12 times theta minus 5. Scrolling down to get us a little more room then, we're going to solve both of these. Let's solve them one at a time. Starting with the left one, I'm going to multiply by 12 over pi on both sides. And when I do, 1.88 times 12 over pi is 7.18 equals theta minus 5. And adding 5 to both sides is 12.18. So 12.18 hours after midnight, the temperature rises to 65 degrees. 
but it keeps rising until it's high and comes back down. When does it hit 65 degrees again? Well, we'll multiply the second equation by 12 over pi. And when we do, we'll get 16.81 equals theta minus 5. And adding 5 to both sides gives us 21.81. So 21.81 hours after midnight, we also will hit our 65 degrees. The problem is we don't usually tell time in terms of decimal hours. So uh, with this first angle, 12.81, that's definitely 12 something PM. To get that something, we'll take the 0.18 times the 60 minutes in an hour. And that comes out to approximately 11 minutes. So we'll say at about 12.11 PM, we hit 65 degrees for the first time. The 21.81, that's almost in military time. If we subtract 12 hours off it, we get 9.81. So that tells me it's 9 something PM. To figure out the something, we'll take the 0.81 and multiply it by the 60 minutes. And that's about 49 minutes. At about 9.49 PM, the temperature seems to drop back down to 65 degrees. So we know between 12.11 PM and 9.49 PM, the temperature is above 65 degrees. All right, it's your turn to practice some of these now. We're taking a look at these applications of trigonometry where we can model them to make predictions about other moments in time. Take a look at some homework problems, practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gotten really good with trig equations and we've gotten really good with trig identities, we're going to actually bring those two topics together to solve equations using identities. And that's going to drive our question for today. How do identities help solve trig equations? Let's take a look at some of the identities that we've seen so far that are important to us. We've seen um, what I'm going to call the tangent cotangent identity, which is basically that the tangent of theta is sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. And that cotangent, its reciprocal, is cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. We should have those two identities memorized already. And they're really reciprocals of each other. So there's really only one identity there, I guess. Then there's the reciprocal identities. And the reciprocal identities take a look at secant of theta is 1 divided by the cosine. Or you could flip that cosine is 1 over the secant. The cosecant of theta is 1 divided by the sine. Or you could flip that sine is 1 divided by cosecant. And the cotangent of theta is 1 divided by the tangent of theta. Or you could flip that and say tangent is 1 divided by cotangent. You should know those three identities as well by now. The other set of identities that you should know are called the Pythagorean identities. And the Pythagorean identities all come from the fact that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1. If we divide all three terms by sine squared, you end up with 1 plus cotangent squared of theta equals cosecant squared of theta. Or if you divide the original equation by cosine squared, you end up with the tangent squared of theta plus 1 equals the secant squared of theta. And any of these three equations we can solve for any piece by subtracting off to the other side. But these three identities you should know by now as well. I'm going to add a fourth set of basic identities that you should know. These are called the negative angles. 
And you should be able to figure these identities out by drawing a quick picture to see what's happening. What I mean by that is if we have the sine of negative theta, and if I think about my unit circle here, we're going to have an angle of theta up. And that's going to give you an x comma y. But if I took negative theta, that would give you still x to the right, but negative y down, which means if we're doing the sine of negative theta, sine being the y coordinate gives us a negative y coordinate, or negative sine of theta. So with sine, the negative can come out. Similarly, with the reciprocal, uh, you'd see the same thing, which would be the cosecant of negative theta. It's just the reciprocal of sine, so that negative comes out secant, cosecant of theta. Very similar to those two is if we do the tangent of theta, negative theta. Tangent is y over x. So when I do tangent of negative theta, we get negative y over x, which is just a negative tangent of theta. Similarly, with the cotangent of negative theta, because it's just the reciprocal, that reciprocal behaves just the same, bringing the negative out, cosine of theta. So with sine cosecant, tangent, and cotangent, we see the negative just can float in or out of the function. But cosine of negative theta, you'll notice cosine being the x-coordinate up or down, the x-coordinate is exactly the same. So actually, the cosine of a negative angle is the same as the cosine of the positive angle which means the reciprocal will do the same thing. The secant of the negative angle is equal to just the secant of the positive angle. So with cosine and secant, the negative disappears inside. With everything else, the negative can float out or in, depending on our situation. So I guess I've got six new identities for you today to keep track of. Really, there's three, but if you understand how that unit circle works, you can just draw a picture and derive each of these without having to actually memorize them, which is nice. So we're going to use those identities today as we solve trig equations. We're also going to use one extra strategy that we're going to steal from a long time ago, and that's the strategy of factoring. You remember if you had problems like 2x squared plus x equals 0, we could solve that by factoring out the greatest common factor of x, leaving behind 2x plus 1 equals 0. And then we could set each factor equal to 0. x equals 0, and 2x plus 1 equals 0, or x equals negative 1 half. And we'd have our two solutions for x. We can do much the same thing with trig. Just instead of x, you're now going to have a sine of our variable. Let's say you've got 2 sine squared of theta plus sine of theta equals 0. You'll notice that's exactly the same as the problem we just solved. Instead of x, we have sine of theta. So just like before, there's a common factor of sine. So we'll factor out the sine of theta. And that leaves behind 2 sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. And then we can set each factor equal to 0. The sine of theta equals 0, or the 2 sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. And solving that last one gives us the sine of theta equals negative 1 half. The only difference really is now we've got one more step as we do the inverse sine. And we just have to think about our unit circle. For this first function, sine of theta equals 0. We want the y coordinate to be 0. And the y coordinate is 0 on the left and on the right. So that's at 0, 
pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, you can see that's really just going to be k pi's. At every k pi's, we hit another solution. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi. The sign is equal to 0. For the negative 1 half, the negative 1 half is going to be a little bit down on either side. That's going to happen at 11 pi over 6 or 7 pi over 6. And then again at every circle after that. So we end up with theta equals 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi. And theta equals 11 pi over 6 plus 2 pi. And these all, oops, I forgot the k's, 2k pi. These all will represent the solutions to 2 sine squared theta plus the sine of theta. Now, quite often, we'll be given a domain restriction, like we just want to go from 0 to 2 pi. So if that's the case, theta would be equal to 0 pi, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. And so in this way, factoring can help us solve trig equations as well. Let's do one more example before we bring it together with the identities. Let's do 3 secant squared of theta minus 5 secant of theta minus 2 equals 0. Well, this is really just a trinomial equal to 0. 3 secant squared is 3 secant theta times secant theta. 2 is 2 times 1. And if we put it, the 1 with the 3 and the 2 with the secant, we can put the 2 is negative, gives us negative 6, plus 1 is negative 5. And then we can set each equal to 0 and solve so that the secant of theta is equal to negative 1 third, or the secant of theta is equal to 2. And then we just have to figure out what angles do that. Well, remember, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So let's flip these over. Cosine of theta is equal to the reciprocal negative 3. And cosine of theta is equal to the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half. Now, something to be aware of, cosine, if we think about its graph, is oscillating between negative 1 and positive 1. It never goes bigger than negative 1 and positive 1. So it's never going to actually equal negative 3. But it can equal 1 half if we think about our unit circle. Cosine, we want a short x coordinate of 1 half. So it's going to be up above or down below, which happens at pi over 3 or 5 pi over 3. So theta is equal to pi over 3 plus 2k pi's, or 5 pi over 3 plus 2k pi's. And we have all the possible solutions to this function. If I wanted to do it just on 0 to 2 pi, then we'd only have theta equal to pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. And we've got our solution. All right. So we're combining two things today. We've talked about a bunch of identities. We've done a review of factoring and looked at how it can work with our solving trig equations. Let's try and bring it all together where we solve with properties. Let's solve the equation 2 sine squared theta minus cosine theta equals 1 on 0 to 2 pi. The problem with this function is we cannot factor it. We can set it equal to 0. 
2 sine squared theta minus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. But we can't factor it because the sine squared doesn't match the cosine. It would be nice if we could change sine squared into a cosine. And that's where the Pythagorean identity of sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1 is helpful. We can solve for the sine squared by subtracting cosine squared of theta from both sides. So I'm going to replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. That'll give me 2 times 1 minus cosine squared theta minus the cosine of theta minus 1 equals 0. And now with a little simplifying by distributing, 2 minus 2 cosine squared theta minus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. Combine the like terms, negative 2 cosine squared of theta minus cosine of theta plus 1 equals 0. Don't like to factor with a negative, so we'll multiply everything by negative 1 on both sides. Positive 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. And now we have something that we can factor and solve because we use that Pythagorean identity. Factoring, we have 2 cosine theta times cosine theta. 1 is 1 times 1. We'll make the plus 1, the cosine plus 1 positive, the 2 cosine minus 1, make that one negative so that the middle term comes out correct. And then we know that the cosine of theta is equal to 1 half, or the cosine of theta is equal to negative 1. We're just going from 0 to 2 pi, so we don't have to worry about multiple rotations around the circle. Cosine is 1 half. We actually just saw cosine being 1 half. We know that that's the short distance to the right, up and down. That's going to happen at pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Also, we want cosine to be negative 1. That happens over here on the left at pi. And so all of our answers for theta are pi over 3, pi, and 5 pi over 3. Let's try one more problem where we have to use the trig identities in order to solve. And then we'll set you free to practice some of these, because that's the best way to get good at these. Practice, practice, practice. We're going to say the tangent of theta is equal to 3 sine of theta. And we're going to solve it on 0 to 2 pi, just one revolution of the circle. This one might not be obvious at first, but one thing we know is tangent is the same as sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta equals 3 sine theta. Now we've got something we can work with. I'd clear the fraction first by multiplying by the cosine of theta. So we have the sine of theta equals 3 sine theta cosine theta. Set it equal to 0 so we can factor. 3 sine of theta cosine of theta minus sine theta equals 0. And now we're ready to solve this function, this equation, by factoring. We have sines and cosines together, but that's OK because we can factor out the sine of theta, which leaves behind 3 cosine of theta minus 1. Setting each factor equal to 0, we have the sine of theta equals 0 or the cosine of theta equals 1 third. That first equation is nice because we know the sine of theta, the y-coordinate, is 0 on the right and on the left. So that's going to happen at 0 and pi. 
Our other one, though, says cosine is equal to 1 third. That's not one of our key angles. It's positive, so we know it's somewhere off to the right, which means it's going to have a similar angle down below it with the same x coordinate. But we're going to have to use our calculator to help us determine what is that angle. So on the calculator, I'm going to do a quick cosine inverse of 1 third. That's going to be 1.23, let's call it 1. 1.231. The other angle is going to be 2 pi minus the 1.231. And if I do that on my calculator, 2 pi minus 1.231, 5.052. Two becomes that other angle. So for our final answer for our angles, it happens at 0, at 1.231 radians, at pi radians, and at 5.052 radians. And we've got our last solutions. So that's what we're working on today, reviewing your trig identities, which you should know all of these very well by now, or at least be able to derive them. Review of how factoring can help us solve functions and putting that all together to solve with these properties. So go ahead and take a look at practicing some of these. Practice as many as you can. The more you practice, the better you will get at them. And let me know if you have any questions. This video is going to attempt to find some new identities around sums, differences, and products that are very useful to us as we simplify trig equations. These trig identities you do not need to memorize, but you should be definitely aware of them and how to use them. So we're going to find a couple new trig identities. So we'll answer the question, what are some? Sum, difference, and product identities. And the first identity we're going to call the sum and difference identities. And to set these up, we're going to start with a our unit circle. And I'm going to put a point on it up here. We'll call that P. And a point over here we'll call Q. And it opens up to P and opens up to Q. We'll call the big angle with P alpha. And the small angle with Q we'll call beta. And we also know that then if point P has angle alpha, cosine will give the x-coordinate. So the cosine of alpha is the x-coordinate. And sine will give the y-coordinate, so the sine of alpha. Similarly with point Q, cosine of the beta angle will give the x-coordinate. And sine of the beta angle will give the y-coordinate. And if I was interested in the angle that goes from P to, I'll call the origin O, to Q, that is going to be the difference between the alpha angle minus the beta angle. So if we opened up alpha and cut off the beta at the bottom, it just gives us that angle in between them. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take that blue looking triangle. We'll go ahead and connect this line P to Q. I'm going to take that blue triangle, and I'm going to rotate that blue triangle so that it rests on the x-axis. And so now it's a smaller triangle. Actually, it's probably going to be in the first quadrant now. It looks kind of like an acute angle. We'll call this C. Um, to the origin and D. And this triangle is the exact same triangle. I've just rotated it. And so what we know then is C 
we'll have an x coordinate of our angle. It's the same angle. It's the same POQ angle, which means its angle is alpha minus beta. So therefore, the cosine of alpha minus beta will give us the x coordinate of c. And the sine of alpha minus beta will give us the y coordinate of c. d is nice and easy, though, because d is directly to the right on the unit circle. It's 1 comma 0. What I need to notice about these two triangles, even though I didn't draw them the same size, they're supposed to represent the same triangle just shifted over. On these triangles, the line C D is going to be congruent or equal to the line PQ. So let's look at both PQ and CD using the distance formula. The distance formula comes from the Pythagorean theorem. It's the square root of the x's squared plus the square root of the y squared. And so we can take the square root of both sides. And we find out that side CD is equal to the square root of the difference in the x's, which is going to be the cosine of alpha minus beta minus 1. All of that squared plus the difference in the y's. That's going to be the sine of alpha minus beta plus 0 squared. Let's play with this a bit before we get to PQ. Let's go ahead and multiply that out. So we've got the square root of squaring the first binomial. It's going to be cosine squared of alpha minus beta minus 2 times the cosine of alpha minus beta plus 1, plus we have a sine squared of alpha minus beta. Now, what you might notice in that is we have a sine squared plus cosine squared, which together equal 1. So if sine squared plus cosine squared equal 1, and we add another 1 to that, Together, we've got 2, 1 plus 1, and then still the minus 2 cosine of alpha minus beta. So that's our CD line. Let's look at PQ and do much the same thing with the PQ line. So PQ, using the distance formula, is equal to the square root of the difference in the x's cosine of alpha minus the cosine of beta squared plus the difference in the y's, sine of alpha minus the sine of beta squared. If we multiply all of that out, we end up with the square root of cosine squared alpha minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta plus cosine squared beta plus sine squared alpha minus 2 sine alpha sine beta. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to write a little below it, plus sine squared of beta. But again, you'll notice. We have cosine squared of alpha and sine squared of alpha. That adds up to 1. We have cosine squared of beta and sine squared of beta. That adds up to 1. So what we end up with is the square root of 1 plus 1 is 2 minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta minus 2 sine alpha sine of beta. Well, we said at the beginning that these two lengths, CD and PQ, are equal to each other, which means these two distances must be equal to each other. 
Let's see what happens when we play with that fact then. Let's square both sides. Let's switch colors and go back to blue. Square both sides. That gets rid of the square roots. So we have 2 minus 2 cosine of alpha minus beta equals 2 minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta minus 2 sine alpha sine beta. What I want to notice is both sides of this equation have a 2 on them. So I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. And that leaves us with negative 2 cosine of alpha minus beta equals negative 2 cosine of alpha cosine of beta minus 2 sine of alpha sine of beta. And then finally, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2 all the way across. And this will give us our first formula. We call these sum and difference formulas because it's going to start with the difference. The cosine of alpha minus beta, if I'm subtracting two angles inside the cosine, that is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle plus, sorry, negative divided by a negative is a positive, plus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. This is our first sum and difference formula. It's actually a difference formula because it's cosine. All of that coming from the two triangles being the same. We can actually have four of these sum and difference formulas, but really they come from what we did up above. If I were to let beta equal negative gamma, and I'll call this equation 1, in equation 1, the formula changes. The formula becomes the cosine of alpha minus, now that's negative gamma, equals the cosine of alpha cosine of, now that's negative gamma, plus the sine of alpha sine of, now that's negative gamma. We know in the first cosine minus a negative means we add the positive. In the middle, the cosine of a negative is the same as the cosine of a positive. And at the end, the sine of a negative, we can pop that negative out in front. And so when we put that together, we get our second formula. This time, it's a sum. Cosine of alpha plus gamma is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus, this time, the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And that is how we can take the cosine of a sum, in this case, or a difference in equation 1, and split it up to individual sines and cosines of the individual angles. Going back to that first equation, what if I let alpha equal pi over 2 minus delta? in equation 1. Now we've got the cosine of alpha, which is pi over 2 minus delta minus beta, equals the cosine of pi over 2 minus delta times the cosine of beta plus the sine of pi over 2 minus delta times the sine of beta. If you remember from our graphs of sine and cosine, the graph of sine started at 0 and shifted around. The graph of cosine started at 1 and shifted around. The key points of those graphs 
only differ from each other by the amount of pi over 2. They've shifted pi over 2 every time. All of the points have shifted pi over 2. So pi over 2 minus an angle will give us the opposite trig function. So where I see cosine of pi over 2 minus delta minus beta, I could think about that as pi over 2 minus delta plus beta shifts cosine pi over 2, we end up with the sine of delta plus beta equals when the cosine gets shifted pi over 2, it becomes the sine of delta cosine of beta. Probably don't need those parentheses anymore. Plus, when sine gets shifted by pi over 2, it becomes the cosine of delta times the sine of beta. And so this then becomes our third function, A sine of a sum is equal to the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second plus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second. And yes, we have a difference formula for sine as well. We're going to build it in much the same way we built that cosines. We're going to let beta equal negative epsilon, as we're working through our Greek alphabet today, in equation number 3. When we do that, we get the sine of delta plus a negative epsilon equals the sine of delta cosine of a negative epsilon plus the cosine of delta sine of negative epsilon. Well, adding a negative is the same as saying delta minus epsilon. So that's going to give us the subtraction we want. A negative inside a cosine is the same as a positive inside a cosine. And a negative inside a sine can come out, making the whole thing negative. And this is going to give us our fourth sum and difference, that the sine of delta minus epsilon is equal to the sine of delta times the cosine of epsilon minus the cosine of delta sine of epsilon. And so if we have the sine of a difference, it's equal to the sine of the first, cosine of the second, minus cosine of the first, sine of the second. And that completes our four sum and difference formulas. We're going to play with these four sum and different formulas to create another set of identities called the product to sum identities. First, we're going to start with the sine of alpha plus beta, which I've changed the Greek letters, but it's the same formula as above. That's the sine of alpha cosine of beta plus the cosine of alpha sine of beta. And we're going to compare it with the sine of alpha minus beta, which is equal to the sine of alpha cosine of beta minus the cosine of alpha sine of beta. And what's interesting is what happens when we add these two functions together. When we add these two functions together, on the left, we get the sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. But on the right, we have like terms. So we get 2 sine alpha cosine beta. But the last part subtracts out to 0. And if I divide both sides by 2 to clear out that 2, 
and switch the order of the equation, we're going to write that the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta is equal to that divide by 2 I'm going to write as a 1 half sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. And this becomes our first product to sum identity. If I multiply in a sine times a cosine, we can use this formula to rewrite them as two signs with the sum and the difference. And we can do much the same process to get all of the combinations of sine times cosine, cosine times sine, cosine times cosine, and sine times sine. For example, if we did the cosine of alpha plus beta, we know from up above in section A that that's the cosine of alpha, cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha, sine of beta. And we can add to it the cosine of alpha minus beta, which we know is now the cosine of alpha, cosine of beta, plus the sine of alpha, sine of beta. And when we add those together, we end up with cosine of alpha plus beta plus cosine of alpha minus beta is equal to two of these cosine alphas, cosine betas. And the last part adds to 0. Divide by 2. And I'm going to switch the order that we write it. We'll put the right side first. Cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta is 1 half of the cosine of alpha plus beta plus the cosine of alpha minus beta. And that is our second of three product to sum identities. Let's take a look at a third. We've got sine cosine, which is the same as cosine sine. We've got cosine cosine. Now we need sine sine. We're going to look pretty similar to what we did last time, but I'm going to start with cosine of alpha minus beta. And we're going to this time subtract cosine of alpha plus beta. See what that gives us. So on top, cosine of alpha minus beta is the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. Alpha plus beta is the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha sine of beta. And I said we're going to subtract these. I'm going to distribute that negative through. And when we do, we get the cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to. This time, the middle terms will subtract out. And we have two of these sine alphas, sine betas. There's our sine sine. We just need to divide by 2 to get our final product to some formula. Switching the order again, sine alpha sine beta is equal to 1 half times the cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta. And this becomes our third product to sum identity. So we've looked at how we can add sines and cosines. We've looked at how we can change products into sums. We're going to go the other direction for our last set of identities. We're going to look at how we can change sums to products. And actually, we're going to use the formulas we just saw. For example, we know now that the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta, opposite trig functions, is 1 half times the sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. And we're going to do a little substitution with this formula. 
we're going to let u equal alpha plus beta and v equal alpha minus beta. And adding those together tells me u plus v is equal to two alphas, or that alpha is u plus v divided by two. Similarly, if I had subtracted them, u is equal to alpha plus beta, v is equal to alpha minus beta. If I subtract them, which is going to change all the signs, we get u minus v equals two betas. And dividing by 2 gives us u minus v divided by 2 is equal to beta, which means we can rewrite our formula as the sine of alpha, which is u plus v divided by 2, times the cosine of beta, which is u minus v divided by 2, is equal to 1 half of the sine of alpha plus beta, which is u, plus the sine of alpha minus beta, which is just v. And because we're going to try and avoid that fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 to clear the fraction. And this will give us our first sum to product identity. We get that 2 sine of u plus v divided by 2 cosine of u minus v divided by 2 is equal to sine of u plus the sine of v. I probably should have written that the opposite direction, because normally we start with the sum of two sines and change it to the product of a sine and cosine. We're going to call this equation 1. Actually, for clarity, we've already got a 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's call this equation 5. Because I'm going to refer to that here in number 2. I'm going to let v equal negative w. When I do that, the formula up above, I'm going to do that in number 5. When I do that, the formula up above now becomes 2 sine of u plus negative w over 2, cosine of u minus negative w over 2 equals the sine of u plus the sine of now negative w. And what's nice about this is we know plus a minus is the same as subtract. Minus a minus is the same as add. And a negative inside a sign can come out as a negative. And you put that all together, and we're going to get our difference formula. That 2 sine of u minus w over 2 times cosine of u plus w over 2 equals the sine of u minus the sine of w. And that becomes our second, this time a difference to product formula. Well, we've got the sum and difference of sine. We just have to create the sum and difference of cosine. And we're going to do it in much the same way we built those first two we're going to start with the fact that we know the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta is 1 half times the cosine of alpha plus beta plus the cosine of alpha minus beta. And again, we're going to let u, I'll do this in blue, let u equal alpha plus beta. V is alpha minus beta. Adding them together will give us u plus v equals 2 alphas. Dividing by 2 tells us that alpha is u plus v divided by 2 again. Very similar, we're going to let u equal alpha plus beta. 
v equal alpha minus beta. And this time, we're going to subtract, which changes all the signs. u minus v is 2 beta. Divide by 2, beta is u minus v divided by 2, just like last time. But this time, we have cosines instead of sines. So we end up with the cosine of alpha, which is u plus v divided by 2, times the cosine of beta, which is u minus v divided by 2, equals 1 half times the cosine of alpha plus beta, which we know is just u, plus the cosine of alpha minus beta, which is just v. And then we like to clear that fraction by multiplying both sides by 2 to get our third formula, that 2 cosine of u plus v over 2 times cosine of u minus v over 2 is equal to the cosine of u plus the cosine of v. Now we've got our cosine plus cosine changing into a product. We have one left. What we did last time to find the difference is we just made the last variable negative because we could pull it out of the sign. It would become sine minus sine. With cosine just making it negative, that doesn't quite work because the cosine of a negative is the positive cosine of the positive. So instead, we're going to use another one of our product formulas. We're going to start with sine of alpha sine of beta equals 1 half cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta. And again, we're going to let u equal alpha plus beta, v equal alpha minus beta. And I'm not going to do it again. It's exactly the same as the last two times that we did it. Alpha is equal to u plus v over 2. And beta becomes u minus v over 2. So that when we substitute, we get the sine of alpha, which is u plus v over 2, times the sine of beta, which is u minus v over 2 is equal to 1 half times the cosine of alpha minus beta, which is u, minus the cosine of alpha plus beta, which is v. And again, we'll multiply by 2 to get 2 sine of u plus v over 2 times the sine of u minus v over 2 is equal to the cosine of u minus the cosine of v. And that becomes our next formula. So we've talked about a lot of formulas and where they come from in this video. We did the, we started with the sum and difference formulas, came up with four of those, the cosine of alpha plus or minus beta and the sine of alpha minus beta. We use those to make our product to sum formulas, sine times cosine, cosine times cosine, and sine times sine. And we use those to build our sum to product formulas, sine plus sine, sine minus sine, cosine plus cosine, and cosine minus cosine. Now that we have all these formulas, we need to look at how to use them. But that's going to be saved for another video. Now that we've taken the time to derive some very important identities for trigonometry, we're going to take a look at how we can use these new identities. How do we use the sum and product identities? And first, let's look at a use of the sum and difference identities. And just for the sake of review, let's uh, write down what the identities are. 
We found there were four of them. We can take the cosine of the difference of an angle. We'll call it alpha minus beta. That's equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle plus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. We could do a sum, the cosine of alpha plus beta. We found out that was the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. We saw the sine of a sum, alpha plus beta. And that was the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle plus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And finally, we saw that the sine of a difference, alpha minus beta, is equal to the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. So these four identities are our sum and difference identities that we're going to use here. How do we use them? Well, now we can use these identities to help us find the exact values of sines and cosines of angles we weren't able to do before. Let's say we wanted to find the cosine of 75 degrees. That's not one of our key angles. But it can be split up to be either a sum or difference of our key angles. And there's actually two ways to do it. Let's do it both ways so we can see how it gives us the same answer. Um, we could write it as a sum. So I need to think about my key angles that I have, 30, 45, 60, 90. Those are all key angles that we know values for. And notice if I add the 30 and the 40 together, 45 together, I should say, that would give us 75 degrees. So now I've broken that 75 up into a sum. So we can take the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle using the cosine sum formula. And we know each of these values on the unit circle. A 30 degree angle is the short one. So the x is long, root 3 over 2. The y is short, 1 half. 45 degrees we know is right in the middle. That's root 2 over 2, comma, root 2 over 2. And so using that, the cosine of 30, that's the x coordinate, root 3 over 2, times the cosine of 45, root 2 over 2, minus the sine of 30, 1 half times the sine of 45, root 2 over 2. Simplifying, that's going to give me root 6 over 4 minus root 2 over 4, which since we have a common denominator of 4, we can write that as the square root of 6 minus the square root of 2 over 4. And now we're able to find the exact value of the cosine of 75 degrees. We could write 75 as a sum. We can also write 75 as a difference. Using those numbers of 30, 45, 60, and 90, can you get 75 as a difference? Well, maybe not yet. Let's uh, add a few more angles. We've got 125, 135, um, 150, 180. These are all angles we know values of. And what you should notice is 125 minus 45 equals 75 degrees. So we should be able to use a difference formula in order to calculate the cosine of 75. The difference formula says we take the cosine of the first angle 
times the cosine of the second angle plus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And if we set up our unit circle now, 120 is just slightly more than 90. That means we've got a long, oh, I'm sorry, the x coordinate is short, negative 1 half, comma, the y coordinate's tall, root 3 over 2. And the 45 is the same 45 we had before, root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. And so when I plug this in, the cosine, the x coordinate of 120 degrees is negative 1 half times the cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2 plus the sine of 120, that's the y coordinate root 3 over 2, times the sine of 45, which is root 2 over 2. Multiplying, that gives negative root 2 over 4 plus root 6 over 4. And since we have a common denominator of 4, I'll just put the positive one first, square root of 6 minus square root of 2. And we get the exact same answer, whether we did it as a sum or a difference. All we had to do was identify the combination of known angles to give me the angle I wanted. We did this one in degrees. We like to work more often, though, with radians. So let's try an example with radians. Let's find the sine of 13 pi over 12. Well, let's see. We know pi over 6, which is 2 pi over 12, getting that common denominator, how many we find. Uh, we know pi over 4. That's going to be 3 pi over 12. We know pi over 3. That's going to be 4 pi over 12. We know pi over 2. That's 6 pi over 12. Still not there. Um, 2 pi over 3. Um, that's going to be 8 pi over 12. Uh, 3 pi over 4, we know that one. That's going to be 9 pi over 12. And wait a minute. 9 plus 4 is 13 pi over 12. We're going to do pi over 3 and 3 pi over 4 as a sine. We're going to do the sine of 4 pi over 12 plus 9 pi over 12, which reduces. Let's go ahead and reduce that to the sine of pi over 3 plus 3 pi over 4. And using our sine formula, we know that's equal to the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle plus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And so again, we go to our unit circle. Pi over 3 is up here. That's a short x of 1 half, a long y of root 3 over 2. 3 pi over 4 is off to the side, right in the middle. The x is negative, so negative root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. Putting all that together, the sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, the y coordinate. Cosine, the x coordinate of 3 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2 plus the cosine x coordinate of pi over 3 is 1 half times the sine y coordinate of, root of 3 pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. We end up with negative root 6 over 4 plus root 2 over 2. And we like the positive to be first. So positive root 2 minus root 6 over whoops 4. 2 times 2 is 4, sorry. And that becomes our final answer for the sine of 13 pi over 12. We could have done it as a subtraction problem, though. There's no reason we had to do it as an addition. Can you find two angles that subtract 
to the 13 pi over 12. Let's not take it off the screen yet. Well, let's see. 3 pi over 4. That didn't quite get us there. Um, we need something bigger. So we've got 5 pi over 6, which is 10 pi over 12. Um, we've got pi, which is 12 pi over 12. I guess I do need to scroll here. Uh, we've got 7 pi over 6. That's 14 pi over 12. Next would be 5 pi over 4, which is 15 pi over 12. And do you see that one? Fifteen pi over twelve minus two pi over twelve will equal thirteen pi over twelve. So let's use those ratios. We're going to do fifteen pi over twelve minus two pi over twelve which then simplifies to our known angles. 15 divided by 3 is 5 pi over 4 minus 1 pi over 6. And since we have a difference, we can use our sine of a difference formula that says we take the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle, which means we just need our little unit circle. 5 pi over 4 is down here. They're both negative. Negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. Pi over 6 is up here. It's got a long x, root 3 over 2, and a short y, 1 half. And so we just plug in what we know. The sine or y coordinate of 5 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2 times the cosine of pi over 6, which is root 3 over 2, minus the cosine of 5 pi over 4, which is a negative root 2 over 2, times the sine of pi over 6, the y coordinate is 1 half. And so when we multiply, we get negative root 6 over 4. Minus a negative makes it a plus root 2 over 4. Since we have a common denominator of 4, we'll say that's root 2 minus root 6 all over 4. And we get the exact same answer that we got before. So these sum and difference formulas really give us a great way to find exact values of sines and cosines that we didn't have from our unit circle discussion earlier. I want to look also at how we can use um, some of the other formulas that we saw. We saw the next set of identities we derived was the product to sum identities. And these identities start with a product of sines and cosines. We might have the sine of something times the cosine of something else. And we can change that product to 1 half times the sine of the sum plus the sine of the difference of those angles. If we multiply two signs together, sine of alpha, sine of beta, that would be equal to 1 half times the cosine of the difference minus the cosine of the sum. If we had cosine times cosine, cosine alpha, cosine beta, That would be equal to 1 half times the cosine of the sum plus the cosine of the difference. And so this became the next set of 
properties that we should be familiar with. And we're just going to do a really quick example so you can see how this can actually work to help us maybe simplify an expression or at least write it differently. And then I'll let you practice these on the homework because this is just plug and chug from the formula. Let's say we've got the sine of 2t times the sine of 4t. We can write that out because that's a sine sine. That's 1 half times the cosine of the difference, 2t minus 4t, minus the cosine of the sum, 2t plus 4t. Well, simplifying then, we get 1 half times the cosine of negative 2t minus the cosine of 6t. And actually, we can go one step further here, because if there's a negative inside a cosine, we know it kind of disappears, because a negative or positive angle will have the same cosine values. So I can even take one more step and say that's 1 half times the cosine of 2t minus the cosine of 6t. And I've got my simplified result. So we've changed the product into a difference. There was one other set of properties that we looked at deriving then, and that was going the other direction, going from the sum to the product. And there were four of these identities. If we have a sum of sines, sine of alpha plus the sine of beta, we found out that was 2 times the sine of alpha plus beta over 2 times the cosine of alpha minus beta over 2. If we subtracted two sines, sine of alpha minus the sine of beta, we found that was equal to 2 times the sine of alpha minus beta over 2 times the cosine of alpha plus beta over 2. If we added two cosines, cosine alpha plus cosine beta, we found that was 2 times the cosine of the sum over 2 times the cosine of the difference over 2. And if I've got the cosine of the difference, we found out that was equal to a negative 2 times the sine of the sum times the sine of the difference over 2. So the last four properties that we talked about were these four, taking a sum or a difference to a product. Let's do one example where we can use those as well. Let's um, take a look at simplifying the cosine of 5x plus the cosine of 3x. This is adding two cosines together. That's letter C up above. So it's going to be 2 times the cosine of the sum, 5x plus 3x over 2, times the cosine of the difference, 5x minus 3x over 2. Then we just have to simplify what we end up with. That's going to be 2 cosine of 8x over 4, cosine of 2x over 2, which we can reduce those fractions to get 2 cosine of 2x times the cosine 
of x. I guess we can put that x in parentheses. And so this video was a little shorter than the last one where we actually derived all of these formulas. But it does take a look at how we can use the formulas to help us simplify or evaluate problems. We've got some sum to the product identities. We've got product to sum identities. And we've got the sum and difference identities to practice with. We're going to look at how we can use these identities to help with solving equations and, sol and simplifying identities in another video. But right now, let's get comfortable with using them and recognizing how we can use them. Let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gone through and derived several of these new identities and then looked at some uses to simplify using the new identities, we're ready to answer the question. The question we've really been interested in the past two videos is how do we use? these identities. And there's going to be three uses that we're going to look at here that are going to be useful to us as we move through our study of math. The first use is to write as a single sign. And this is a trick that's going to come up in calculus and also in differential equations if you continue taking those courses. That's going to be very useful. And we're going to set it up by working backwards. We're going to start with the answer and work backwards to the question, and then use uh, patterns that we observe in order to establish a rule so that we can write problems as a single sign. We're going to consider. a sine of bx plus c. And in this a sine of bx plus c, we would actually know what a, b, and c are. So I want you to think about a, b, and c as numbers. The only real unknown here is x. So a is out in front of everything. And then what we have is we have the sine of a sum. And we know the sine of the sum can be written as the sine of the first angle, bx, times the cosine of the second angle, c, plus the cosine of the first angle, bx, times the sine of the second angle, c. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute the a through onto both parts. And as I do, I'm going to write the cosine c and sine c first. We'll put the part with the variable at the end. So when we distribute the a through, we have a cosine of c times the sine of bx plus a sine of c times the cosine of bx. And what I want to notice that's interesting here is that a cosine c there's no variable in there. We could plug that in our calculator and actually figure out what number that is, because we know what a and c are. I'm going to call that number m, just to make life easier. And also, the a sine c, similarly, is just a number. It's a different number because it's a sine instead of a cosine. But let's call that number n. And what I want to notice about those two numbers, m and n, is that when we look at m squared plus n squared, that becomes a cosine c squared plus a sine c squared. And if I square both parts, that becomes a squared cosine squared plus a squared sine squared. And you might notice that if I factor out the a, that leaves behind cosine squared c plus sine squared c. And why is cosine squared plus sine squared important to us? Well, we know that cosine squared times sine squared, or minus sine squared, is 1. So we're really just left with a squared. Oops, I forgot the squared there. So what that tells us is that m squared plus n squared 
equals a squared. That's going to be our first important relationship that we observed is that a squared is equal to m squared plus n squared. Another thing that I want to notice is if m was equal to a cosine of c, then the cosine of c is equal to m over a. That's going to be another important relationship. Also, if n was equal to a sine of c, then the sine of c is equal to n over a. These three relationships are going to help us take an expression that's got a sum or a difference of sines and cosines. Notice we've got a sine combined with a cosine. And we're going to write them as a single sine. We'll use these three formulas in red to find the a, b, and c to be written as a single sine. Just to kind of summarize it. m sine of bx plus n cosine of bx equals a sine of bx plus c, where a squared equals m squared plus n squared. Cosine of c equals m over n. And the sine of c equals, I'm sorry, m over a. And the sine of c equals n over a. That summarizes all the highlighted stuff in one spot is how we're going to write an expression with sine and cosine as a single sign. So if we saw something like 4 square root of 3 sine of 5x minus 4 cosine of 5x, we can rewrite this as a single sign. The 4 root 3 is the m. The negative 4 is the n. So a squared is equal to 4 root 3 squared plus negative 4 squared, or 16 times 3 plus 16, which is 64. So if a squared equals 64, a is the square root of 64, which is 8. So we now have our a. b is the number in front of the x. We still need the c. To find the c, we're going to use the fact that the cosine of c comes from the coefficient of sine. Notice they're opposites, 4 root 3, divided by the a we just found of 8. And the sine of c is equal to the n which is in front of the cosine, negative 4, divided by a, which is 8. And we can simplify that and say the cosine of c is root 3 over 2. And the sine of c is negative 1 half. Thinking about my unit circle then, cosine is the x-coordinate. That's a long distance. Sine y-coordinate is negative, so we're going down a short distance. So it must be this angle over here, 11 pi over 6 is equal to c. Notice we need both the sine and the cosine. The reason we need both is because cosine works for two angles. Sine works for two angles. And so we need both of them together to make sure we're in the correct quadrant. 
But now that we know a and we know c, we can change this expression to a single sign, a, which is 8, times the sine of bx, 5x, plus c. We just found out c was 11 pi over 6. And this single sign is equivalent to our original problem. Let's try another one. I think this is number 4. We're going to do negative 2 sine of 3x minus 4 cosine of 3x. And let's say it equals 1. We're going to solve for x here. Let's see if we can do this. We've got both sine and cosine, so that makes it difficult to actually solve. So what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this as a single sign, where the negative 2 is m, the negative 4 is n. a squared is equal to negative 2 squared plus negative 4 squared, or 4 plus 16, which is 20. So if a squared is equal to 20, then a is equal to the square root of 20. We also know that the cosine of our c is equal to m negative 2 over the square root of 20. And we know that the sine of c is equal to m n negative 4 divided by a, which is the square root of 20. And that's not one of our key angles. So we're going to have to use our calculator for this one, which is just fine. But I want to notice if I draw my unit circle, cosine is negative and the sine is negative. That means x is negative and y is negative. I don't know where exactly, but that should put me in the third quadrant. So I'll use my calculator from here, make sure I'm in the correct mode. I'm in radian mode. Good. We're going to do the cosine inverse of negative 2 over the square root of 20. And that's going to give me 2.03. But remember, cosine inverse has a domain that's going to stick me up in the top half which means the angle we found is over here. That's that 2.304. 2.034, sorry. We don't want that angle. We want to go all the way to the green line. So. Another way I can think about it is it's 2 pi all the way around the circle. This bottom angle, then, is also 2.034. So c must be 2 pi minus, backing up, 2.034. And when we do that, 2 pi minus 2.034 we get 4.249 for our c. We could have also done the sine and then done some work to get there as well. But uh, either one will get us there. We do need to write down both, though, because both told us which quadrant we were in. Then we were able to figure out exactly what angle c was. So now writing this as a single sign that is equal to 1, it is a square root of 20 times the sine of bx, 3x, plus c, which is 4.294, equal to 1.
now we can solve this equation, because we've taken it from something that has both sine and cosine to an equation that just has sine. And we can solve by getting the sine alone, sine of 3x plus 4.294 is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 20. Going to the calculator, then, we can do the sine inverse of 1 divided by the square root of 20. And when I do that, I get an angle of 0.22. Let's round that to 6. So the 3x plus 4.294 is equal to 0.226. But remember, when we're solving with sine, there's always two options. 0.226 is somewhere over here. But there's another angle to the left that has the same y coordinate, which has a terminal angle of 0.226. And if it's pi halfway around, then we're going to back up 0.226. So pi minus 0.226 is about 2.916. Another thing I'm going to be careful of here is you can see when we're solving this equation, we're going to ultimately be dividing by a 3, which means I need to count for three revolutions of this circle. So we have several solutions to consider. We've got 0 0.226, 0 0.226 plus 2 pi. Get you around the circle once. 0.226 plus 4 pi, and that gives you your third circle. We also have the 2.916. Another time around the circle is 2.916 plus 2 pi. And another time around the circle is 2.916 plus 4 pi. So we've got to account for every time around the circle to get all of our solutions between 0 and 2 pi. So if we do this on our calculator, 0.226 plus 2 pi gives us 6.509. 0 0.226. When we add the 4 pi, that would be another 2 pi. So I'm just going to take my answer plus 2 pi is 12.792. Then we've got the 2.916. 2.916 plus 2 pi gives us 9.199. And then finally, adding another 2 pi to get us the third lap around the circle, 15.482. And so our 3x plus 4.294 is equal to all six of these numbers. So now it's a bit tedious on the calculator, but we can get there. We're going to first subtract off, and I'm just going to highlight what I'm focusing on instead of writing it every time. We're going to subtract off the 4.294, giving us 3x is equal to. And when we do this on our calculator, the 0.226 minus the 4.294, we get negative 4.068. With the 6.509, we get 2.215. With the 12, we get 8.498. With the 2, negative 1.378. With the 9, we end up with 4.902. And with the 15, we have 11.188. Then we divide by the 3. And that's going to give us our six values for x 
negative 1.356, 0.738, 2 0.833, negative 0.459, 1.634, and 3.729. Now, we don't like the negatives, so on those negatives, I'm going to add 2 pi to get them around the circle real quick. So we've got negative 1.356 plus 2 pi gives us 4.927. And then the negative 0.459, when I add 2 pi to that, I get uh, 5.824. So let's see if we can list our solutions here for x in order from smallest to largest so they look a little bit more organized. The smallest solution is 0.738. And then there's the 1.634. Then there's a 2.833. Then there's the 3.729. Then 4.927. And finally, 5.824. And that's how we can now solve our equation. Using a lot of concepts from earlier sections, but it always made possible because we could rewrite that left side as a single sign and then solve using what we know about solving equations. Speaking of solving, let's go more into the solving equations with these identities. I said we were going to do three things with these identities. The first was writing as a single sign. The second is solving with identities. We now have a way to solve equations also like sine of x times the sine of 2x plus the cosine of x times the cosine of 2x equals the square root of 3 over 2. Because we should recognize that sine sine plus cosine cosine is the cosine of a difference formula, where we can just do x minus the 2x equals root 3 over 2. Well, now that it's a difference formula, we can simplify even further. And this is the cosine of negative x equals root 3 over 2. And we know a negative inside a cosine is like it wasn't there at all. So we want to know when the cosine is equal to root 3 over 2. And all of a sudden, a complicated looking problem becomes a very simple problem to solve. Let's solve this one for all solutions rather than just on 0 to 2 pi. Root 3 over 2 is the long distance, and it's positive. So we must be talking about these two angles here, pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. And so x is equal to that pi over 6 plus 2k pi, however many revolutions around the circle, or 11 pi over 6 plus 2k pi. And that gives us all solutions to this original problem that looked very complicated, but was made simple with the properties. Let's try another one. Let's do the sine of x plus the sine of 3x equals the cosine of x. Well, we've got a sum of signs. We can change a sum of signs into a product, a sum to a product. That sum of signs is equal to the 2 
times the sine of x plus 3x over 2 times the cosine of x plus 3x, I'm sorry, minus. It's minus on the cosine over 2. And then it's still equal to the cosine of x. But look how nicely this simplifies. We have 2 sine of 4x over 2 times the cosine of negative 2x over 2 equals the cosine of x, or 2 sine of 2x times the cosine of negative x, but that's just the same as x, equals the cosine of x. Because remember, that negative sign is optional inside a cosine. It can just disappear. Now we've got something we can solve. We solved this before a couple sections ago. I can subtract the cosine off to get 2 sine of 2x times the cosine of x minus the cosine of x equals 0. And once it's equal to 0, I can factor out the common factor. So I know cosine of x is equal times 2 sine of 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. And that tells me that either the cosine of x is equal to 0 or the sine of 2x equals 1 half. Um, let's solve this one just on 0 to 2 pi. We'll just do one revolution this time. But we are ready to go to our unit circle then. Cosine of x is 0. Well, cosine is the x coordinate, which is 0 at the top and the bottom pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So those are our solutions to the first part. Sine of 2x, sine is the y-coordinate. A y-coordinate of 1 half, it's positive. That's a short y-coordinate on both sides, which is going to happen at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. But remember, we've got that 2x. So we need to go around the circle twice. So 12 is around the circle, plus one more is also going to be 13 pi over 6. Or 12 pi over 6 plus 5 is 17 pi over 6. And so that tells me that 2x is equal to pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 13 pi over 6, and 17 pi over 6. And so to get our other set of solutions, we just need to divide by 2, which gives us pi over 12, 5 pi over 12, 13 pi over 12, and 17 pi over 12. And now we've got our six solutions for x in this original problem. All of it was made possible because we have a formula that can change a sum to a product. And so we're often looking to see what property can I use to make this problem easier to solve and easier to work with. The third thing we wanted to do with our properties, though, is these properties can help us prove more identities. And it's important as we prove identities, we remember to only use one side, right? Usually take the complicated side and try to simplify it so it looks like the uncomplicated side. So if I've got the cosine of 4t minus the cosine of 2t over the sine of 4t plus the sine of 2t equals negative tangent of t. We might notice then on the top, cosine minus cosine, that's a difference that can be written as a product. As a product, cosine minus cosine is negative 2 sine of the sum 4t plus 2t over 2 times the sine of the difference, 
4t minus 2t over 2 divided by, now we have sine plus sine. That's 2 times the sine of the sum, 4t plus 2t over 2, times the cosine of the difference, 4t minus 2t over 2. And then we can look at simplifying what that turns into. Notice 2 over 2 is the same. Those can divide out to 1. Also, that first sign is exactly the same on top and bottom. So that first sign can divide out to 1. Don't lose the negative out front. And we've got negative sine of 4 minus 2 is 2t. Divided by 2 is t. Divided by cosine of the same thing. And all of a sudden, we find this sine over cosine reduces to tangent of t, which was what we wanted, QED. We have proved that identity. Let's do one more identity before we wrap up here. Let's do the cosine of a plus b over the cosine of a times the cosine of b equals 1 minus the tangent of a times the tangent of b. This one might take a little bit of wiggling on the left side. On top, you see we've got the cosine of a sum. We know how to break that up. That's cosine, cosine minus sine, sine. So we have the cosine of a, cosine of b, minus the sine of a, sine of b, all over the cosine of a times the cosine of b. Well, with division, I can distribute that division onto both halves. So I'm going to write that as the cosine of a, cosine of b, over the cosine of a, cosine of b. Notice both parts go to both halves. Sine of a, sine of b, over the cosine of a, cosine of b. And when I do that, the first fraction reduces out to just 1 minus the second fraction. Notice we've got sine over cosine, which is tangent of a. And the second fraction is sine over cosine, which is the tangent of b. And we have finished our proof matching the other side. QED, or if you prefer that little box, which was what we wanted, we have proved the identity. So as we continue to get comfortable with these identities, we're doing three things with them today. The first thing we're doing is we're writing that sine plus cosine or cosine plus sine as a single sine, makes solving and simplifying easier. The second thing we do is we use the identities to help us solve equations. And third, we can use these identities to prove new identities. Take a look at practicing some of these. Practice is what makes you comfortable with them, learning how to recognize when to use which one. And let me know if you have any questions. There are three more sets of important identities that we have not seen yet. And we're going to look at deriving those today as we answer the same question, really. What are some more identities? Specifically, what are some more important identities? And again, these are not going to be identities that I expect you to memorize in this course, but they are important enough that you should know of them and when to use them when they come up. The first set of identities are called the double angle identities. And the idea of the double angle identity is we want to figure out how we can simplify the sine of 2 alpha. 
because sometimes we can't simplify that what's in the sign, but we can simplify half of it. So what we're going to do to get there is we're going to use the fact that the sine of 2 alpha is the same as sine of alpha plus alpha. And we have a formula for that sum of sines. We know that's equal to the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle plus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. It just so happens that those are all the same this time. And now you notice we have a like term. So what we can do now is we can say that the sine of 2 alpha is equal to 2 times the sine of alpha times the cosine of alpha. And that becomes our first double angle identity. The second one's really similar, as you would expect. It's the cosine of two alphas. And a cosine of two alpha is the same as cosine of alpha plus alpha. And then we can use our sum formula. And we know the cosine of a sum is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. Well, we can combine together cosine cosine is cosine squared and sine sine is sine squared. And so we end up with the cosine of 2 alpha is equal to the cosine squared of alpha minus the sine squared of alpha. And we get our double cosine angle formula. Now, since we see sine squared and cosine squared in that formula, that might beg the question, what about the fact that sine squared of alpha plus cosine squared of alpha is equal to 1? Well, if I solve this for sine squared of alpha, I end up getting that sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared of alpha. So if I replace the sine squared, let's call this a, if I replace the sine squared with this identity, we get the cosine of 2 alpha is the cosine squared of alpha minus 1 minus cosine squared of alpha. And if I distribute that 1 through, we get cosine squared of alpha minus 1 plus cosine squared of alpha, which means if I combine the like terms, we end up with 2 cosine squared of alpha minus 1 as another way to write the same thing, the cosine of 2 alpha. So we kind of end up with a corollary or related theorem that the cosine of 2 alpha is cosine squared minus sine squared, but it's also 2 cosine squared minus 1. Of course, why stop there? I could have solved sine squared alpha plus cosine squared alpha equals 1. Last time we solved for sine squared, I can also solve it for cosine squared, making it 1 minus sine squared. And then in the original formula up above, I would now have the cosine of 2 alpha is equal to, instead of cosine, 1 minus sine squared alpha minus another sine squared. And when I combine like terms this time, we get kind of a third form of the cosine of 2 alpha is 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha. And so there's actually three different versions that you might see of the cosine of 2 alpha. And you should be able to use any of those three depending on the situation and what's best for what we're doing. So those are our double angle formulas. The next set of formulas are probably the most important when you get to calculus. And that is the power reduction formulas. We know already, we just proved, that the cosine of 2 alpha is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of alpha.
what we're going to do is we're going to solve this formula for sine squared so we have a way to get rid of the square and just have cosines. Well, we'll do that by first subtracting 1 from both sides. Then we divide everything by negative 2 on both sides. When we do that, and I'm going to switch the order, we say that sine squared of alpha is equal to, when we divide by the negative, it's going to change all the signs. So I'm going to put the 1 first. 1 minus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2. And in this class, we're going to use the formula like this. Sine squared is 1 minus cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2. However, when you get to calculus, you'll have another way that you'll write sine squared of alpha. And that is you'll distribute the divide by 2 through. So you have 1 half minus 1 half cosine of 2 alpha. So in calculus, you'll use this version on the right, because that version on the right is very easy to find what's called the antiderivative or to integrate. The one on the left takes a little more work. So when you get to calculus and your instructor asks you what's that sine squared formula, this is what she or he wants. So don't forget that one. That one's going to be really important. And in Calc 2, you will probably memorize that one. This was for the sine squared, but cosine of 2 alpha also has a cosine squared version. We just said cosine of 2 alpha was 2 cosine squared of alpha minus 1. And we can do the same thing and solve for cosine squared to give us a very similar formula. We can start by adding 1 to both sides so that the cosine of 2 alpha plus 1, I'm going to put the 1 plus on the left, equals 2 cosine squared of alpha. And then divide both sides by 2, like we did up above. And that's going to give us, switching the order again, cosine squared of alpha is equal to 1 plus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2. And again, this is the version that we're going to use in this class. But when you take calculus, you're going to find distributing the divide by 2 or multiply by 1 half works better to distribute that through. Cosine squared of alpha is 1 half plus 1 half cosine of 2 alpha. And again, this right version is going to be really nice in your calculus class. But for now, we'll use the one on the left. Just make sure when your calc teacher refers to it, you're familiar with the one on the right. All right, there's one other set of identities that I want you to be familiar with, and that is called the half angle identities. And the half angle identities say, let's start with these squared formulas, these power reduction formulas that we just derived. Let's start with cosine squared of alpha, which we know is equal to 1 plus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2. And we're going to make a substitution and let alpha equal beta over 2. When we do that, we'll get the cosine squared of beta over 2 is equal to 1 plus the cosine of 2 alphas, which gives us 2 beta over 2. So the 2's reduce out, giving us just the beta over 2. And then if I take the square root of both sides, what we end up with is the cosine of half an angle which makes it the half angle formula. The cosine of beta over 2 is equal to plus or minus, because we took the square root of both sides, the square root of 1 plus the cosine of beta over 2. And that formula is going to be our half angle identity for the cosine, cosine of a half angle. 
We can do something very similar, though, with the sine squared formula. We know sine squared of alpha is equal to 1 minus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by 2. And again, we're going to do much the same thing. We're going to say let alpha equal beta over 2, and almost the same thing is going to arise out of this. We end up with sine squared of beta over 2 equals 1 minus the cosine of beta over 2 times 2 is just beta divided by 2. And now we can take the square root of both sides, leaving us with the sine of the half angle beta over 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus the cosine of beta over 2. And that is our final half angle identity. So we talked about three sets of identities in this video today. First was the double angle identities. If we've got a double angle in sine or cosine, there's three versions of the cosine, actually. We talked about power reduction, how to take sine squared or cosine squared and write them without the squared. And we talked about half angles, which t tell us how to take an angle divided by 2 and actually calculate what its value is. In our next video, we're going to take a look at how we can use these new identities to actually solve problems, equations, and proofs. We'll see you in the next video. Now that we've found a few more identities, we need to know how we can use these identities. So the question again is, how can we use double angle? power reduction, and half angle. Identities. And so we're going to take each of these one at a time and take a look at some ways we can use them to help us solve or simplify various expressions, starting with the double angle formulas. And those identities that we found were that the sine of some doubled angle, we'll call it 2 alpha, is equal to 2 sine of alpha, cosine of alpha. The other one is that the cosine of 2 alpha is equal to cosine squared alpha minus sine squared alpha. But we also found out using the Pythagorean identities that could be rewritten as 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha or as 2 cosine squared alpha minus 1. So this is really two identities. One of them just can be written three different ways with the Pythagorean identity. And so we're going to take a look at how we can use those to help us maybe look at if the sine of theta is equal to 4 fifths. And we're going to say that our angle theta is in quadrant 2. And then what we're going to attempt to find is not theta. Instead, what we're going to find is the cosine of 2 theta. As we attempt to find cosine of 2 theta, we've actually got three options for cosine that we can use. Cosine squared minus sine squared, 1 minus 2 sine squared, or 2 cosine squared minus 1. But what we know is only about the sine. So we're going to use the one that only uses sine, 1 minus 2 sine squared of theta. And then we'll plug in the given information that sine is 4 fifths, 1 minus 2 times 4 fifths squared. And that gives me 
using order of operations to simplify, 1 minus 2 times 16 over 25, or 1 minus 32 over 25. 1 is 25 over 25. So 25 minus 32 gives me negative 7 over 25. And so I now know that the cosine of 2 theta is negative 7 over 25. We could also find the sine of 2 theta. Now, the sine of 2 theta has one formula. It's 2 sine theta cosine theta. The problem is we don't know what cosine is. We only know what sine is. So this is where we go over to the side and we say what we do know is that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. And if sine is 4 fifths squared plus cosine squared equals 1, that gives me 16 over 25 plus cosine squared equals 1. Subtract 16 over 25. Remember, 1 is 25 over 25. Minus 16 is 9 over 25. And then when I take the square root of both sides, we find the cosine of theta is plus or minus 3 fifths, taking the square root. How do we decide if it's plus or minus? Well, that's where the little information at the end becomes helpful. We're in quadrant 2. Quadrant 2 is over here in the top left. Cosine is plus or minus 3 fifths. Cosine is the x-coordinate, and here the x is negative and the y is positive, which means we're actually going to use the negative 3 fifths, because in quadrant 2, cosine is negative. So now when I substitute, we have 2 times the sine, which is 4 fifths, times the cosine, which is negative 3 fifths. From there, we just have to simplify. Multiplying across the top, 2 times 4 times negative 3 is negative 24. 5 times 5 is 25. And we now know the sine of 2 theta is negative 24 over 25. So the identities can really help us actually find angles that we don't know using those formulas. But in addition to finding values we don't know, we can also look at simplifying expressions. Let's say we want to know what 1 minus 2 times the sine squared of 18 degrees is. Well, you'll notice that that is the double angle formula. That's set up as the cosine of double the angle, or in our case, the cosine of 2 times the 18 degree angle, or simply the cosine of 36 degrees, and it's completely simplified. So sometimes we'll have an expression that we can simplify. If we wanted to prove something, though, let's do a proof. How about cosine of 2t divided by the cosine of t minus the sine of t. And we're going to say that's equal to the cosine of t plus the sine of t. And the ugly side looks like it's the left side. So we're going to see what we can do with the left side. Well, cosine of 2t has three options. So what we're going to do is match the style of the rest of the problem. And since the rest of the problem has both sines and cosines in it, we're going to use the version that has both sines and cosines in it. So in our case, that's going to be the cosine squared theta minus sine squared of theta over the denominator is still, oops, we're not doing thetas. Actually, we're doing t's. Cosine squared t minus sine squared of t over the cosine of t minus the sine of t. And what's nice about that numerator is we notice that numerator is a difference of squares. It's cosine t plus sine t times cosine t minus sine t, 
over our denominator of cosine t minus sine t, which is really nice because it's factored. We can reduce, and we're left with just the cosine of t plus the sine of t, which was what we wanted. We have proved our identity. It matches. We'll also use these formulas from time to time to help us solve equations. Let's say if we've got the cosine of 2t is equal to the cosine of t. And let's just solve it on 0 to 2 pi. Well, again, cosine of 2t has three options. So we'll match the style of the rest of the problem. The rest of the problem only has cosine. So we're going to use the one that has just cosine. 2 cosine squared t minus 1 equals cosine of t. And we've solved problems like this before. We just have to make it equal to 0 by subtracting the cosine of t from both sides. Then we can factor. 2 cosine t times cosine t gives us 2 cosine squared. 1 times 1 gives us the negative 1. And we place our signs to make sure they're right. And we can see that the cosine of t is negative 1 half, or that the cosine of t is 1. And we know we can solve that real quick off our unit circle. Cosine is negative 1 half. Those are the short distances backwards because it's negative, up and down. That's going to be pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. Cosine is 1 over here. Oops, that's not 1 pi over 3. That's 2 pi over 3. 1 pi over 3 would be in the right quadrant. The other point that we need is a positive 1. That happens over here at 0. And so we have three solutions. t is equal to 0, 2 pi over 3, and 4 pi over 3. So we can see there's lots of ways we can use these identities. Let's kind of do a similar look at working with the power reduction identities. First, what are those identities? There were two of them. There was cosine squared, which is equal to 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta over 2. And they were sine squared, which is equal to 1 minus the cosine of 2 theta over 2. And if you remember when we proved these, I said both of these are going to be important to know for calculus. specifically calc 2. They're going to allow us to do what's called integrate cosine squared and sine squared. But right now, we're just going to play with them so we can get kind of comfortable with how we can use them. But these two identities are going to be important to us, cosine squared and sine squared. So let's try, let's just rewrite sine to the fourth power with no exponents. Well, sine to the fourth power, we can rewrite that as sine squared squared. And that way, we've got that sine squared that we can recognize from our formula. Sine squared is 1 minus cosine of 2 theta over 2. And then that whole thing is squared. And from here, it just becomes an exercise in algebra to clean up and simplify that. Uh, let's go down here below. Squaring the numerator gives us 1 minus 2 cosine of 2 theta plus cosine squared 
of 2 theta all over 4. The problem is we still have a cosine squared, and the rule was no exponents. So we'll use the cosine squared formula. But first, let's uh, divide everything by 4. I think that's going to make it easier to work with. We're going to have 1 fourth minus 2 fourths, which reduces to 1 half, cosine of 2 theta plus 1 fourth times the cosine squared of 2 theta. And that cosine squared is what we're going to play with. So we've got 1 fourth minus 1 half cosine of 2 theta plus 1 fourth times. And then we're going to use the cosine squared formula. The cosine squared formula says 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta. We have to double the angle. Right now, the angle is 2 theta. When we double it, we get 4 theta all over 2. And I'm going to divide both parts by 2. And I'm also going to distribute the 1 fourth through, if I can do all that at the same time. So we have 1 fourth minus 1 half cosine of 2 theta plus 1 half times 1 fourth is 1 eighth plus 1 fourth times 1 half is, again, 1 eighth. And then we've got the cosine of 4 theta. We actually have a like term in there. 1 fourth plus 1 eighth is 3 eighths. So I'm going to say 3 eighths minus 1 half cosine of 2 theta plus 1 eighth cosine of 4 theta. And what we end up with is an expression that's equal to sine to the fourth but it has no exponents. It's called a power reduction rule because we reduced the exponents and got rid of them. The other type of uh, identity that we saw or that we derived was the half angle identities. And these allow us to look at the sine or the cosine of half of an angle. We can do the cosine of theta over 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 plus cosine of theta over 2. Or we can do the sine of theta over 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cosine of theta over 2. These are the last two identities we need to know, at least be familiar with. Let's do a couple examples where we work with these. Let's evaluate a few expressions. Let's try first evaluating the cosine of 3 pi over 8. Notice 3 pi over 8 is not one of our key angles. But you might notice that cosine of 3 pi over 8 is half of 3 pi over 4. So we can use our cosine formula and say that's equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 plus the cosine of the half angle, 3 pi over 4 all over 2. We should be able to evaluate this from here without much difficulty using our unit circle. 3 pi over 4 we know is 1, 2, 3 pi over 4 over here to the left. Right in the middle, though, we know it's negative root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. So when we plug this in, we get plus or minus the square root of 1 plus Cosines the x-coordinate of that 3 pi over 4, which is negative root 2 over 2, all over 2. And then we can simplify clearing out that divide by 2 by multiplying top and bottom by 2. That'll divide those out. 
And so we get plus or minus the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 all over 2 times 2 is 4. But now we have to decide, is this a plus or minus? And we decide if it's a plus or minus by looking at the original angle. The original angle was 3 pi over 8. Where would that original angle be? Well, I know the middle is pi over 2, which is 4 pi over 8. So 3 pi over 8 is even less than that. So I know I'm over here in quadrant 1 where the x-coordinate is positive and the y-coordinate is positive. Cosine takes the x-coordinate, which is positive. So I need to only take the positive for my final answer, square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 all over 4. And this becomes my final answer. Let's also use the sine formula, though. And let's find the sine of 3 pi over 8. Well, just like before, that's going to be the sine of 1 half times 3 pi over 4. And then we'll use our half angle sine formula, which is plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cosine of 3 pi over 4 all over 2. I can use the same unit circle that I drew in red uh, right underneath the number 2 there and write that as plus or minus the square root of 1 minus. Cosine, the x-coordinate, is negative root 2 over 2, all over 2. Again, I'll simplify by multiplying top and bottom all the way through by 2, which will reduce the 2s. I also have a double negative, which will make it a positive. So I end up with plus or minus the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, all over 4. And then again, I have to decide, is it going to be the plus or minus? We're doing a sine of 3 pi over 8. Using the same brown circle just to the left here, I see the sine is positive there in the first quadrant where this angle falls. So we end up with the positive again, 2 plus the square root of 2 over 4. And this becomes our sine of 3 pi over 8. This video is taking a look at three of our identities, the half angle identities, the power reduction identities, and the double angle identities. These identities are important to help us simplify, solve, evaluate, and prove trig properties. Take a look at practicing these on the homework. Let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've taken a look at lots of trig properties, trig identities, solving equations, proving identities, we're going to summarize everything we've seen in two videos, one that focuses on equations and another one that will focus on proofs. So the question that we're going to hit in kind of a big general review is how do we solve trig equations? And the big thing with solving the trig equations is we have to know our unit circle. Maybe not be able to rattle off all the values, but at least be able to derive all of the values. So if I were to draw my unit circle here, I should be able to quickly identify where all the key angles are on the unit circle. We know 0 is on the far right. 2 pi is all the way around. Halfway around then is 1 pi. And you should also know that vertical is half of pi or pi over 2, which means the bottom one is going to be the 3 pi over 2. Should also be able to identify all the pi over 6s. There's going to be a pi over 6 just above and just below each of the horizontals. We've got 1 pi over 6 just above. Just below is just below 2 pi, or 12 pi, which means 1 less would be 11 pi over 6. All the way to the right is pi, which would be 6 pi over 6. So just above would be 5 pi over 6. 
and just below would be 7 pi over 6. So we should know where the pi over 6's are. We should also know where the pi over 3's are. Those are going to be just off from vertical. So we've got 1 pi over 3 and 2 pi's over 3. Near the bottom, the 3 pi over 3 is to the left. So the next one would be 4 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Those are the over 3's. We should also know the quarters that are going to cut through here. All the even quarters are already labeled in green. The odd quarters then are 1 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. You should know where all of those key angles are. Once I've got my key angles, now I also need to know the x and y coordinates of all the key angles. Now, the green ones here are probably the easiest. All the way to the right is 1, 0. Vertically, that's going to be 0, 1. To the left is negative 1, 0. And down at the bottom is going to be uh, 0, negative 1. The brown ones, the over 4s, are probably the next easiest because it's right in the middle. x and y are going to be the same. We know it's root 2 over 2. And we just have to decide if it's positive or negative depending on which quadrant we're in. So pi over 4 in the first quadrant is root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. In the second quadrant, the x is negative. So at 3 pi over 4, we have negative root 2 over 2, comma positive root 2 over 2. In the third quadrant, 5 pi over 4, they're both negative. So negative root 2 over 2, comma, negative root 2 over 2. And in the fourth quadrant, this time only the y is negative because it's right and down. So we have positive root 2 over 2, comma, negative root 2 over 2. Now on the pi over 6 and the pi over 3, we have to decide if we have a long distance or a short distance. The longer distance will always be root 3 over 2. The shorter distance, root 1, or just 1, over 2. So with pi over 6, we're doing a long x and a short y. So it's root 3 over 2 for x and a short 1 half for y. When we do the pi over 3, though, now the x distance is short, 1 half, and the y distance is longer, root 3 over 2. 2 pi over 3 is in the second quadrant, which means the x is negative. It's still a short x, negative 1 half, and a long y, root 3 over 2. When we look at 5 pi over 6, the x coordinate is still negative. But it's a long negative and a short y. So negative root 3 over 2 comma the short 1 half. 7 pi over 6 being in the third quadrant, both are going to be negative. We see the x is long, so it's root 3 over 2. The y is short, 1 half. With 4 pi over 3, both negative still. But this time, the x is short at 1 half. And the y is long, root 3 over 2. 5 pi over 3. Now we are in the fourth quadrant. So the x is short, but a positive 1 half. And the y is long, negative root 3 over 2. And finally, the 11 pi over 6, the y coordinate is going to be negative again. The x is long, root 3 over 2. The y is short, 1 half. And so we have all the coordinates and all of our key angles. You should be very comfortable with this unit circle by now. And if you are, it's going to make solving equations much easier. So let's see if we can do that. Let's do some examples where we solve. And let's solve all of these on a domain of 0 to 2 pi. So we're not going to do the plus 2 pi k stuff. So let's try a few of these. Let's do 2 sine squared theta minus 5 sine of theta plus 3 equals 0. Well, we know with sine squared, we're just like with x squared, we're probably going to factor and set each factor equal to 0. So let's see how this factors. 
2 sine theta times sine theta will give us the 2 sine squared. And if I put the 3 on the right and the 1 on the left, making the 3 negative and the 1 positive, that'll give us negative 5 in the middle. So I can see from that that the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half, or the sine of theta is equal to 3. Or if we remember with the unit circle, sine goes from 0 to, well, negative 1 to positive 1. So sine will never equal 3. So we actually only have one possibility. We want to know when the sine of theta equals negative 1 half. Sine's the y-coordinate. We want the y-coordinate to be negative. 1 half is short, so we want the short y-coordinates in the negative direction. And I should be able to recognize that those are at 11 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. So theta is equal to 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. And we have our solutions. Let's try another example. Let's do the cosine of 2 theta plus 5 times the cosine of theta plus 3 equals 0. We should recognize cosine of 2 theta. We can break that up using our uh, identity. Cosine of 2 theta has three options. It's cosine squared minus sine squared. Or we have one also that has a sine squared and one that has a cosine squared. What I notice is since the rest of the problem has cosine in it, let's do the one that only has cosine squared, which is 2 cosine squared theta minus 1 is equal to cosine of 2 theta. Now I still have plus 5 cosine theta plus 3 equals 0. And I'm going to actually combine the like terms of the 3 and the minus 1. That'll give me 2 cosine squared theta plus 5 cosine of theta plus 2 equals 0. Now that everything is just cosines, now I can try and factor. 2 cosine squared is cosine times 2 cosine. 1 times 2 will give us the 2 at the end, everything positive. So when I put that together, I get the cosine of theta is equal to negative 1 half, or the cosine of theta is equal to negative 2. But I do remember cosine can never be more than negative 1 and 1. That's why it's called the unit circle. Only goes between 1 and negative 1. So I just need to decide when cosine is negative 1 half. And so I think about my unit circle. Cosine is the x coordinate. And I want a short x coordinate going backwards 1 half. That's going to be the one that goes up and down to the left. Coming off the vertical, those are the over 3's. That's 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So theta must be equal to 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. Let's try another problem. Let's try one with cosecant. Let's do cosecant of theta equals cotangent of theta plus 1. Now with cosecant and cotangent, we're probably not as familiar with the unit circle and those values. So let's change these problems using our identities into all sines and cosines. Cosecant is 1 over sine of theta. Cotangent theta is cosine theta over sine theta plus 1. Now we can clear the denominator out here by multiplying everything by sine theta all the way across. And when we do, we get 1 equals cosine theta plus sine theta. Well, cosine plus sine 
we have a way to change cosine plus sine into a single sine. Actually, we like to write it as sine theta plus cosine theta. And we like to have numbers in front, so we'll put 1 and 1 in front of both of them. And we know that a squared is equal to the m squared plus the n squared. 1 squared plus 1 squared equals 2. So a is equal to the square root of 2. We also know that the cosine of our c was equal to the coefficient of sine divided by a, which is the square root of 2. And we know that the sine of c was the n divided by a square root of 2. Well, if I rationalize these by multiplying by root 2 over 2, we get very familiar looking angles. The cosine of c is root 2 over 2. And the sine of c is root 2 over 2. So what angle does that give us? Both positive, root 2 over 2. We should recognize that's pi over 4. So the angle c is pi over 4, which means we can now rewrite this as 1 equals a single sign. a, which is the square root of 2, times the sine of my angle plus c, which is pi over 4. And by writing sine plus cosine as a single sine, I've now simplified this down to something I can solve. Dividing by the square root of 2, we get 1 over root 2 equals the sine of theta plus pi over 4. Again, we should recognize we can rationalize that to be root 2 over 2. Sine is root 2 over 2 at two places. We want a y coordinate of root 2 over 2. We want a positive y coordinate. So we should see that at pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. So the stuff inside, theta plus pi over 4 is equal to those two angles pi over 4 or 3 pi over 4. And if we subtract the pi over 4 from both sides, both options, we end up with theta is equal to 0 or 2 pi over 4, which reduces to pi over 2. But be very careful coming back. Cosecant and cotangent are reciprocal functions. They have put a sign in the denominator. We've got a domain restriction here that that sine of theta cannot be equal to 0, because that would put 0 in the denominator. And where does the sine of theta equal 0? At 0 or at pi. So theta cannot be equal to 0 or pi, which means we actually have to throw out the 0. If theta is equal to 0, the whole thing is undefined. And the only angle that works is our pi over 2 angle. So that's how we can solve using our property to make everything into a single sign. We actually did several things in that problem. First, we changed everything to sines and cosines. Then we said sine plus cosine can be rewritten as a single sine. And then we solved the resulting equation. So we've got lots of strategies that we can try and pull together now to try and solve. Let's try another one. How about 4 times 1 plus the sine of theta equals cosine squared of theta? Here, I see we've got a cosine squared hanging out with sines, and that's not really convenient. And so we're going to see if we can break that up and make everything match, make everything into sines. Well, cosine squared you should recognize from sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And so if I subtract the sine squared from both sides, cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared. 
So making that substitution, I'm going to go ahead and distribute the 4 also while I'm at this. We get 4 plus 4 sine of theta is equal to 1 minus the sine squared of theta. And since we have sine squareds and sines, we're going to set it equal to 0 and factor. Adding sine squared to both sides gives us sine squared of theta plus 4 sine of theta. Subtracting 1 gives us plus 3 equals 0. And now we factor. Sine squared is sine times sine. 3 is 3 times 1. Everything's positive. And so I can see that the sine of theta is equal to negative 3 or negative 1. Of course, sine is never bigger than negative 1 or positive 1. So the negative 1 is the only one that counts. And I just have to think, where is sine? Where is the y-coordinate negative 1? That's at 3 pi over 2. So theta is 3 pi over 2. Let's try one last problem. Let's do the sine of 2 theta plus the sine of 4 theta equals 0. We have a couple choices here. We know we can take sine of 2 theta and write it um, using the double angle formula. But I also notice that sine of 2 theta is added to the sine of 4 theta. We're adding two sines together. So let's rewrite this instead. We're using the sum to product formula. The sum to product formula says that it's going to be equal to 2 times the sine of the sum divided by 2 times the cosine of the difference divided by 2, still equal to 0. And if we simplify that, we get the sine of 6 theta over 2, which is 3 theta times the cosine of negative 2 theta over 2, which is negative theta equals 0. And what's nice about the cosine of negative theta, that's the same as the cosine of positive theta. Positive and negative angles have the same cosine, opposite signs. And it's really nice because everything's already factored for us. So we can set each factor equal to 0. The sine of 3 theta equals 0, and the cosine of theta equals 0. Now, because we have the sine of 3 theta in there, that 3 means as we're working with the sine, we need to go around the circle three times. So our 3 theta then is equal to sine the y-coordinate is 0 at 0, pi, second lap, 2 pi, 3 pi, third lap, 4 pi, 5 pi, going around the circle three times. So we have 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, and 5 pi. Dividing all of them by 3, then, will give us our first set of answers. That theta is equal to 0, pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3 reduces to just pi, 4 pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. Now, from the cosine equaling 0, cosine is the x-coordinate. The x-coordinate is 0 at the top, pi over 2, and the bottom, 3 pi over 2. So let's add those two solutions to our list, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And because it's just a regular theta, we don't have to do any dividing or extra laps around the circle. All of these angles then will give us a true statement for the sine of 2 theta plus the sine of 4 theta equaling 0. So as you can see, we've done a lot of trig properties, identities that we have to remember, know how to use, be able to recognize. Sometimes we're using multiple properties in one problem in order to solve. All of the problems, though, are going to require you to know your unit circle. So there are a bunch of problems like this in the textbook to practice with.
practice as many of them as you can to get comfortable with solving trig equations. And then let me know if you have any questions. As we begin to look at bringing together all of the identities from trig, all the properties, all the key points, all the relationships, we're taking a look at how they can help us with solving trig equations and doing trig proofs. In the previous video, we looked at how the concepts all come together to help us solve equations. In this video, we're going to take a look at how all the properties and identities and relationships come together to help us with finding trig proofs. The question we're going to answer today is how do we prove a trig identity? And we're going to do that by working through a few examples. Nothing really new here, just bringing together several concepts in one big video. As we solve these trig identities or prove these trig identities, the key is that we must always work on one side. We can't do things to both sides of the equation. We can't simplify one side a bit and simplify the other side a bit. We have to always work on one side to try and end up with the other side. So for example, if we have 1 minus the sine of theta over the cosine of theta is equal to the cosine of theta over 1 plus the sine of theta. We're going to attempt to prove this statement. And this one's kind of tricky because they both look just about as simple left and right sides. So we could pick either side to work with. And one additional strategy that we can use to help us with an identity or even solving on occasion, we're going to steal from what we saw back in pre-calc 1 with rationalizing numerators and denominators. And that was multiplying by a conjugate. 1 minus sine has a conjugate of 1 plus sine. And when I multiply by that conjugate of 1 plus sine on top and bottom, let's look at what that gives us. When we multiply by a conjugate, we'll end up with 1 minus sine squared of theta over cosine theta times 1 plus sine theta. Now that becomes interesting because this numerator, 1 minus sine squared, you should recognize from the Pythagorean identity that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. And if I subtract the sine squared from both sides, we see cosine squared is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta. So that numerator, 1 minus sine squared, is the same as cosine squared theta over the denominator of cosine theta times 1 plus sine theta. And that's really nice, because now it's factored. And I have cosines on top and bottom. We can cross out one cosine from both the numerator and denominator. And that leaves us with cosine theta over 1 plus sine theta, which was what we wanted, w to the fifth, from the original problem. We have proved this identity using that Pythagorean identity and a nice little trick from pre-calc 1 of multiplying by a conjugate. Let's try another one. Let's try cosine squared theta plus cotangent of theta over cosine squared theta minus cotangent of theta is equal to cosine squared of theta tangent of theta plus 1 over cosine squared theta tangent of theta minus 1. As we look at uh, solving this, I would compare and notice both sides have cosine squared. But what we don't have is the tangent on the first term, top and bottom. So what would happen if I multiplied by tangent theta on top and bottom 
and distribute that tangent through. If I do that, I get cosine squared theta times tangent of theta plus, then we have tangent times cotangent. And I remember that tangent times cotangent, those are reciprocals of each other. Tangent theta times cotangent becomes tangent times 1 over the tangent. Those divide out, leaving just 1. Same thing in the denominator. We have cosine squared theta tangent theta minus tangent times cotangent being reciprocals is 1. And right away, we have gotten to the original thing, QED, another way to end a proof. We have demonstrated what we wanted. They are the same. We used one side to end up with the other side. How about this one? Let's do tangent of theta plus the sine of theta over 2 tangent of theta is equal to cosine squared of theta over 2. We have a formula, if I use the right side this time, of cosine of theta over 2. That is plus or minus the square root of cosine theta plus 1 over 2. But because the whole thing is squared, we're going to square the whole thing. And that's really nice because we square a square root, and we end up with the guts on the inside. And whether it's positive or negative, when we square it, we end up with a positive. And now it's just the cosine of theta plus 1 all over 2. Well, we want tangents. How do we get tangents? One thing I think about tangents is tangents is sine theta over cosine theta. What happens if we multiply by sine theta over cosine theta in both the numerator and the denominator? When we distribute through, the cosine will divide out, leaving just behind the sine of theta, plus 1 times sine over cosine is sine over cosine which reduces to just tangent, all over 2 times sine over cosine, which is just tangent. And notice we started with the right side and did some manipulation and ended up with the left side. We can use a solid box to finish our proof. We have proved that these two are, in fact, equal. So that one uses our half angle formula in order to prove the relationship. What about 1 minus the cosine of 2 theta times secant squared theta? That's equal to tangent squared theta. Well, let's see what we can do with our trig properties to simplify the left side. There's more to work with over there. Cosine 2 theta, we can do something with that. We've got a couple options with cosine of 2 theta. Let's go with 2 cosine squared minus 1. And the reason I'm picking the cosine 1 is secant deals with cosine as well. In fact, let's go ahead and make that into cosines. Secant squared is 1 over cosine squared theta. And if we were to distribute, uh, let's distribute first the 1 over cosine squared through. That gives us 1 minus 2. The cosine squareds divide out minus 1 times 1 over cosine squared is 1 over cosine squared. But 1 over cosine squared is secant squared of theta. Now if I distribute the negative through, we get 1 minus 2 plus secant squared of theta. 
which if we combine like terms becomes secant squared theta minus 1, which is really nice because you should recognize secant squared minus 1. It comes from one of our Pythagorean identities. Remember, if sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1, secant squared means we're dividing by cosine squared. And if I divide everything by cosine squared, that gave me tangent squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta which told me that tangent squared is secant squared minus 1, which is what we have. So secant squared minus 1 equals tangent squared. And I'll use another solid box on this one. Our proof is complete. We got the right side of the equation. So this one used a couple formulas in order to help us finish the proof. There were reciprocal identities in there. There was the double angle identity. There was the Pythagorean identity. We had to use several of them to get there. But they all can come together in one proof in this way. Let's do one more as we wrap up our video. Let's do the sine of 3 theta over the sine of theta minus the cosine of 3 theta over the cosine of theta. And this one's interesting because it actually equals 2. Let's take a look at how that could be possible. Clearly, the left side is the more complicated side. That's the side we're going to work with. And one thing I see is we're doing subtracting of two fractions. So let's try and get a common denominator of these two fractions by multiplying by cosine on the first fraction and sine on the second fraction. And when we do, we'll end up with the sine of 3 theta times the cosine of theta minus the cosine of 3 theta times the sine of theta all over our common denominator of sine theta cosine theta. Now, what you might notice is this is a formula that we've seen before. It's the sine of alpha plus beta formula. That is equal to the sine of 3 theta Actually, with the minus in there, it's minus theta all over sine theta cosine theta using that sum and difference formula. And when I simplify there, that's going to give me the sine of 2 theta over sine theta cosine theta. And be careful, we cannot cross off the sines because they're not of the same angle. But we do have a formula for a double angle on sine. Sine of 2 theta is 2 sine of theta cosine of theta over sine theta cosine theta, which then becomes really nice because now they are the same. The sines and cosines divide out, and we're left with 2, which is what the other side of the equation is. We can wrap this proof up with QED. And we have proved the two sides are equal. With these proofs, the best way to get good at them is to struggle through several of them. The more you do, the quicker you'll recognize the patterns and what you're looking for. So take the time to struggle through the homework assignment. Try as many of them as you can. Practice, practice, practice. And let me know if you have any questions. Good luck. Now that we've kind of mastered all the content we need to master for trigonometry, we're going to move into a slightly different topic as we prepare our transition off to calculus from this course of pre-calc 2. The question we're going to take a look at is how can we use trig to graph functions? 
And the answer to that question is we're going to use something that is called polar coordinates. And with polar coordinates, it's going to be a little different than the way we used to do points. Um, what we've done so far is what are called Cartesian. Cartesian. That might be spelled wrong. But Cartesian coordinates had an x and a y. We've seen those before. And the x would tell us how far to move to the right, and the y would tell us how far to move up. And if they were negative, we would just move backwards. Polar coordinates also have two numbers, but this time the first number is going to represent a radius, and the second number is going to represent an angle theta. How this is going to work in polar coordinates, and I erase the uh, Cartesian because I don't want that to throw us off, is we're going to have a center grid like before where we go off 1, 2, 3, 4, to the right, 1, 2, 3, 4, up. And then the negative direction, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4. But instead of thinking about this as a rectangle where you go right and up, now instead these are actually going to be circles of radius 1 and a circle of radius 2 and a circle of radius 3. It's a really bad circle of radius 3, but you get the idea. And a circle of radius 4, and so on. So these are circles going out from the origin. And the only axis that really matters is the axis off to the right that's going to represent 0. And so we could graph a point. Let's graph point A at 1 comma pi over 3. Well, 1 is going to be the radius, so I know it's going to go out to the circle of radius 1. Pi over 3 is the angle. So I could almost put in, you know, we've got a pi over 4. There's the pi over 3 and the pi over 6. And we've got all of our angles on here that we're used to seeing on the unit circle. And so this angle here of pi over 3, we're going to draw a line of radius 1. And that gets us to our point. Point A has a radius of 1 and an angle of pi over 3 that it opens up to. Let's try and graph another point. Let's graph the point B negative 2 comma pi over 4. So we did the first one in blue. Let's do the second one in green. When we do pi over 4, we know pi over 4 is this line in the first quadrant. But this time, the radius is going to be negative. The negative radius then is going to come backwards out of the origin, down the line backwards 2. And then we get the point b backwards 2 from an angle of pi over 4. Let's graph the point c at 3 comma negative pi over 6. And let's graph this one in red. This one's going to have a radius of 3, so it's going to go out to the third circle. But the angle it's going to open up is negative pi over 6. And so negative pi over 6 is backwards pi over 6 on the radius of 3. That's going to be my point C. And so you can see we can have positive angles and positive radiuses, a positive angle and a negative radius, a negative angle and a positive radius. We can even make them both negative and kind of combine both together. Let's graph negative. Let's go negative 4 this time and negative 3 pi over 4. And I'm going to graph this one in purple. Negative 4 means the radius is going to be backwards 4 from an angle of negative 3 pi over 4. So there's 1, 2, negative 3 pi over 4. I shouldn't. Shouldn't actually label that with a dot because that's not my point. But my angle comes around to negative 3 pi over 4. And then from there, my radius is going to come out negative 4 the opposite direction. And point D actually ends up out here. And so that's kind of how polar coordinates work. We're going to open up by an angle, and then we're going to go down a radius. Because in polar coordinates, everything's a circle. 
not a square like the Cartesian that we're used to. Now, there is a relationship between the square and the circle graphing systems. Let's look at how we can convert between rectangular and polar coordinates. And the way we're going to set this up is we're going to think about what we know about a circle. This is only the top right side of the circle. And an angle that gets made on that circle with a radius of theta leads to a point x comma y, where x is the distance to the right, y is the distance up. And then the radius that we keep talking about, that's going to be how far it travels down that angle of theta. Well, if I look at that, we can see if I took the cosine of the angle theta, that would be the adjacent x over the hypotenuse of r, which gives us the conversion multiplying both sides by r. r cosine of theta is equal to x. And that gives us a way to find the equivalent x coordinate from a polar coordinate. Similarly, we can say, well, the sine of theta is equal to y over r, the opposite over the hypotenuse. And multiplying by r tells us that r sine theta is equal to the y coordinate. We could also take the tangent of theta is equal to the ratio of the sides. Tangent would be y over x, the opposite over the adjacent. And the other relationship that we know we can use is the Pythagorean identity that x squared plus y squared will equal r squared. These four relationships can be used in different ways to make conversions between what we're familiar with in the past, rectangular graphing, to what we're working on today, polar graphing. So let's look at what that looks like with the point 5 comma 5 pi over 6 in polar. And we're going to convert to rectangular. So in polar coordinates, since this is polar coordinates, I know 5 is the radius and 5 pi over 6 is the angle. If I want to get kind of a visual of what we're talking about, I can graph that. Um, 5 pi over 6 is back here. And let's say that's a radius of 5. So my point is back here. What's nice that we know, on the unit circle at least, at 5 pi over 6, it's a long distance and a short distance. That's going to help us find the actual x and y coordinates. We know that x is equal to the radius, which is 5, times the cosine of the angle 5 pi over 6. Well, cosine of 5 pi over 6, the x coordinate, that's a long distance. So it's root 3 over 2. And so the x coordinate, oh, it's also backwards, so it's negative. That makes the x coordinate negative 5 root 3 over 2. If I want the y coordinate, y is equal to the radius of 5 times the sine of the angle 5 pi over 6. Well, we know the sine of 5 pi over 6. The y coordinate, it's a short distance up, must be 1 half. So the y coordinate is 5 halves. So my final answer, 5 comma 5 pi over 6 in polar, is exactly in the same place as negative 5 root 3 over 2 comma, oops, I should say 5 halves, comma 5 halves in rectangular. And I might even put a little r on this so I know it's rectangular. And I'll put a p on the other one so I know it's polar. Those two points are exactly the same.
point. Let's do another one, though, where we can go the opposite direction. Let's say we've got negative 3 comma negative 3 root 3 in rectangular, rectangular. And we're going to convert to polar. Get us some room to work here. In rectangular means that's an x comma y. So we need to find the angle, and we need to find the radius. One thing that's going to help me, though, is to draw a picture so I get a visual of where this is. It's negative 3, so it's to the left. Negative 3 root 3, it's down here somewhere. So we would estimate our angle's got to be more than pi. And the radius is, well, we'll figure that out. So what I'd first use is the Pythagorean identity to find the radius. The radius squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, which means the radius squared is equal to, in this case, 9 plus 9 times 3 after I square or 9 plus 27, 36. Take the square root of both sides to find that the radius here actually is equal to 6. So I've got a radius of 6. Then to find the angle, I would use the tangent relationship. The tangent of theta is equal to negative y over x, so negative 3 root 3 over negative 3, which reduces to positive square root of 3. Well, tangent is y over x. And so I might think, OK, uh, with square root of 3, it's either going to be pi over 3 or pi over 6, because I know those are where the root 3 comes from. Uh, pi over 3, that's a 1 half comma root 3 over 2, because it's short to the right, long up. Pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 comma 1 half, because it's long and then up the short distance. Which one gives me a tangent that's the square root of 3? Well, tangent takes y and divides it by x. If I use the pi over 6, that would be 1 divided by the square root of 3, which is not what I have. But if I use the pi over 3, when I do y over x, that's going to be root 3 over 1, which is root 3. So that makes me think we're dealing with an angle of pi over 3, sort of. Notice all this plane I've been doing is in quadrant 1. If you recall from our conversation about tangent, tangent focuses on the right side. And we're not on the right side. We're on the left side. So we have to do a little bit of work to think, OK, if that's pi over 3, what's going to be the similar angle down below? If I can get the right pencil, sorry. That's going to correspond with pi over 3. Well, that's going to be 4 pi over 3, which has coordinates of negative 1 half comma negative root 3 over 2. And when I divide those, I'll get a positive root 3. So my angle theta must be 4 pi over 3. So obviously, knowing our unit circle and relationships is going to be very helpful as we find the correct points. Drawing a picture will help a lot. 6 is the radius, and 4 pi over 3 is the angle. And that is the exact same point in polar as the rectangular point, negative 3 comma negative 3 root 3. We can make these conversions with points, but we can also make these conversions with equations. Let's try an equation real quick. Number four, equations. Let's first do um, equations where we take a polar equation 
and convert it to a rectangular equation. Let's start simple. Let's start with an equation r equals 2. What we're going to try and do to convert this polar equation to a rectangular equation is we're going to try and manipulate it so that it looks like, or at least a piece of it, looks like one of our formulas to convert between polar and rectangular. And while we don't have an r equals equation, we do have an r squared equation in polar. So to make r and r squared, I can square both sides of this equation. And that's going to give me that r squared equals 4. And what's nice is we have a conversion for r squared. r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, which is still equal to 4. And now I've changed it to a rectangular equation. Let's try another one. Let's do r equals 5 cosine theta. Here we could square both sides again and get r squared, which we know we can replace with x squared plus y squared. The problem is if we square the right side, then we get 25 cosine squared. And that doesn't convert really well with our formulas. But we can do something similar. What if I multiplied both sides by r? If I multiply both sides by r, I get the r squared on one side and 5r cosine theta on the other side. And this is nice because when we see the r squared, we know r squared is x squared plus y squared equals 5 times. And notice we've got this r cosine theta r cosine theta we saw in one of our conversions as well. That's equal to x. And so r equals 5 cosine theta is the same as the rectangular equation x squared plus y squared equals 5x. Let's do one more. Let's do r minus r cosine theta equals 5. Well, right off the bat, I see r cosine theta. I know that's x. This one's going to take a little bit more work to make behave like we want it to behave. But how about we do this? Let's add r cosine theta to both sides. When I do, we get r equals 5 plus r cosine theta theta. Then what I want to do is let's go through and actually square both sides. When I do that, r squared on the left can become x squared plus y squared. On the right, let's leave the 5 plus r cosine theta squared. But this time, we know r cosine theta is equal to x. And now we've changed it into an equation as a rectangular equation. Now we have something we are maybe more familiar with. So why do we do these polar form numbers? Well, you might notice that as we're making these conversions, we're starting with simple looking equations in polar coordinates. In polar coordinates, quite often equations look simple as polar coordinates. But in rectangular coordinates, they're much more complicated or complex. That's the advantage of polar is we can work in polar, especially when circles are involved, to make graphing and understanding the function easier.
An unexpected use of polar form graphing comes up actually with complex numbers, specifically when we want to multiply and divide complex numbers. The question is going to be, can polar help multiply or divide complex numbers? But before we get to multiplying and dividing complex numbers, we need to look at how complex numbers relate to polar coordinates. But then how do complex numbers even relate to graphing? Let's look at how we can graph a complex number. Complex numbers are numbers like 5 plus 2i or negative 3 plus 4i, maybe 7 minus 8i. Complex numbers have a real and an imaginary part where i is the square root of negative 1. What we're going to do then is we're going to say the point is x plus yi, which generates this rectangular point x comma y in rectangular. So then the numbers up above here, 5 plus 2i is the point 5 comma 2. Negative 3 plus 4i is the point negative 3 comma 4. 7 minus 8i is the point 7 comma negative 8. And so that way, we end up with this xy coordinate point in complex numbers. So our graph then becomes the x coordinate. And the y coordinate can also be thought of as the real axis on x and the imaginary axis on y. And so when we graph the point 5 comma 2, the point 5 comma 2 would be to the right 5 and up 2. And that would be the point 5 plus 2i as a complex number graphed on the rectangular plane. Negative 3 comma 4, 4 backwards 3, up 4. That would be the point negative 3 plus 4i. And so similarly, we could graph any complex point in the rectangular plane. But we're not interested in rectangular points right now. We're interested in polar points, polar complex numbers. And with polar complex numbers, we're going to take a look at this rectangular point x plus yi. And we know we can convert it to polar because x is equal to r cosine theta plus y is r sine theta times i. Well, since both of these have an r in it, we can factor out the r, and we get cosine theta plus, I'm going to move the i out front, i sine theta. And this format is going to be very common for us to work with. In fact, it's so common that we're going to abbreviate all that stuff in parentheses with c for cosine, i for the square root of 1, and s. And so you'll often see the cis theta for cosine plus i sine theta written as a shortcut. It's shorthand for cosine plus i sine. So for example, if I've got the complex number 5 minus 5 square root of 3i, we could convert it to polar form by identifying r, the radius, and theta, the angle. r, the radius, we know is x squared, which would be 5 squared, plus y squared, 5 root 3 squared, equals r squared. So simplifying, we get r squared equals 25 plus 25 times 3, or 100, 
taking the square root of both sides, I now know the radius is equal to 10. We still need to figure out our angle theta. But we know that the cosine of theta is going to equal the x part, 5, divided by the radius, which is 10. So then the cosine of theta is equal to 1 half. Similarly, the sine of theta is equal to the y coordinate, negative 5 root 3, divided by the radius of 10. So the sine of theta is equal to negative root 3 over 2 when we reduce. So now if I just think about my unit circle, cosine is 1 half, a short distance. Sine, the y coordinates, the long negative 3 root 2. And that's going to be a third. We've got 1 third, 2 thirds, 3 thirds, 4 thirds, 5 thirds. That's 5 pi over 3 is equal to my angle. And so 5 minus 5 root 3i as a complex number is equal to the radius 10 times the cosine of my angle 5 pi over 3 plus i times the sine of my angle 5 pi over 3. Or how we'll probably abbreviate this is that's 10 cosine plus i sine of 5 pi over 3. Let's do one more, but this time we're going to go the other way. Let's take a polar complex number, which is the square root of 2 times the cosine of 3 pi over 4 plus i sine of 3 pi over 4. And we're going to convert it to a rectangular complex number. Well, this is just as simple as simplifying the expression as it looks. On the unit circle, 3 pi over 4, 1, 2, 3 pi over 4, we know that's negative root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. So the cosine or the x-coordinate is negative root 2 over 2, plus i times the sine, the y-coordinate, a positive root 2 over 2. Now I just need to simplify by distributing that square root of 2 onto both pieces. That's going to give us a negative. Root 2 times root 2 is 2, divided by 2 is 1 plus i. Root 2 times root 2 is 2, divided by 2 is 1. And so we get the rectangular form of the complex number, negative 1 plus i, is the same as the polar complex number, root 2 cosine 3 pi over 4 plus i sine 3 pi over 4. OK, all of that was to set up how we can talk about complex numbers as polar points. But the question was, how can polar points help us multiply and divide complex numbers? Specifically in polar form. Let's set up the theory behind what we're going to do. Let's take two complex polar numbers. We'll call it a times the cosine of alpha plus i times the sine of alpha. And we're going to multiply it by a second complex number, b times the cosine of beta plus i times the sine of beta. Well, if I multiply a times b, we just get ab. When I multiply the stuff in parentheses, let's kind of foil it out. We'll do cosine alpha times cosine beta. Cosine alpha times i sine beta gives us plus i cosine alpha sine beta. i sine 
times cosine gives us plus i sine alpha cosine beta. And then when we multiply i times i, we'll get negative 1. i squared is negative 1 times sine alpha sine beta. Let's reorganize this a little bit. We're going to take the cosine cosine and the negative sine sine and group those together. So cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta plus the two terms that have an i on them. I'm going to factor the i out. And that's going to leave me with cosine alpha Actually, let's do the other term first. It's just going to flow better that way. Sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine of beta. And the reason that's nice is we should recognize those pieces as one of our properties. Those are from our sum and difference formulas. Cosine cosine minus sine sine is equal to the cosine of the sum of the angles plus i times sine cosine plus cosine sine is the sine of the sum of the angles. Which means at the beginning, if we wanted to multiply the two complex polar numbers together, what we could have done is just multiplied a times b, multiply the radius, radii, I guess, because there's two radii. And then the angles alpha and beta could have been added together, alpha plus beta. Add the angles. So for example, if I have three cosine plus i sine of pi over 3, and I want to multiply 5 times cosine plus i sine of pi over 6, all I have to do is multiply the radii together. 3 times 5 is 15. And then it's cosine plus i sine of, and we add the angles together, pi over 3 plus pi over 6. Multiplying by 2 gives me 15 cosine i sine of 3 pi over 6, or 15 cosine i sine of pi over 2. All we have to do is multiply the radii and add the angles, and we're done. If you remember when we multiplied complex numbers in the rectangular form, we had to FOIL everything out. Then we had to combine like terms. Then we had to simplify i squared to the negative 1. That made more like terms to combine. It was a lot more work. But in polar form, it's a lot more straightforward to multiply the complex numbers. Just multiply the radii and add the angles. Similarly, if I have a complex polar point of a cosine alpha plus i sine alpha, and we want to divide it by a complex polar number, b cosine beta plus i sine beta, that's going to be equal to Instead of multiplying, now we'll divide the radii. And then we'll have cosine of the difference in the angles, alpha minus beta plus i sine of alpha minus beta. So let's take a look at an example where we do exactly that. And let's actually make it a little more interesting. Let's take a look at 8 square root of 3 minus 8i 
divided by negative 2 minus 2i. Now, normally, if you remember in rectangular form, we had to rationalize the denominator by multiplying by the conjugate, which resulted in multiplying in the numerator. We had to simplify the denominator, possibly reduce. This was a very involved multi-step problem. We're going to make this much easier by converting this to a polar division problem, and then use our property where we can divide the radius and subtract the angle. So first, we need to know the radius. Let's do the 8 root 3 minus 8i first. So the radius squared then is equal to 8 root 3 squared plus negative 8 squared, which means the radius squared is 64 times 3 plus 64 is 256. Taking the square root, r is equal to 16. I also know that the cosine of theta is equal to 8 root 3 divided by the 16. So the cosine of theta is equal to root 3 over 2. The sine of theta is equal to negative 8 divided by the radius of 16. So the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. So on my unit circle, Go well, root 3 over 2 comma negative 1 half. That's going to be 11 pi over 6. Let's write this problem. The numerator we just found out is actually equal to a radius of 16 times cosine plus i sine of 11 pi over 6. In the denominator, then, we're going to do the negative 2 minus 2i. Let's convert that to its polar form. r squared is equal to negative 2 squared plus negative 2 squared. r squared is equal to 4 plus 4, or 8. So r is the square root of 8, which simplifies to 2 root 2. The cosine of my angle is the x-coordinate divided by 2 root 2, which gives me negative 1 over root 2. And then when we rationalize the denominator by multiplying by the square root of 2, we end up with negative root 2 over 2. The sine of the angle is the y-coordinate, negative 2, over the 2 root 2, just like before the 2's divide out. And then we rationalize the denominator. So the sine of theta is equal to negative root 2 over 2. And so if I graph this, negative root 2 over 2 comma negative root 2 over 2 sticks me down in the third quadrant. And that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi over 4 for the angle. So we now know up at the top here, negative 2 minus 2i has a radius of 2 root 2 cosine i sine of an angle 5 pi over 4. This is going to be much easier to work with. First, with the fractions, 16 over 2 is going to be 8. And I'm going to go ahead and rationalize that denominator by multiplying by root 2 over 2. That'll give me 8 root 2 over 2 cosine i sine of, now with the angles, we subtract the angles. 11 pi over 6 minus 5 pi over 4. Final reducing here, 8 over 2 is 4. So we have 4 root 2 cosine i sine. I'm going to do a common denominator of 12. That's 22 pi over 12. Multiplying by 3 would be 15 pi over 12. 22 minus 15 is 7 pi over 12. And we now have divided these complex numbers. 
So polar coordinates actually become very useful with complex numbers because the operations are easier to do in polar form than they are to do in rectangular form. All we need to do is first convert the rectangular complex number to a polar complex number. And once we do, in order to multiply two complex numbers, we multiply the radius and add the angles. Or if we're dividing two complex numbers, we divide the radius and subtract the angles. Take a look at practicing this on the homework assignment, and let me know if you have any questions. Thus far, we've talked about polar coordinates and how they can help represent complex numbers to make multiplication and division of complex numbers easier. Now we're going to take a look at going to the next step, which is how we can do exponents with complex numbers. How do we calculate exponents on complex numbers? And in, as you might imagine, in rectangular form, this can become quite a tedious process, especially if the exponent is a larger exponent. But in polar form, we can do a nice little trick with the exponents. First, let's consider, we'll let z be our complex number. It's equal to r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. Well, that means if I square both sides, z squared is equal to r squared times cosine theta plus i sine theta squared, which then would be equal to r squared times cosine squared plus 2i cosine theta sine theta. Actually, I'm going to rewrite that as i times 2 sine theta cosine theta, because that should look familiar to us, minus sine squared theta. And it has to be negative because of the fact that we have an i squared, which makes your negative 1. So when I put this together then, what we end up with is a cosine squared minus sine squared. Cosine squared minus sine squared you should recognize as the cosine of 2 theta plus we've got an i, and then we've got a 2 sine cosine. You should recognize that as the sine of 2 theta, which means when we squared our z, we ended up with r squared times the cosine of 2 theta plus i sine of theta. And if we continue this, similarly, z cubed is going to be equal to r cubed times the cosine of 3 theta plus i sine of 3 theta. z to the fourth is going to be r to the fourth times the cosine of 4 theta plus i sine of 4 theta. And you start to see the pattern developing, which is going to lead us to what is called de Moivier's theorem, which basically says if z is a complex number written in polar form, z to the n is equal to the radius to the n times the cosine of n theta plus i times the sine of n theta. For example, I 
actually let's highlight that's our big theorem of the day. So for example, if I've got the complex number 2 root 3 minus 2i, and I want to take that to the third power, algebraically, that would be quite tedious to do here in rectangular form. So let's convert that to a polar form complex number. r squared, we know then, is the x component, 2 root 3 squared plus the y component, negative 2 squared. So r squared is equal to 4 times 3 plus 4. r squared is 16. So the radius is going to be 4. Cosine of theta is equal to the x component, 2 root 3, divided by the radius of 4. So the cosine of theta is root 3 over 2 when we reduce. The sine of theta is equal to the y component, negative 2 over the radius of 4. So the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half when we reduce. And so we've got uh, x coordinate of root 3 over 2 positive, a y component of negative 1 half. I know that angle is 11 pi over 6. Putting that all together, then, we end up with our complex number with a radius of 4 times the cosine of 11 pi over 6 plus i sine of 11 pi over 6. And what we're doing, though, is we're taking it all to the third power. Using De Moivier's theorem, then, we can do that really quickly by just taking 4 to the third power times the cosine of 3 times 11 pi over 6 plus i sine of 3 times 11 pi over 6. Raising the radius to our exponent and multiplying each of the angles by the exponent. When we do, 3 over 6 is going to reduce to 2. And 4 cubed is 64. So we have 64 cosine of 11 pi over 6. I'm sorry, 11 pi over 2 plus i sine of 11 pi over 2 which technically we can reduce a little bit more because 11 pi over 2, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's the same as the angle 3 pi over 2. So let's simplify that one step further and say that gives us 64 times the cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus i sine of 3 pi over 2. If I wanted to know what that was in rectangular form, we could just simplify this resulting expression. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we've got 64 for our radius. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. That's the x-coordinate, because we're at 0 comma negative 1 plus i times the sine of 3 pi over 2, which is negative 1. And that just gives us negative 64i is what our example is raised to the third power. Let's see if I can get that all on one screen here. There we go. Now, the opposite of taking an exponent would be taking a root. And that's the last thing I want to look at here with these problems, is how do we take roots? I want to recall that when we have something like z to the sixth equals 1, a common mistake I see is people take the sixth root of both sides and say z equals 1. Sometimes they get z equals plus or minus 1 because they remember that an even exponent has that plus or minus on the square roots. But there's actually six solutions to this equation. If we were to subtract 1 from both sides, we have a difference of squares that could be factored as z cubed minus 1 times z cubed plus 1. 
And then the first factor is a difference of cubes, and the second factor is a sum of cubes. The difference of cubes factors to z minus 1 times z squared plus z plus 1. The sum of cubes factors to z plus 1 times z squared minus z plus 1 equals 0. And by setting each of these factors equal to 0, we end up with z equals 1. Uh, we'll take the other easy one, negative 1. And then the last two factors, the trinomials, we would have to use the quadratic formula. And if you use the quadratic formula and simplify, you would end up with negative 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2 from the first one. And from the last one, you would end up with a positive 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2. And because of the plus or minus, there's 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6. There are six solutions, which matches the sixth power. And it turns out that every polynomial has exactly the same number of solutions, if you count real and complex, as the degree of the problem. So with this in mind, we have a formula that we can use to calculate the roots of complex numbers. Let's let z equal the complex number r times the cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. And it turns out that the n roots are, or the nth root, the third root, the fourth root, the fifth root, are given by the formula the nth root of n times the cosine of theta plus 2k pi over n plus i times the sine of theta plus 2k pi over n. where k is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way up to n minus 1. So we end at 1 less than the root that we are taking. This formula for the n roots is what we're going to be using on this next example. Let's say z squared equals 1 plus the square root of 3 times i. And we want to take the square roots of both sides to find out what z equals. Well, first, we need to convert this into a polar form so we can use the formula. So with the polar form, our radius squared is equal to 1 squared plus the square root of 3 squared. So our radius is 1 plus 3. The radius squared is 4, so I know the radius must be 2. The cosine of my angle is the x-coordinate divided by the radius, so the cosine is 1 half. The sine of my angle is the y-coordinate divided by my radius. It's root 3 over 2. And so if I draw my unit circle, x-coordinate of 1 half, a y-coordinate of root 3 over 2, it's going to be up here at pi over 3 equals theta. So now I can rewrite my problem as z squared equals a radius of 2 times, I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate it as cosine i sine pi over 3. The formula then tells us that z is going to be equal to the nth root. It's going to be the square root of the radius 
times the cosine. And we're going to actually, let's stick with the abbreviation for the sake of space. Cosine i sine of the angle pi over 3 plus 2 pi k all over the nth root. We're taking a second root, 2. And if we do a little bit of simplifying here, I'm going to multiply each term by 3. That will give us the square root of 2 times cosine plus i sine of the 3's divide out. So we get pi plus 6 pi k over 6. And that's going to work as k counts from 0 up to 1 less than the exponent, from 0 to 1. So if we start by letting k equal 0, we get the square root of 2 times, and I'm going to go ahead and expand it this time, cosine of, plugging 0 in for the k, makes 6 pi times 0 into 0. So we're just left with 1 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of 1 pi over 6. And if I think about my unit circle, 1 pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. So we get the square root of 2 times cosine is root 3 over 2 plus i times the sine, which is 1 half. And multiplying out gives me the square root of 6 over 2 plus a square root of 2 over 2 times i. And that is our first square root of the original problem, 1 plus the square root of 3i. But there's a second root. Because we took a square root, second root, there should be two answers. If we took a fifth root, fifth root should have five answers. So now k equals 1. When I do that in my purple formula in the top right there, we end up with the square root of 2 times the cosine of 6 pi plus pi is going to be 7 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of now 7 pi over 6. And simplifying this will tell me my second root. 7 pi over 6 is over in the bottom left. It's got an x coordinate of negative root 3 over 2 and a y coordinate of negative 1 half. So we end up with the square root of 2 times. I'm going to scroll up to buy us some more space. Cosine is negative root 3 over 2 plus i times the sine, which is negative 1 half over 2. Distributing the square root through, we get negative square root of 6 over 2. Oop, minus. Distributing the square root 2 gives us square root of 2 over 2, i. And that becomes our second root. If you took either of these and you squared them, we'd get back to the original problem, which was 1 plus the square root of 3i. These problems really are a plug and chug practice using the formula. The formula might be a little clunky to get used to at first, but once you do, every problem becomes the same. So now it's your turn to practice some of these on your own, and let me know if you have any questions. These last few videos are going to close the last gap that we have before you're ready to take calculus. And that is to let, take a look at what is called sigma notation as we evaluate and find things related to sequences and series. So we're going to set this up today with the question simply, what is a sequence? And in layman's terms, a sequence is just going to be an ordered list of numbers. 
usually there's some type of pattern to that ordered list, but there doesn't have to be. But when there's a pattern to that list of numbers, we become particularly interested in working with them. One way we can identify this pattern is using what is called a recursive definition. And the recursive definition defines the first term And let's say we're using the letter a to represent our terms. So we're going to use a subscript of 1 to represent the first term, the first a. Then we're also going to define how each term relates to the previous term. So for example, I could define the first term is 5. Then for any nth term, actually, let's label that. Each term, we're going to call that a sub n. So the nth term, a sub n, is equal to the previous term. Well, the previous term is going to have a subscript that's 1 less than the current term. So I'll call that n minus 1 plus 2. And so this defines the first term as 5. And then every term after that says, grab the previous term and add 2 to it. So my first term, a sub 1, we know is 5. My second term, a sub 2, says, grab the previous term, which is 5, and add 2 to it which gives me 7 for the second term. a sub 3 would be the third term. The third term says grab the previous term, which was 7, and add 2 to it. Gives me 9. And we can keep going. And in fact, we usually will list out the numbers in a sequence as inside brackets, maybe 5, 7, 9, the next one you can see would be 11, then 13, and so on. That is the sequence of terms defined by this recursive formula. However, recursive formulas are sometimes inconvenient to work with because if we wanted to find the 30th term, we would have to list out all 30 terms adding to the previous term or doing whatever operation the a sub n equation said. So we've got a second way that we like to refer to sequences. And that's with what's called the explicit formula. The explicit formula defines each term with a formula. based on position. And the position, so if each term is going to be your a sub n, represent the nth term, the position then is just the n or whatever term number we're on. So for example, I might see an explicit formula like a sub n equals 3 times 2 to the n power. And now we can say, well, gee, a sub 1, the first term, is 3 times 2 to the n, which is the first power. And that gives me 6 for the first term. The second term, then, we just use the explicit formula, 3 times 2 to the this is the second term. We'll do the second power. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. And then the third term would be 3 times 2 to the third power, which is 27 times, I'm sorry, 8 times 3, which is 24. And so you can kind of see each term is ultimately being multiplied by 2. And so we could list these out as 6. 12, 24, the next one's going to be 48, and so on. 
But where this really becomes valuable is now I actually have a way to find the a sub 10th term. Instead of having to go back and recalculate 10 terms, we could just do 3 times 2 to the 10th. And that'll get me directly to the answer that I'm looking for. And in this case, it gets remarkably big, remarkably fast. When I do that on my calculator, 3 times 2 to the 10th power, we're already at 3,072. But because I had an explicit formula, I was able to get at the 10th term directly without having to go back through all the terms before it. That's the advantage of the explicit formula. OK, so so far we've talked about what sequences are and how we can define them recursively or explicitly. We're going to take a brief aside to talk about factorials. And then we'll come back and bring it all together. A factorial is written as some number with an exclamation mark after it. That's read a factorial. And what that means we're going to do is we're going to take a and multiply it by 1 less than a and multiply it by 1 less than that and keep multiplying all the way down times 3 times 2 times 1. Basically, we're going to multiply by everything beneath that number. So for example, 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. What we need to be able to do for our purposes today is look at how we can simplify factorials. For example, we're going to see expressions such as 53 factorial divided by 51 factorial. And this we can actually simplify quite quickly and nicely using a nice slick trick where we're going to count down from the largest number to the smallest number. Here's what I mean by that. 53 is my larger number here in this example. So I'm going to count down 53 times 52 times 51, which matches the smaller number. And so that's going to be 51 factorial. What's nice about that is the 51 factorials can divide out now. And I'm just left with 53 times 52. And on my calculator really fast, I can see that's 2,756. We could even do this strategy more abstractly. If I have 5n plus 3 factorial, and I want to divide by 5n factorial, the bigger one is the one with the plus 3 on it. So we'll count down from that one, 5n plus 3 times 5n plus 2 times 5n plus 1 times 5n plus 0, which matches the bottom. And once it matches the bottom, I stop, because now those 5n factorials can divide out. And I'm just left with the expression 5n plus 3, 5n plus 2, 5n plus 1. And it's probably not worth multiplying out, so let's leave it just like that. OK, that was a brief aside about factorials. They're going to come up in just a minute as we go back to talking about our sequences. As we are trying to find explicit formulas for a sequence. For example, if I have the sequence 5, 13, 21, 29, 37, and so on and so on, and I want to find the explicit formula for this sequence, 
we need to start looking for patterns to see how we're changing from one number to the next. What might be happening? And this is really a big guess and check. Look for patterns, uh, attack strategy. Looking at how we go from 5 to 13, I notice we add 8. Is that pattern consistent? Sure enough, if I keep going, I keep adding 8. And so that might make me think, OK, maybe I'm taking 8 times the term number. But if I let n equal 1, because n equals 1 is the first term, I get 8 times 1 equals 8, not 5 like I was expecting. So first we tried 8n. Maybe now I can try, instead of just 8n, what if I move the 8 down to 5 by subtracting 3? Now I'm going to let n equal, we know it's going to work with 1. Let's try 2. That's going to give me 8 times 2 minus 3 is 16 minus 3, which is 13. And notice the second term is 13 like we expected. So I'm feeling pretty good about my formula. I could try n equals 3 just to make sure 8 times 3 is 24, minus 3 is 21. So I'm feeling pretty optimistic that my nth term, a sub n, is equal to 8n minus 3. And we got that simply by looking for a pattern. Let's try another sequence. Let's try 1 fourth, 8 sixteenths, 27 over 64, 64 over 256. We're going to find the explicit formula for this sequence. With fractions, sometimes it's easier to separate the numerator from the denominator. So let's first look at the numerators to see if we can identify a pattern as to what's happening. So the numerators are 1, 8, 27, 64. And I might first try and say, well, to go from 1 to 8, we might add 7. Or we might multiply by 8. But to go from 8 to 27, there we're adding 19. Huh. That's not the same. We're definitely not multiplying by 8. So we need a different strategy here. You might recognize that 1, 8, 27, and 64 look like familiar numbers. Those numbers are the cubes, 1 cubed, 2 cubed, 3 cubed, and 4 cubed. So you might assume the next one's going to be 5 cubed, 6 cubed, and 7 cubed. And so it seems that as this pattern continues, the numerator is just the term number cubed. Because when n equals 1, it was 1 cubed. When n equals 2, 2 cubed was 8. When n equals 3, 3 cubed was 27. So it seems my numerator is n cubed. My denominator is 4, 16, 64, 256. Those are all perfect squares, but they're not quite all in order. So let's go back to our old strategy. To go from 4 to 16, we could add 12. The other thing we could do is multiply by 4. Going from 16 to 64 is definitely not adding 12. But I do see it's multiplying by 4. And every time to get to the next term, I have to multiply by 4. So let's try repeated multiplication would be 4 raised to an exponent. Let's try n equals 2. Let's check the second term. Is that going to give us 16? 4 squared equals 16. It does. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm going to say then my denominator is probably 4 to the n, which means together 
the nth term in the numerator is n cubed, and in the denominator is 4 to the n. And now we have an explicit formula for this sequence. Let's do one last example. Let's try 5, 10, 30, 120. To go from 5 to 10, I see that we either added 5 or we might have multiplied by 2. How do we go from 10 to 30? Well, we'd add 20, or we could multiply by 3. That's not consistent. Or is it? What happens to go to 120? We either added 90, or we multiplied by 4. The adding, I don't see any pattern with. But what do you notice about the multiplying? times 2, times 3, times 4. That almost looks like a factorial. I might try n factorial. And if I let n equal 2, then I have 2 factorial, which is 2 times 1, which is 2. Well, n equals 2 is 10. So I need to adjust my formula to get me up to 10. Let's try maybe adding 8, n factorial plus 8. Well, then let's let n equal 3. Hopefully, that'll give us the 30. So we'd have 3 factorial plus 8, which is 3 times 2 times 1 plus 8. 6 plus 8 is 14. That didn't work. Let's try something else, though. That went backwards. Instead of adding 8 to get the 10 that we wanted, what if I multiplied by 5? 5 times n factorial. Now let's let n equals 3 and see what happens. That means we've got 5 times 3 factorial, 5 times 3 times 2, 6 times 5 is? 30. That's the 30 we wanted. You could try 4 as well. And you get 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 5, which is 120. And so by continuing to play with options and adjusting our strategy, we end up with a sub n is equal to 5 times n factorial. Identifying these explicit formulas for sequences does take a little bit of practice with pattern recognition, because no two problems are really the same. It's really an educated guess and check method to see if we can identify how we're moving from one term to the next, and how can that help us build the explicit formula. So now it's your turn to practice with these. Take a look at the homework, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gotten comfortable with sequences, we're ready to take a look at what are called series. The question we're going to answer today is, what are series? And series are related to sequence. What a series is going to do is find the sum of the numbers in a sequence. Basically, we're going to have a sequence of numbers, and we're going to add them all up. And this is something we're going to be very interested in when we get to calculus, is we're going to add up an infinite number of numbers and see what they add up to. So just kind of as a preview of calculus, we're going to add maybe 1 plus 1 half, plus 1 third, plus 1 fourth, and add those up forever, versus if I add maybe 1 plus a half, plus a fourth, plus an eighth, plus a sixteenth, and add those up forever. 
And what's interesting to us in calculus as we add these sequences together, the first sequence where we're adding with 2, 3, 4, 5 in the denominator, that actually is going to add up to infinity. While the bottom sequence, we're having powers of 2 in the denominator, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth. That's going to actually add up to the number 2. And so sometimes a series of numbers will add up to infinity, and sometimes a series of numbers will add up to a specific number. And that's what you're going to be interested in when you get to calculus. For our purposes, we're not going to add up an infinite number of numbers. We're just going to look at how we can add up a series of a finite number of elements. So to set this up, I'm going to talk about what is called sigma notation. And a sigma notation, you'll see looking something like this. We'll have the Greek letter sigma, which I draw very poorly. It's a capital letter sigma. Beneath it, you'll see something like k equals 1. Above it, you'll see a number, maybe like the number 5. And then you'll see an expression afterwards, maybe 2k minus 1. What the pieces here mean is this Greek letter sigma, that funky character, that means add up. The k equals, that is the variable in the problem. And you'll notice that that variable did show up to k minus 1. The bottom value that k equals is what k is going to start at. And the top number tells us what k is going to end at. And so basically what this means is we're going to start with k equals 1, because that's the starting number. And then I get 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. And then k is going to start to count up. K equals 2 will give me 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 3. And it's going to keep counting up. K equals 3. The expression then is 2 times 3 minus 1, which gives me 5. Then k equals 4 would be 2 times 4 minus 1, which is 7. And k equals 5 would be 2 times 5 minus 1, which is 9. I'm going to stop there because I got up to k equals 5, which is the top number of the sigma. That's my ending value. And so if I want to calculate the sum as k goes from 1 to 5 of 2k minus 1, that means we're going to add the sequence of numbers that we just found. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 equals 25. That's what sigma notation has us do. It has us add up the elements of a sequence by giving us the formula for the sequence. Let's try one more example. Let's find the sum as n goes from 2 to 4 of negative 1 to the n power times 2 to the n plus 1 over n factorial. Well, we can see that n is going to start at 2 and count up to 4. So if n equals 2, we have negative 1 squared times 2 to the 2 plus 1 over 2 factorial. When I simplify that, the negative 1 squared is a positive 1. Then we have 2 to the third power which is 8, divided by 2 factorial, which is 2. So that's going to simplify to 4. Then n counts up. So now n is going to be equal to 3. Negative 1 to the third power times 2 to the 3 plus 1 over 3 factorial. Now when the negative 1 is cubed, that's going to give me a negative. 2 to the fourth power is 16 over 3 factorial means 3 times 2, which is 6. And that's going to simplify to negative 8 thirds. Continuing to count up, where n is now equal to 4, we have negative 1 to the fourth power 
times 2 to the 4 plus 1 over 4 factorial. Simplifying this, negative 1 to the 4th is going to be a positive 1. 2 to the 5th is 32. Divided by 4 factorial is 4 times 3, which is 12, times 2, which is 24. And dividing both by 8, we end up with 4 thirds. And so finally, to finish this off, the sum as n goes from 2 to 4 of negative 1 to the n of 2 to the n plus 1 over n factorial would be the sum of those terms, 4 plus a negative 8 thirds plus 4 thirds. And I might get a common denominator on the 4. 4 with a common denominator would be 12 thirds. And so we have 12 minus 8 plus 4 is equal to 8 thirds is the sum of this series. A series is adding the numbers of a sequence. Well, that's pretty straightforward. The more challenging bit is not so much evaluating a series. The more challenging bit is taking a series and writing it in this sigma notation. So let's take a look at some examples where we do just that, where we write a series in sigma notation. Let's start with this series. Let's take 7. I'll go ahead and put it over 1. Minus 7 halves plus 7 sixths minus 7 twenty fourths plus 7 over 20 minus and so on and so on and so on. Actually, let's not do and so on. Let's stop there. What I notice is the numerator is pretty easy to predict. The numerator is always 7. Looking at the denominator, we've got 1, 2, 6, 24. Oops, and 120. I wrote that wrong. Let's make that 120. And as I look how I move from 1 to 2, there's two options to get there. I can either add 1 or I can multiply by 2. Looking for a pattern going from 2 to 6, we're either adding 4 or multiplying by 3. Going from 6 to 24, we're either adding 18 or multiplying by 4. Going from 24 to 120, we're either adding 96, or we're multiplying by 5. And you can see that adding really has no pattern to it. But the multiplying step does have a pattern to it. Times 2, times 3, times 4. That's a factorial. So I might see if n factorial works. And let's call the first term n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and n equals 5. If we're doing n factorial, notice 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2. On the third term, 3 factorial is 6. On the fourth term, 4 factorial is 24. And on the fifth term, 5 factorial is 120. So I'm feeling pretty good about that denominator. The other thing I have to watch out for is the signs, though. Notice the signs go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. When we have alternating signs, the way we can get that is we can take negative 1 raised to some exponent. Sometimes the exponent is n, and sometimes the exponent is n minus 1. Notice when we say the first term n equals 1, the first term is positive. Well, negative 1 raised to the first power is negative 1. That's negative. So rather than doing raised to the n, we'll do raised to the n plus 1. By making it n plus 1, 
Now on the first term, 1 plus 1 is 2, and negative 1 squared is a positive 1. And that's going to give us the positive that we need. So we've got three parts. We've got our numerator, our denominator, and the negative, the alternating signs. If we put this all together, we're going to a sum as n goes from the first value was 1, the last value was 5. We said the numerator was 7. We said the denominator was n factorial. But then we also need the alternating sign, which comes from negative 1 to the n plus 1. Putting together all the pieces, we've taken this series and we've rewritten it in sigma notation. Let's try one more example before I let you go to practice some on your own. Let's take the series negative 4 thirds plus 6 ninths minus 8 over 27 plus 10 over 81 minus 12 over 243 plus 14 over 729. And just to number the terms, we'll call them n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So we've got numbered terms. Since there's fractions, we'll look at the numerator first. The numerator is going 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. And you can probably see what's happening is we're adding 2 each time to get my new numerator. So I might try 2n. The problem is when n equals, we can pick any one. Let's look at n equals 2. When n equals 2, we want the answer to be 6. We have 2 times 2, which is 4. So to get it to be 6, we're going to add an extra 2 to it, 2n plus 2. Is that going to be better? Well, let's try it. Let's let n equals 3. Is that going to give us the 8 we expect? 2 times 3 plus 2. 6 plus 2 does equal 8, just like we'd expect for the third term. So I feel pretty good. The numerator is 2n plus 2. For the denominator, we have 3, 9, 27, 81, 243, 729. And looking at that, you might see, to go from one term to the next, we seem to be multiplying by 3. So repeated multiplication becomes 3 to some exponent. Let's try that. Let's try that on n equals 3. Will that give me the third term? The third denominator is 27. 3 to the third is 27. That does work, so I'm feeling pretty good about 3 to the n for the denominator. This one also has alternating signs, though. Negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. The way we handle the alternating sign is we take negative 1 raised to an exponent. We've been picking on n equals 3, so let's keep that up. When n equals 3, we have negative 1 to the third. That is negative 1. Is the third term negative? Yes, it is. So we've got the correct negative 1 to the n. Now we can put it all together to write our sigma notation. We start with the first term. We're going to go all the way up to the sixth term. The numerator, we said, was 2n plus 2. The denominator, we said, was 3 to the n. And let's put the 2n plus 2 in parentheses, because we also need a negative 1 raised to the n to get the signs. And now we've developed sigma notation for our series. 
Now it's your turn to practice some of these. Practice evaluating some series by working out all the term numbers from maybe 1 to 6 in this example. And also work the other way, going from the series written out, can you write it in sigma notation? Practice some of these and let me know if you have any questions. As we discuss and work with series, there are two important series that come up more often than others, at least in our study of mathematics. And that's going to be the arith arithmetic series and the geometric series. We're going to look at the arithmetic series in this video. The question is, how do we find the sum of an arithmetic series? And before we find the sum of an arithmetic series, we're going to start by defining exactly what is an arithmetic sequence. And if you recall, a sequence is a list of numbers, an ordered list of numbers, and a series is the sum of the sequence. Right now, we're just looking at the ordered list. In an arithmetic sequence, each term is equal to the previous term plus a common difference. For example, I might have the sequence 5, 9, 13, 17, and so on. And I can see between these terms, I'm adding 4 each time. That piece that I'm adding, adding 4 each time, is what we call the common difference. The difference between the numbers is always 4. That's our common difference. And you'll often see the common difference represented with the letter D. And so for this sequence, we could define it with a recursive formula and say the first term is equal to 5. And then every nth term after that is the previous term plus that common difference. Or we can do it explicitly and say any nth term is equal to now, you might be inclined to think we take 4 times the number, because we're adding 4 each time and repeated addition is multiplication. But we're actually going to do 4 times the term number minus 1, because that's going to account for the first term not being numbered 0, but actually being numbered 1. And then we need to add to that the starting value, in this case, of 5. Now, if you notice, for example, when n equals 3 for the third term, we would have 5 plus 4 times 3 minus 1. 3 minus 1 is 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus 5 is 13. And you notice the third term, n equals 3, is 13. And so we can kind of make a general formula from this pattern. that if we want a recursive formula, we will say a sub 1 is equal to whatever that first term is. We need to define the first term. And then a sub n is always going to be equal to the previous term plus the common difference. That gives us the recursive form. More often, what we're going to be interested in is the explicit 
formula just because it's easier to work with when we have lots of terms that we're interested in. And the explicit formula is going to be a sub n is equal to the first term plus the common difference times n minus 1. Those formulas are going to be helpful to us as we work with arithmetic sequences. But we're not actually interested in arithmetic sequences. What we're interested in is an arithmetic series. And as you might expect, since a series is a sum of the sequence, an arithmetic sequence is the sum of an arithmetic sequence. We want to add up all the numbers of an arithmetic sequence. And we're going to look for a pattern to help us do it quicker. And a great example comes out of the old math history textbooks with a mathematician named Carl Friedrich Goss. And Carl Friedrich Goss was an unruly student. And his teacher was very frustrated with him one day. And so his teacher put him in the corner and said, OK, you have to stay in that corner until you add all the numbers from 1 to 100. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. All the way up to 98 plus 99 plus 100. Well, as is common with misbehaved children in elementary school, they're often very smart. And that was really the case with Carl Friedrich Gauss. Because he looked at this problem and he said, well, if I take the first number and pair it with the last number, 1 plus 100 is 101. And if I take the next number and pair it with the next number, 2 plus 99 is equal to 101. And 3 plus 98 is equal to 101. In fact, he could do this all the way up to the other side even when we're doing 98 plus 3 equals 101, 99 plus 2 equals 101, and 100 plus 1 equals 101. And if I've done that with all the numbers from 1 to 100, I know there are 100 of these. And so Goss figured quite quickly that he could take 100 times 101, and that would give him the sum of all 100 of those 101 things. The problem is, is each number was represented twice. You see the number 1 is on top and the bottom. Number 2 is on top and bottom. 3 is on top and bottom. He's actually doubled his result. So he knew all he had to do was divide by 2. Well, 100 divided by 2 is 50 times 101. And that's actually quite easy to do because it's just 101 gives you 50, 50. And so in a matter of seconds, Goss shouts out the answer to his teacher that the answer is 50, 50. And of course, he lost his recess privileges and everything else because the teacher figured he cheated somehow. There's no way he could have added up all those numbers that quickly. But in fact, he did by using this nice little formula, which we're going to steal for us to be able to add a formula to sum the first in terms of an arithmetic series. Doing exactly what Gauss did then, we'll use s sub n for the sum of the first n terms. Gauss said there were 100 things that he added together. That was the number of terms times what he added together was the first term plus the last term. 1 plus 100 was 101. And then he divided by 2 because each number was counted twice. This formula then 
Goss gets credit for it because he used it in elementary school to drive his teacher insane, is used to add up the first several terms of an arithmetic sequence. So now if I give you an example, say 5, 9, 13, 17, and say the sequence keeps going for the first 50 terms, we can add up all 50 of these terms because we have an arithmetic sequence. We see we're adding 4 each time. Because I have an arithmetic sequence where I'm adding the same amount every time, all I have to do to find the sum of the first 50 terms is I take the number of terms times the first term plus the last term. Gee, what's the last term to divide by 2? Well, we have an explicit formula that says a sub n is equal to the first term plus the difference times n minus 1. So we need to find the 50th term, which is equal to the first term plus the difference. We just found out that common difference is 4 times the term number, which is 50, minus 1. Or 5 plus 4 times 49. Or 5 plus 196, which equals 201. 201 is the 50th term. And so that's what I'm going to put into my formula. And so now we have 50 times 206 divided by 2. And that's going to be 5,150 is the sum of the first 50 terms of this sequence. So sometimes we do have to dig a little bit. We had to figure out what the 50th term was by using the explicit formula for the 50th term. But that's not too difficult. We've got a formula for that as well. Let's try another example. Let's say, given the first term is negative 5, the common difference is 2, and the last term is 21. We're going to find the sum of all of those terms. The problem here is we don't know what term number we're doing. So we'll go back to that explicit formula that says a sub n is equal to the first term plus the difference times n minus 1 a sub n we know is 21. a sub 1 is negative 5. The difference is 2. We're just looking for what n minus 1 is, or what n is, actually. Well, if I distribute through the parentheses, we get 2n minus 2. Combine like terms, we get negative 7 plus 2n. Add 7 and 28 equals 2n. Divide by 2, and n equals 14. I now know that there are 14 terms in this series, so I'm ready to find the sum of the first 14 terms. The sum is n, which is 14, times the first term plus the last term, negative 5 plus 21, divided by 2, or 14 times 16 divided by 2, which is 112. We know that the first 14 terms of this series described is going to add up to 112. In our first example, we had to do some work to find what the 50th term was. In this example, we had to do some work to figure out which term number we were working with. Each problem might be a little bit different in that we have to find a different piece of information. But the idea is exactly the same either way. Let's say we're given that a sub 50 equals 149. 
And this time, I'm even going to tell you the sum of the first 50 terms is 3,775. I want you to find the common difference and the first term. Well, we really have two equations to help us get there. We know that the sum of the first n terms is n times the first term plus the last term divided by 2. And we also know that the nth term is the first term plus the common difference times n minus 1. Let's plug in what we know into these formulas and see what that leaves us to find. In the blue formula, the sum formula, We've got the sum of the first 50 terms. We know that is 3,775 is equal to n. We know there are 50 terms times, we don't know the first term, plus we do know the 50th term is 149 divided by 2. In the second formula, if we plug in what we know, a sub n, the 50th term is 149 equals the first term. We don't know that right now. Plus the difference. We don't know that right now. But we do know n that there are 50 terms minus 1. So I could simplify that and say 149 equals a1 plus 49d. Looking at our two options, the blue equation, the sum equation, is probably the most useful right now because there's only one missing piece, the a sub 1. So let's solve this equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 to clear the denominator. That's going to give us 7,550 equals 50 times a1 plus 149. I could distribute, but I'm just going to go ahead and divide out the 50 from both sides. Because 7550 divided by 50 equals 151 equals a1 plus 149. And when we subtract 149 from both sides, we now know the first term of this sum of this series is 2, which is helpful because then I can plug that into my green equation. And I know that 149 is equal to 2 plus 49d. Subtract 2 from both sides, and I get 147 equals 49d. And divide both sides by 49. We end up with a difference of 3. So now I know my first term is 2. My common difference is 3. My 50th term is 149. And the sum of all 50 terms is 3,775. So we really have two big equations with these arithmetic sequences, where we have a common difference between the terms of our series. Using those two formulas, you should be able to find any missing pieces a problem might ask for. So now it's your turn to practice some of these. Go ahead and take a look at the homework in the book and let me know if you have any questions. In the previous video, I stated that there are two important series that we interact with a lot. And that was the arithmetic series and the geometric series. The previous video focused on the arithmetic series. This video is going to take a look at how do we find the sum of a geometric series. And just like with the arithmetic series, before we get to the geometric series, we first need to look at what a geometric sequence is. A geometric sequence is one where each term is equal to the previous term times a common ratio. 
and we'll call that common ratio r. So in arithmetic series, we were adding a common difference. A geometric series, we're going to be multiplying a common ratio. So an example of this would be maybe the geometric sequence 2, 6, 18, 54, and so on. And you can see to go from 2 to 6, we multiplied by 3. From 6 to 18, we multiplied by 3. From 18 to 54, we multiplied by 3. That multiply by 3 is our common ratio, or the r. And so we're going to start by defining this geometric sequence recursively. And then we'll look at how we can find it explicitly. Recursively, we can see that the first term is equal to 2. And then every term after that, we take the common ratio of 3 and multiply it by the previous term, times 3, times 3, times 3. And that leads to the explicit formula, which, just like with the arithmetic series, is the one we'll use the most. And the explicit formula says, OK, if we're multiplying by 3 over and over again, that's like taking 3 raised to an exponent. But you might notice that because we're off by one term, we don't start with the 0th term. We start with the first term. Again, we're going to have to do the n minus 1. But if I plug in, for example, n equals 2, that'll give me 3 to the 2 minus 1, which is 3. And the second term is actually 6. So we're going to have to actually multiply by the first term 2 times 3 to the n minus 1 to get the 6. And now when I multiply by 2, it does equal 6, which I want for that second term. So we can generalize this much like we generalized with the arithmetic series. If I want a general recursive formula, we're going to say the first term is equal to the first term, whatever that might be. But then the nth term is equal to the common ratio times the previous term. Or the more useful explicit formula says a sub n is equal to the first term times the common ratio to the n minus 1 power. And again, these formulas are going to be what guide everything we see in the geometric series. So let's talk about that geometric series, or the sum of a geometric sequence. Adding up all the terms of a geometric sequence. I don't have a fun math history story for this one like we did with the arithmetic series in Goss in elementary school. But we do have a formula for the sum of the first in terms of a geometric series. We're going to say that the sum, as n goes from 1 to n, of the geometric series a times r to the n minus 1, that's the explicit formula, the sum of that, is equal to s sub n is equal to the first term times 1 minus the common ratio to the n power divided by 1 minus the common ratio. So for example, if we want to find the sum of the first five terms of negative 3, 6, negative 12, and so on, what I see is we're multiplying by negative 2 
each time. So r, my common ratio, we could get it by taking the second divided by the first term, is negative 2. So then we can go to our formula and say s sub n is equal to the first term, negative 3, times 1 minus the common ratio of negative 2 raised to the n power. There's five terms. Divided by 1 minus the common ratio of negative 2. If I put an extra set of parentheses around my denominator, I can type that into the calculator just like that. And when I do, we get negative 33 is the sum of the first five terms. Let's try another example. Let's say given the first term is 6, and the fourth term is 16 divided by 9, we're going to find the sum of the first four terms. Well, we'd really like to use our sum formula. The problem is when we try and use our sum formula, we start with the first term, 6, times 1 minus the ratio, which we don't know, to the n power, divided by 1 minus the ratio. Well, we need to find our ratio. To do that, we know the explicit formula for a sub n is the first term times the ratio to the n minus 1 power. Well, we know a sub 4 is 16 ninths. a sub 1 is 6 times r to the 4 minus 1, or third power. Well, if I divide both sides of this by 6, multiplying by 1 sixth, let's go ahead and do a little reducing. That's going to be 8 thirds. So we have 8 over 27 equals r to the third power. And if I take the third root of both sides, the cube root of 8 is 2. The cube root of 27 is 3. My common ratio is 2 thirds. And so that's what gets to go into the formula, is 2 thirds as my common ratio. Again, I'm going to be careful. The denominator needs to be in parentheses when I type that into my calculator. And when I do, if I change it to a fraction, we get 130 over 9 as my sum of those first four terms. Now, what's special about a geometric series is it's possible to quickly add up an infinite number of terms in a geometric series. And that's what I want to take a look at next. Let's find the sum of infinite terms. There's kind of two cases we have to watch out for. If the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, then the sum of the first infinite terms is equal to the first term divided by 1 minus the ratio. We say this converges or adds to a specific number. However, if the absolute value of the ratio is greater than 1, we'll say the sum of the first infinite terms does not exist. D and E for does not exist, we call that diverges because it does not add to a specific number. In other words, it adds to infinity. So if I asked to find the sum of 5 minus 5 sevenths 
plus 5 forty ninths minus 5 over 343 plus and so on and so forth. This is a geometric series. I can find my ratio by taking the second term, 5 sevenths, and dividing by 5. Actually, the second term is negative 5 sevenths. Let's not lose our signs, which is equal to negative 5 sevenths times the reciprocal 1 fifth, which means the common ratio is negative 1 seventh. And the absolute value of negative 1 seventh is less than 1. I know this series is going to converge to some specific number. And we can quickly calculate the sum of those infinite terms by taking the first term, a sub 1, divided by 1 minus the ratio. Well, the first term is 5 divided by 1 minus the ratio is negative 7, negative 1 7th, which makes it plus 1 7th. And a little simplifying, if I multiply everything by 7, I get 35 over 7 plus 1, because the 7's are gone. And we have 35 over 8. And so it turns out this sum, because the ratio is smaller than 1, the absolute value of the ratio is smaller than 1, it converges. After an infinite number of terms, it finally adds up to 35 eighths. Let's do one more example. Let's say we're given the first term is 1 third, and the sixth term is negative 81 over 32. We're going to find the sum of the infinite terms. Well, again, we're missing that common ratio. But we do have an explicit formula that says a sub n is equal to the first term times the ratio to the n minus 1. So the sixth term is negative 81 over 32. The first term is 1 third, and we're looking for that common ratio to the 6 minus 1, or fifth power. Multiplying both sides by 3 will give me negative 243 over 32 is equal to the ratio to the fifth power. Taking the fifth root of both sides, the ratio is negative 3 halves. So do I plug that into my formula, that the first infinite terms are the first term over 1 minus r? No. Why not? Because the absolute value of my ratio is bigger than 1. This series will diverge. In other words, it adds up to infinity. Therefore, there is no sum. We could say the sum does not exist, or d and e. So that's a quick introduction to geometric series. First, we define a geometric sequence as each term is equal to the previous term times a common ratio. With that in mind, we found a formula for the sum of the first n terms of a geometric series. And if the common ratio is less than 1, we can even find the sum of the infinite terms of the geometric series. So now it's your turn to practice some of these out of the book. Try a few of these and let me know if you have any questions. When we were working with trigonometry, we got really good at doing trig proofs by working with one side of the identity to end up with the other side of the identity. Working with sequences and series, we could also do proofs using a special method for proofs that is very useful with sigma notation or with sums and series. So the question we're going to ask 
is how do we prove formulas with series? And there's several ways we can go about proving formulas with series. One of the most common ways is a process called induction. And induction is kind of uses this idea of the previous one makes the current one true. Basically, what we say is if this formula, if it is true for 1, then it is true for 2. And if it is true for 2, then it is true for 3. And if it is true for 3, then it is true for 4. And if it's true for 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way down to the point, basically we're saying if it is true for k, then it is true for k plus 1. This kind of idea and concept of how 1 is based on the 1 before it leads to a process for doing induction. The first thing we're going to do on every one of our induction proofs is we are going to prove the base case. That's the, is it true for 1? That's the base case. Because that is what started the whole sequence. We had to have that base case. This whole thing only works if it's true for 1. Then everything can come for that. So when proving the base case, usually, but not always, that means n is going to be equal to 0, or sometimes n starts counting at 1. Wherever you start the counting at, that's where you prove the base case. If the base case is true, we're going to assume it's true if n equals k. That's this k bit. If it's true for k, what we're going to show then, it is also true if n equals k plus 1. What we're trying to show is that the k plus 1 also works. And basically, what we've done then is we've gotten the sequence started. And 1 is the first k, then 2 works, then 3 works, then 4 works, then 5 works. And they all work from there on out. We do that by proving the base case so the whole thing gets started. Assuming it's true for one case, we show it's going to work on the next case. Let's see if we can take a look at what this process actually looks like by doing some examples. Now, in process, all of these examples are going to work exactly the same. But that last step where we're showing it's true might require different algebraic tricks and manipulation in order to get there. So for example, uh, one series that we know is that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to some largest number n. We know, because that's an arithmetic series, we have the formula that's n times the number of terms times the last term, which is n, plus the first term, which is 1, divided by 2. We're going to prove that. First, we have to prove the base case. The base case just uses the first number. Is 1 equal to, we'll put a question mark, we're trying to show, is 1 equal to the number of terms, 
1 times the number of terms, 1, plus 1 divided by 2. Well, that's just 1 times 2 divided by 2, which reduces to just 1. So yes. The base case of 1, if n is equal to 1, the formula works. Then what we say is we assume 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way out to some number k works in the formula. So now n is equal to k. So we have k times k plus 1 over 2. We're going to assume that that is true. If that's the case, we're going to try and show that it works for n equals k plus 1. In other words, we're going to take 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way out to not just k, but we're going to go to the next term, k plus 1. And we want to see, does that equal, putting k plus 1 in the formula, k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1 divided by 2. That's what we need to show then. Well, what's often going to be the case with induction is there will be a group that we've already established a formula for. That 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to k, we already know equals k times k plus 1 divided by 2. We still have plus k plus 1. Well, let's get a common denominator and see if these can be combined. We'll multiply by 2 over 2. And now it's going to be all under a common denominator of 2. If I distribute the k, I get k squared plus k. If I distribute the 2, I get plus 2k plus 2. Simplifying, I get k squared plus 3k plus 2 all over 2. And what I want to do with that is make it look like the red line on the right side. The red line is factored. So let's go ahead and factor. You'll notice this factors to k plus 1 times k plus 2. And look how close I am now to the red line. I've got the k plus 1, and I've got the k plus 2. And the difference is the red line has a plus 1 plus 1. Well, fortunately, 2 is equal to 1 plus 1. So I can rewrite this as k plus 1 times a k plus 1 plus 1 all over 2. And now that matches what I wanted to do. Now I can say QED, or my solid box, or whatever you want to do, we have proven that this series adds up to n times n plus 1. Because we proved the base case that it works for 1. Assuming it works for k, then, we start a sequence of saying it works for the k plus 1. Might even best to say by induction, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way down to the n does, in fact, equal n times n plus 1 over 2. Start the base case, assume the k case, prove the k plus 1 case. That's how we can prove something by induction. Let's try another example. Let's say the sum as j goes from 1 to n of 3 to the j power is equal to 3 halves times 3 to the n minus 1. Let's start with the base case. Let n equal 1 because that's where the whole thing starts. 
we get the sum as j goes from 1 to 1 of 3 to the j. We want to know, does that equal 3 halves of 3 to the first minus 1? Well, sure enough, on the left side, j goes from 1 to 1. We just get 3 to the first. On the right side, we have 3 halves times 3 minus 1 is 2. And sure enough, 3 equals 3. Yes, the base case works. If the base case works, then we assume, and it is important you write the assume step down, that the sum as j goes from 1 to k of 3 to the j is 3 halves times 3 to the k power minus 1. We assume it works for k. What we want to show then is the sum as j goes from 1 to the next term, k plus 1, of 3 to the j is equal to 3 halves times 3 to the k plus 1 minus 1. Again, we're only going to work on the left side to do that. Let's see if we can do that. I'm going to scroll down just so that I have some whiteboard space to work. It might help to write out this sequence or this series with all the individual terms. So we have 3 to the first plus 3 squared plus 3 cubed plus it goes all the way down to 3 to the k plus 3 to the k plus 1. And we already know that all the way up to k, probably scrolled too far, all the way up to k is what we assumed equals 3 halves times 3 to the k minus 1 plus 3 to the k plus 1. We want to play with this now so we end up with what's on the right side of the red line. How can we do that? I might start doing that by distributing the 3 halves through the parentheses. When I do, we get an extra 3. So now it's 3 to the k plus 1 over 2 minus 3 halves plus 3 to the k plus 1. In fact, maybe another way that I can look at this 3 to the k plus 1, the first term, we could say that's times 1 half minus 3 halves plus 3 to the k plus 1. And if I look at combining my like terms, the 3 to the k plus 1, there's one of them on the right and a half of them on the left, which means now I have 3 halves of these 3 to the k plus 1s minus the 3 halves, which becomes really nice because now I can factor out the 3 halves, which leaves behind 3 to the k plus 1 minus 3 halves divided by 3 halves is 1. And you notice that matches what I needed on the right side of the formula, which means by induction, the sum as j goes from 1 to n of 3 to the j will equal 3 halves times 3 to the n minus 1. We can use a solid box or a QED to finish our proof, and we're done. The process we went through to prove it was still exactly the same. We started with the base case. We assume the k case. Then we prove the k plus 1. That last step is where we do the most work, usually, because that's the algebraic manipulation. And it's going to be different on every single problem. But that's where we can bring together everything that we've seen about algebra to help us solve the problem. 
Let's do one last example before I let you go here. We're going to do the sum as j goes from 1 to n of 3 halves to the j power equals 3 times 3 halves to the n minus 3. You might pause the video and see if you can do this proof on your own. Let's see how we did. First, we let n equal 1. Do that base case. That gives us the sum as j goes from 1 to 1 of 3 halves to the j. And we want to know, does that equal 3 times 3 halves to the 1 minus 3? Well, that's just 3 halves to the first power. So then we have, on the left, just 3 halves to the first power, because we just have the one term. On the right, 3 times 3 halves is 9 halves. Minus 3, if I make that have a common denominator, that would be 6 halves. And sure enough, 3 halves equals 3 halves. It works for the base case. Now I assume the sum as j goes from 1 to k of 3 halves to the j equals 3 times 3 halves to the k minus 3. And we're going to prove the k plus 1 case that the sum as j goes from 1 to k plus 1 of 3 halves to the j does it equal to 3 times 3 halves to the k plus 1 minus 3. Using our assumption, that green line, hopefully that'll make the left side look like the right side. Let's try it. Expanding out that sum, that sum means we have 3 halves to the first power plus 3 halves to the second power plus 3 halves to the third power plus all the way down till we're doing 3 halves to the k plus a 3 halves to the k plus 1. Well, we already know from our assumption that if I take everything up to the k step, that's going to be 3 times 3 halves to the k minus 3. And we're just adding to it 3 halves to the k plus 1. And hopefully, with a little bit of algebra, we'll be able to make it look like the right side of that red line. What I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to break up this left side. We've got 3 times 3 halves to the k plus, I'm going to do that fraction, 3 halves to the k times 3 halves to the first with the minus 3 on the end. So I change the order and also split up the k plus 1 into the two bases. Doing that, we've got a common factor of 3 halves to the k on two terms. So I'm going to factor out 3 halves to the k. And that's going to leave me with 3 plus 3 halves minus 3. Well, let's see. 3 plus 3 halves is going to be 9 halves, because 3 is the same as 6 halves plus 3 halves gives you 9 halves. So now I have 3 halves to the k times 9 halves minus 3. Noticing at the top, I've got the 3 halves to the k. I want to the k plus 1. So I wonder if I should break up that 9 into 3 times 3. That way, it matches all the 3's that are in the formula that I want. If I break up that 9, pull a 3 out, I'll pull a 3 out all the way to the front. That'll give me. 3 halves to the k times just 3 halves left minus 3, which is wonderful. 
because now I can add the exponents on that common base to get 3 halves to the k plus 1 minus 3, which now does match the right side of the red. Therefore, we have proven by induction that the sum of j going from 1 to n of 3 halves to the j is equal to 3 times 3 halves to the n minus 3. And I could write QED, or my little box, or my w to the fifth, which was what we wanted. However, you like to end your proofs. But that becomes the process of induction. Induction as a theory is very simple. We do the same thing every time. We'll start by proving a base case, assume it's true if n equals k, then we'll show it's true if n equals k plus 1. The challenge comes in that last step in the algebraic manipulation. Sometimes you need to be a little creative. Sometimes you have to try a few things that may or may not work until you stumble upon the correct method. But then that's very similar to how we did proofs with our trig functions. Keep trying different things and different properties until we can get what we're looking for. The best way to get good at these is to practice. So now it's your turn. Take a look at these in the book. Let me know if you have any questions.